Section 11 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2. Art in the Insane. Geographical Distribution. Profession. Influence of the Special Form on Alienation. Originality. Eccentricity. Symbolism. Obscenity. Criminality and moral insanity, uselessness, insanity as a subject, absurdity, uniformity, summary, music among the insane. Though the artistic tendency is very pronounced and might almost be called a general characteristic in some varieties of insanity, few authors have paid sufficient attention to it. The only exceptions are Tardau, who in his Etudes Medico Legales sur la Folle, remarks that the drawings of the insane are of great importance from the point of view of forensic medicine. Simon, who in speaking of drawing among megalomaniacs, observes that the imagination appears in them in inverse proportions to the intellect. And Fregerio, who some time later gave a survey of the subject an excellent essay published in the Dario del Manicomo di Pesaro, since then I have been able to make a completer examination of this subject thanks to curious documents supplied to me by M. M. River, Toselli, Lolli, Fregario, Tamburini, Maragliano, and Maxime du Camp. By comparing their observations with my own, I find a total of 108 mental patients with artistic tendencies, of which 46 were towards painting, 10 sculpture, 11 engraving, 8 music, 5 architecture, 28 poetry. The prevailing psychopathic forms in these 108 cases were, in 25, sensatorial monomania and that of persecution, 21, dementia, 16, megalomania, 14, acute or intermittent mania, 8, melancholia, 8, general paralysis, 5, moral insanity, 2, epilepsy. It is evident that those which predominate are the congenital and least readily curable forms, monomania and moral insanity together with dementia and those forms which it accompanies or in which it is latent, megalomania and paralysis. Let us now consider the special characteristics of the insane artists. Geographical Distribution In the districts where the artistic tendency is more marked among the sane, the number of insane artists is also higher. In fact, I have found very few of the latter at Turin, Pavia, or Reggio, while at Perugia, Luca, and Siena they are bound. Profession Only in a few cases could the tendency be explained by professional habits acquired before the appearance of the disease. We find among the insane artists mentioned above, eight ex-painters or sculptors, ten ex-architects, carpenters or cabinet makers, ten former schoolmasters or priests, one telegraphist, two students, six sailors, soldiers, or officers of engineers. Among modern painters affected with insanity, we may note Gill, Cham, Chirico, Mancini, and others. In some cases, former tendencies were accentuated by insanity. Thus a mechanic and made drawings of machines. Two sailors constructed models of ships. A major domo traced on the floor pictures of tables prepared for a banquet with pyramids of fruit. At Reggio, a cabinet maker carved some very fine foliage and ornaments. A naval officer at Genoa at first carved models of ships, afterwards was continually occupied in depicting, though he had never learned to paint, scenes at sea which, he said, consoled him for being debarred from his favourite element. Sometimes these men were inspired by insanity with a strange energy in their work, just as if, as M. M. Di Paoli Nadriani wrote to me, they had been paid for it. They cover the walls, the tables, and even the floor with painting. One of them, a painter who had formerly only reached mediocrity, attained such profession through his malady that a copy of one of Raphael's Madonnas, executed by him during one of his attacks, gained a prize medal at the exhibition. Mignoni, the celebrated painter of Reggio, who became an inmate of the asylum at that town on account of dementia and megalomania, remained idle there for fourteen years. At last, at the suggestion of Dr. Zanni, he resumed his brush and covered the walls of the asylum with excellent frescoes. One of them, 
represented the story of Count Ugolino so vividly that one of the patients began to throw meat at it, so that the father and children might not die of hunger, and the grease spots are still to be seen. Of eight painters whose history Adriani has related to me, four kept their former skill while under the influence of acute or intermittent mania. In two others, it was so far weakened that one of them, after his recovery, sincerely deplored the work done during his illness. Influence of the Special Form of Insanity In many cases, the choice of subjects inspired by the malady. A melancholiac was continually carving a figure of a man with a skull in his hand. A woman affected with megalomania was always working the word Dio, God, into her embroidery. Most monomaniacs habitually allude to their imaginary misfortunes by means and special emblems. A monomaniac, who laboured under the delusion that he was being persecuted, drew his enemies pursuing him on one side of the picture and justice defending him on the other. Alcoholic maniacs often make an excessive use of yellow in their pictures. One painter in whom alcohol had completely destroyed the sense of colour became very skilful in the rendering of white, and, between his drunken fits, became the best painter of snow scenes in France. An artist of note, C. When affected with general paralysis, lost his sense of proportion, e.g. he began to sketch a tree which, if drawn in its entirely, would have reached beyond the frame of the picture. He collected the poorest oleographs and admired them, and coloured everything green. It is more usual, however, for insanity to transform into painters, persons who have never been accustomed to handle the brush, than for it to improve skilled artists. Sometimes the disease, while suppressing some qualities of value to art, causes the appearance of others which do not previously exist, and gives to all a peculiar character. Insanity changed Luke Clennell from a painter to a poet, while Memoir, a physician who fell into a state of dementia after the loss of his wife, who died on their wedding day, took to literature, and lost his previous aptitudes. Exaggeration pushed to its extreme, to the improbable, or even the impossible, says Regnard, is one characteristic of paralytics. One of these madmen painted a man touching the stars with his head and the earth with his feet. Daudet, in Jack, speaks of insane artists whose pictures seem to represent earthquakes, or the inside of a ship during a storm. Individuals who previously had not the remotest idea of art are impelled by disease to paint, especially at the periods of strongest excitement. B, a mason, became a painter while in the Pesado Asylum. His attacks of mania were always announced by an outbreak of his tendency to draw caricatures of the hospital staff, whom he condemned, in effigy, to the strangest punishments. For instance, he painted the cook, a stout and ruddy man, in the attitude of an Eke Homo, being a grating which prevented him from touching the most appetizing viands. This was a penalty for having refused B, one of his favourite dishes. The grotesque apotheosis of himself, painted by the pederast and megalomaniac R, which he excretes and fecundates eggs which symbolise worlds, is characteristic of the boundless vanity and unbridled imagination of megalomaniacs and paralytics. Among the pictures executed by the patients at San Servolo, the most curious is one by a lunatic who, in his lucid intervals, paints fairly well, though with excessive minuteness of detail, but during his attacks his minuteness is so far exaggerated as to become grotesque. Nothing but an intense religious monomania could have inspired the singular self-crucifixion of the Venetian shoemaker, Matthieu Lovat. I have been able to procure an authentic picture of this strange performance, which is reproduced below. Shortly afterwards, Lovat died in an asylum. The picture in reference is displayed on the page. One patient, G, was a poor peasant woman, utterly uneducated, in whose family pelagra and sanity were both hereditary. In the long isolation required by her state, she developed great skill, quite unknown before her illness, in embroidering in Leiden. With coloured threads pulled from her clothing, an extraordinary number of figures, which were faithful representations of her delusions. Her autobiography is, so to speak, traced in this embroidery. In every piece of work she has represented herself, sometimes struggling with the nurses or the nuns, sometimes herding cows, or occupied in other rustic work. Elsewhere she would depict tables spread for meals, with an infinite variety of accessories. 
but the most singular thing is that the outlines are drawn with a clearness which would be the envy of a professional caricaturist no shading whatever four stitches representing nose eyes and mouth were arranged with so much artistic judgment as to show clearly the individual expression on each face another artist in the same line though less striking gifts is a certain i suffering from moral insanity who shows numerous degenerative symptoms she too embroiders figures of men and women with considerable skill but always in harmony with her perverted sexual tendencies originality disease often develops as we have already seen in the case of insane authors an originality of an invention which may also be observed in metoids because their imagination freed from all restraint allows of creations from which a more calculating mind would shrink for fear of absurdity and because the intensity of conviction supports and perfects the work at Pissarro there was a woman who drew or embroidered by a method peculiar to herself unravelling cloth and fastened threads on paper by means of saliva another embroideress formerly given to drink executed butterflies which seemed to be alive she had applied to white embroidery the methods of coloured work and was able to produce marvellous effects of light and shade at Macarata, a patient with a number of pipe stems constructed a model of the front of the asylum another had the idea of representing a song in sculpture at genoa a dementia patient carved pipes out of coal one zenini at reggio constructed a boot which was unique of its kind so that as he said no one else should be able to put it on this exceptional footgear was open on one side and tied up with string its edges were ornamental and worked with hieroglyphs m l or Bassaro, was constantly making requests to leave the asylum when told that there was no means of transporting him to his home he set about constructing one for himself this was a four-wheeled cart with an upright pole at the top of which was a pulley with a rope running through it one end of the rope was fastened to the axle of the four wheels the other to that of the hind wheels an elastic cord was attached to the rope for a distance of four or five centimetres and by pulling this first at one end and then at the other a person standing on the cart was able to make the wheels go round in many arabesques drawn by a megalomaniac one can trace carefully hidden among the curves sometimes a ship sometimes an animal a human head or a railway train or even landscapes and towns though the essential character of arabesques is the absence of the human figure the best asylums of italy have sent to the exhibitions of siena and vojera models in relief of their respective buildings admirably executed by some of the patients that of the asylum Riccio, could be taken to pieces and shown the inside arrangements staircases rooms with their furniture etc all carefully furnished even the trees i am told were copied accurately from nature a canon who had no technical knowledge of architecture began after an attack of melancholia to construct with cardboard and paper mache models of temples and amphitheatres which excited great admiration dr Bevergilio has made me a present of some portraits of italian specialists nearly all of them exceedingly lifelike the work of a melancholia patient the note of originality only comes out in some accessory introduced into each picture such as a fly or a butterfly repeated persistently in every copy or a way in which the artist's name is worked into the painting in vertical lines so as to form some sort of decorative ornament a work of extreme though useless skill and originality is a self crucifixion of levat already mentioned the monomaniac king louis of bavaria was the first who entirely understood wagner his prodigality in spending money and the creation of the theatre of beirut one of the most original conceptions has been known for years but the greatest manifestation of his genius is known only to a few three castles three palaces of splendid and indescribable beauty rose from the earth as if by enchantment he superintended even the minute details himself king louis's madness was a dream with his eyes open by himself in the space of ten years he accomplished more than any twenty sovereigns aided by the artistic genius of the best ages certainly no one at the present day could produce another such hall seventy-five metres in length without counting the two rooms at either end which would bring the length up to one hundred metres a gallery illuminated by seventeen great windows thirty-three rock crystal chandeliers forty-four candelabra and who knows what else eccentricity but even originality ends by degenerating in all or nearly all into mere eccentricity 
which only seems logical when one enters into the idea of the delusion. Simon remarks that, in manias of persecution and in paralytic megalomania, the greater the mental disturbance, the livelier the imagination, and the more grotesque the fancies engendered by it. He mentions the case of a painter who declared that he could see the interior of the earth, filled with houses of crystal, illuminated by electric light, and pervaded by sweet odours. He describes the city of Emma, whose inhabitants have two noses and two mouths, one for ordinary food, the other for sweet things, a silver chin, golden hair, three or four arms, and only one leg resting on a little wheel. These bizarre creations arise in great part from the strange hallucinations to which the patients are subject. We may see an example of this in the four-legged and seven-headed beast painted by Lazaretti on his banners. A melancholiac made himself a curious of stones to defend himself against his enemies. Another would continue all day drawing the map of the stars left by a damp on the walls of his room. Later on it was discovered that he believed those lines to represent the topography of the regions which God had given him to rule over the earth. This is one of the reasons why, sometimes, greater excellence in art is found in cases of dementia than in those of mania or melancholia. Symbolism Another characteristic trait of art in the insane is a mingling of inscriptions and drawings, and the latter, the abundance of symbols and hieroglyphs. All this closely recalls Japanese and Indian pictures and ancient war paintings of Egypt, and is due in part to the same cause at work in these, the need of helping out speech or picture, each palace by itself to express a given idea with the requisite energy. The cause is very evident in a case communicated to me by Dr. Monti, in which an architectural design, though well and accurately drawn, was rendered incomprehensible by the numerous inscriptions, often rhyme, which had been crowded into it by its author, an aphasiac, who had suffered from dementia for fifteen years. In some megalomaniacs this happens through the fancy they have for expressing their ideas in a language different from that of ordinary human beings. Such was the case of the master of the world, fully treated elsewhere by M. Torselli and myself. The patient in question was a peasant named G. L., 63 years of age, with an easy and confident bearing, prominent cheekbones, spacious forehead, an expressive and penetrating look, cranial capacity, 1,544, index 82, temperature, 37 degrees, 6 minutes. In the autumn of 1871, he became noted for vagrancy and excessive loquacity. He stopped the most notable persons of the village in public places, complaining of injustice which he lived himself to have suffered. He destroyed the vines, devastated the fields, and rushed about the streets, threatening terrible vengeance. Gradually, he began to identify himself with the deity, and believe himself ruler of the universe, and preached in the Cathedral of Alba on his lofty destiny. In the asylum, he remained calm as long as he was able to believe that his power was recognized by every one, by the first show opposition he threatened in the character of ruler and personification of the elements, calling himself sometimes the son, sometimes the brother, or others the father of the son, to convulse the world with earthquakes, overthrow kingdoms and empires, and erect his throne on the ruins. He was tired, he said, of keeping up so many armies and providing for so many idle persons. It would be just if the authorities and the rich were at least to send him a large sum of money to redeem themselves from what he called the depths of death. In return for this payment, he would allow them to live forever. The poor ought all to die, as useless persons, and it was preposterous that he had to support so many madmen in his own palace. He therefore suggested to the doctor that it would be well to cut their heads off. Yet he waited on them, with the greatest unselfishness when they were ill, and inconsistency which is among the characteristics of paranoia. He usually bestowed his scanty earnings on some rogue whom he entrusted with letters and commissions for the other world. Addressed to the sun, the stars, the weather, death, the lightning, the other powers whose help he was in the habit of invoking, and with whom he held confidential conversations at night. He was quite pleased when some calamity had desolated the country, thus being the beginning of the judgments threatened by him, and a sign that the weather, the sun, or the lightning had obeyed him. He kept in a trunk some roughly furnished crowns, which he said were the true royal and imperial crowns of Italy, France, and other states. Those worn by the actual sovereigns of these states were no longer of any value, having been usurped by wretched men, doomed to speedy destruction unless they paid him their debts of death, and letters of exchange to the amount of several hundred millions. But his most characteristic eccentricities were the writings in which his delusion was manifested. Although able to read and write, his scorn the use of the ordinary kind of writing, 
and in a character of his own scored letters or and checks to the son to death or to the civil and military authorities he always had his pockets full of these documents his writings consisted mainly of large capital letters mixed intervals with signs and figures indicating objects or persons the words are usually separated by one or two large dots and he only wrote some of the letters of each word nearly always the consonants without any respect for the laws of simulation in some of his writings the alphabet almost entirely disappears for instance in order to demonstrate his effective power he sketched a series of rough figures representing the elements and powers which were his favourite spirits the army ready at a sign from him to make war on all terrestrial powers contending with him for the dominion of the world these are one the eternal father two the holy spirit three st martin four death five time six thunder seven lightning eight earthquake nine the sun ten the moon eleven fire his minister of war twelve a very powerful man who has lived ever since the beginning of the world as g l s brother thirteen the lion of hell fourteen bread fifteen wine the whole is followed of his usual signature a two-headed eagle each of these powers is also indicated by letters placed beneath the figures thus the first p d e second l s p s etc this mixture of letters hieroglyphs and figurative signs constitutes a kind of writing recalling the phonetico ideographic stage through which primitive peoples mexicans and chinese certainly passed before the discovery of alphabetic writing among the savages of america and australia writing consists in a more or less rough kind of painting e g to indicate would that i had the swiftness of a bird they depict a man with wings instead of arms these characters are not so much writing as aids to memory still further connected together and vivified by traditional songs or stories some tribes however have attained into a somewhat less imperfect mode which resembles our rebus for instance the mayor of america to signify a physician painted a man with a herb in his hand and wings to his feet an evident allusion to the rapidity with which he is obliged to hasten to those who require him rain is represented by a bucket the ancient chinese represented malice by means of three women light by the sun and moon and the verb to listen by an ear between two doors this primitive writing shows us that the rhetorical tropes and figures of which our pendants are so proud are expressions of poverty rather than wealth on the part of the intellect in fact they are frequently found in the speech of idiots and of educated deaf mutes after having used this system for a considerable time some more civilized races such as the chinese and mexicans took another step forward they classified the more or less picturesque figures referred to above and succeeded in forming ingenious combinations which without directly representing the idea indirectly suggested reminiscence of it as in our charades besides this to prevent any uncertainty on the reader's part they place either before or after these signs a sketch of the object to be expressed a scanty remnant of the actual picture writing of a previous age this certainly took place at a time when the language once being fixed it was observed how some people in writing down a given sign recalled the sound of the words which is suggested thus itzicotl the name of the mexican king was written by drawing a serpent cotl in mexican and a lance itzli thus too in chinese the character sen represents boat lance and table a megalomaniac by reviving this custom affords one more proof that in the visible manifestations of their thoughts the insane frequently revert as also do criminals to the prehistoric stage of civilization in the present case it is quite easy to understand by what mental process g came to use his mode of writing under the megalomaniac delusion believing himself lord of the elements superior to all known or imaginable forces he could not make himself properly understood with the common words of ignorant and incredulous men neither could ordinary writing suffice to express ideas so new and marvellous the lion's claws the eagle's beak the serpent's tongue the lightning flash the sun's rays the arms of the savage were much worthy of him and more calculated to inspire men with fear and respect for his person nor is this an isolated case one quite analogous to it is described by Raggy in his excellent study of the writings of the insane professor morselli has furnished me with another and still more interesting instance the patient a t he writes was a joiner and cabinet maker he had a certain skill in wood carving and his furniture was much sought after 
About seven years ago, he was attacked with mental disease, apparently melancholia, and tried to commit suicide by throwing himself on the roof of the town hall. He is now subject to attacks of excitement with systematized delusions. His predominant ideas are political, republican and anarchist, on a certain groundwork of ambition. He fancies himself changed into some great criminal. Sometimes he is Gasparon, sometimes Il Pastore, and others Passanante. He is always drawing or carving, and his work generally takes the form of trophies or allegorical figures. The most curious of all these is a piece of carving which represents a man dressed as a soldier, provided with wings, and standing on an inlaid pedestal covered with allegorical inscriptions. This figure has a trophy on its head, and other objects are carved on or around it, each of which express emblematically some one of T's delusions. For instance, the wings recall the fact that when his first attack came on, he was in the square at Porto Recanati, selling his carvings, among which were several figures of angels, at a soldo apiece. The medal of the Order of the Pig is a token of contempt, wherewith he would like to decorate all the rich and powerful of the earth. The helmet with a lantern hanging to a visor, a reminiscence of Offenbach's brigands, symbolizes the gendarmes who escorted him to the asylum. The cigar, placed crosswise, no, the position represents his disdain for kings and tyrants, and the position of the leg recalls a fracture of that limb sustained by him his attempt at suicide. The inscriptions of the pedestal are scraps of verse or extracts from newspapers which T is always quoting, and to which he attaches some mysterious significance. They always, however, refer to the state of slavery to which he is reduced, i.e. his detention in the asylum, and the vengeance he will one day wreak on his captors. The most remarkable thing, however, is a trophy resting on the head of the figure, which is a graphic expression, so to speak, of a song, either written by him or adapted from other popular poetry. Each phrase of song has a symbol in the trophy. Thus the word poison in the first verse is represented by the cup. The two daggers are likewise present. The end of life and the tomb are figured by a kind of sarcophagus or closed chest. Love by two sprays of flowers. The bell of the second stanza is easily recognizable. The funeral music are the two trumpets crossed, lower down. The cross of the third stanza and the priest, represented by a clerical hat, are not forgotten. It is curious that the gallows should be wanting to complete this trophy. The spoon and fork, by the by, are T's favourite implements. They denote that he eats and drinks in slavery, or, as he says, in a convict prison. And for this reason, he always wears a set, carved in wood by himself, in the buttonhole of his coat or in his cap. We may once more remind the reader that savages hand down their history by associating picture signs with poetry. A more interesting example of elaborate symbolic faculty is a monomaniac combined with higher artistic power than is usually found among the insane, has been recorded with very full illustrations by Dr. William Noyes. This patient studied art at Paris under Jerome and returned to America to become an illustrator of books and magazines. He developed systematic religious delusions and frequently worked them out in very beautiful and artistic shapes, nine of which, all executed in the asylum at which he was confined, are here reproduced. A circular design is one of a series of twelve charts, one of each of the tribes of Israel, illustrating the progress of the Holy Spirit. They are all delicately coloured in water colours, the fine shading making it very difficult to give in black and white adequate idea of the beauty of the original. An illustration is displayed on the page. In the centre is the dove representing the Holy Spirit, and surrounding it are seven different crosses, St. Andrew, St. Columba, St. George, St. Michael, the Prophet, St. Evangelii, Royal Priesthood, and a close study will show the seven crosses most ingeniously worked together. It is probable that in looking at the design closely for the first time, one will suddenly see a new cross take shape before his eyes. And this indeed is what the patient says occurs to him. In describing the crosses he will say, for example, then in drawing the cross of St. Andrew, the line suddenly took a new shape, and he found he had also made a cross of St. Michael. This to him is a matter of deep significance, and he feels that his work is directly controlled by high power, and the work of his fancy is really inspired. Outside these central crosses are the names of three ancient deities, who were each characterized by some special attribute, and under these, the parts of the body, that the artist conceives these deities especially to have represented, and then comes the name of the biblical personage in whom these elements were finally exemplified and embodied. 
To the left of the dove is Venus, representing blood, exemplified in Moses. Above is Osiris, representing flesh, embodied in Adam, and to the right Psyche, representing water, to provide Noah. These three are but the gross material parts of man, representing indeed necessary steps in his progress through life. But secondary and subordinate to the higher part of his nature, represented by truth and the spirit, which receive their ultimate embodiment in Christ. The lion denotes might, and the eagle signifies emulation. But it is uncertain just what symbolism is connected with the serpent twining round the cross, and therefore crossed by a sword and pen, unless indeed the last may mean the Bible, with the emblems of peace and war lying quietly within it. And it seems not unlikely that the serpent is emblematic of the betrayal. For the rest of the design, however, we need make no inferences, as it corresponds closely with this description. Outside the circle enclosing the crosses are the seals sealing the Holy Spirit. In the large light triangles, or rather rays of the sun, are given the names of the twelve apostles, forming the seal of the prophet. Above these, in the same space, are the signs of the zodiac, and the extreme points of the triangle, with the names of the parts of the body underneath, and these signs correspond to in the ancient mythology. This forms the seal of the zodiac. Between these large light-coloured triangles are the twelve holy stones, represented as ovals, and with their names plainly distinguished in the cut, making the seal of the holy stones. In the small triangles directly above the holy stones are given the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, but the colour of these in the chart, vermilion, is such that the lettering does not come out in the photographic negative. This gives the seal of the twelve tribes. Directly beneath the holy stones, filling in the space between the bottom of each large triangle, is the seal of the germ, coloured dark green, and running down on each side of the top of these large triangles are small triangles, coloured dark red and form the seal of the Akeldama, or bloody seal. On the circumference are the names of the constellations of the zodiac, and directly under these the names of the corresponding months of the year, and under these again are the mythological representations of the constellations, Leo, July, being at the top, and then in order to the right come Vertigo, August, Libra, September, Scorpio, October, Sagittarius, November, Capricornus, December, Aquarius, January, Pisces, February, Aries, March, Taurus, April, Gemini, May, Cancer, June. This gives the last sailing of the seed and the seal of the sun. It will be seen that beginning at the circumference at any point and going towards the centre there is a complete astronomical representation of the season of the year. First the name of the constellation, then is the session of the month, the constellation depicted pictorially, the sign of the zodiac and the part of the human body corresponding in the old astronomy to this sign of the zodiac. Of the four designs reproduced together, the first, the Shashina, or light of love, represents the miraculous light or visible glory which was to the Jews a symbol of the divine presence. The second represents the angel Sandalphon with a holy grail at the side of the letters Alpha and Omega at top. The design must be inverted to make out the Omega. The third, Subrosa, and the fourth, Imp and Frogs, are graceful fancies which sufficiently explain themselves, as does the witch. While working on the sketches, he made, at the same time, the design for a bookplate representing Cupid learning the alphabet. And the entire design, he says, is full of symbolism. A favourite word with him. Cupid has his fingers on Alpha, signifying the beginning of his education. Above the book is Cupid's target, with a heart for the centre, that he is pierced with an arrow, while the full quiver stands to the right. The curious fish under the Veritas represents the Ixthus of the early Christians, while three crosses, symbolic of the Christian religion, on the upper left-hand corner, brought out by heavy shading, of the cross lines. On the Book of Knowledge is perched the dove, emblematic of purity, while the olive branch at the left of the book and the palm under the fool's bowl gives still other religious symbols. The lamp of knowledge is burning brightly in front of Cupid, while at his feet are the square, compass, triangle, and pencils, symbolizing the designer's profession. Minuteness of Detail In some insane artists, especially monomaniacs, we find an opposite characteristic. The exaggeration of particular details, the general effect being lost in obscurity through their excessive efforts at vermissimilitude. Thus, in a landscape exhibited among those rejected from the Turin Salon, not only was a general view of the country given, but every separate blade of grass could be distinguished. In another picture, indeed to be very imposing, the strokes of the brush produced the effect of pencil shading. 
atavism. Both minuteness and symbolism are themselves atavistic phenomena, but in addition to them, they may be noted, in a large number of cases, a total absence of perspective, while the rest of the execution shows clearly enough that the author is not wanting an artistic sense. One would take him to be a true artist, but one brought up in China or ancient Egypt. Here we have evidently a kind of atavism explicable by arrested development of some one organ, and corresponding backwardness in the products of that organ. A French captain suffering from paralysis drew figures stiff as Egyptian profiles. A megalomaniac of Reggio executed a coloured bas-relief, in which the disproportion of size of the feet and hands, the extreme smallness of the faces, and stiffness of the limbs, completely recall the work of the 13th century. Another patient, at Genoa, carved bas-reliefs on pipes and on vases, exactly similar to those of the Neolithic age. Raggi has sent me some flints carved by a monomaniac entirely ignorant of archaeology, which in the choice of figures and emblems recall the style of Egyptian and Phoenician amulets. In these instances, we see the influence of similar psychical conditions at work. Arabesques In some few patients, M. Torsilius called my attention to a singular predilection for arabesques and ornaments which tend to assume a purely geometric form without loss of elegance. This is the case with monomaniacs. In cases of dementia and acute mania, there prevails a chaotic confusion, which, however, does not always imply absence of taste. I have seen an instance of this in a kind of ship, the work of a dementia patient, composed of an enormous number of little slips of wood, brilliantly coloured, very thin, and interwined in an infinite variety of ways, the general effect being very graceful. Obscenity in some work done by erotomaniacs, paralytics, and demented patients, the salient characteristic both of the drawings and of the verses is the most shameless indecency. Thus a cabinet maker would carve virile members at every corner of a piece of furniture, or at the summits of trees. This too recalls many works of savages and of ancient races, in which the organs of sex are everywhere prominent. A captain at Genoa was fond of drawing scenes in a brothel. In many, the obscene character is marked by the most singular pretexts, as they were demanded by artistic requirements. A monomaniac priest used to sketch his figures nude, and then artfully draped them by means of lines which revealed their generative organs. He defended himself against criticism by saying that his figures could only appear indecent to those who were in search of evil. M. Illustrated his strange, often beautiful verses with innumerable daubs, and representing animals of monstrous forms struggling with men and women, or monks and nuns, naked, in the most shameless attitudes. In others, the indecency is, if possible, still more evident, especially in case of paralytic dementia. I remember an old man who used to draw a vulva on the address of his letters to his wife, surrounding it with obscene couplets in dialect. It is a curious coincidence that two artists, one at Turin and the other at Reggio, who were both megalomaniacs, should both have had sodomitic instincts, which they combined with the delusion of being deities, and lords of the world, which they created and emitted from their bodies. One of them, who nevertheless had a real artistic sense, painted a full-length picture of himself, naked, among women, ejecting worlds, and surrounded by all the symbols of power. This repeats, and at the same time explains, the ethophallic divinity of the Egyptians. Criminality and Moral Insanity in this connection, it is important to notice that the greater number of these artists show, in addition to their other forms of mania, a marked tendency to moral insanity, especially in the form of unnatural vice. The painter who produced a picture of delirium was a pederast. The man who constructed the marvellous model of the Reggio Asylum, already alluded to, was neither draughtsman, sculptor, nor engineer. He was a madman, and in addition, a thief with unnatural tendencies. This man, whenever the fancy took him, escaped from the asylum wandered about for some days, began to steal when he had exhausted the small amount of money he had about him, and when in prison declared himself a lunatic, and so got acquitted and sent back to Reggio, when, after a short interval, he would repeat the same line of conduct. Dr. Tamburini told me that he, too, had been struck by the coexistence of artistic faculty and moral insanity in these patients. Uselessness A characteristic common to many is the complete uselessness of the work to which they devote themselves, and here I call once more Hercart's dictum. Cies le travail des fours, the impulsio les cavales, sur des reins, 
fed against Sir Quilquiz Becatelles. A Genevan, affected by persecutory monomania, spent years embroidering on eggshells and lemons. Though her work was most beautiful, it could be of no advantage to her, for she kept it jealously concealed. I myself, that she was very fond of me, never saw any of it till after her death. Here we have, as in the case of artists of genius, the love of truth and beauty for their own sake alone, only that the aim is reversed. Sometimes the work done, the very useful in itself, is of no advantage to the artist, and has no connection with his profession. As the captain who became insane, presented me with the model of a bed for violent patients, which I believe would be extremely useful in practice. Two other patients together, made out of a piece of beef bone, some very neat matchboxes, ornamented with carvings in relief, which could be of no profit to themselves, as they refused to part with them for money. There are, however, some exemptions. A melancholy patient with homicidal and suicidal tendencies manufactured himself a very serviceable knife, fork and spoon, metal ones not been allowed him, out of the bones which remained over from his dinner. A cafe keeper and coligno, a megalomaniac compounded excellent liquors, out of the scraps left over from meals, though of the most different kinds of food. A criminal lunatic constructed himself a key out of a number of small pieces of wood joined together. I do not count among these examples those who have prepared themselves real curiouses of iron and stone, a piece of work in relation to the special delusion of persecutions, and applying an amount of labour out of proportion to the advantage obtained. Insanity as a subject Many choose insanity as a subject of their paintings. Professor Fregulio has furnished me with a very curious portrait of an insane patient at the moment of attack. The eyes rolling, the hair on end, the arms extended. Under his feet is the epigraph, Deliria, he is raving. This is the work of an alcoholic pederast. I think that a sane artist would have some difficulty in painting a closer likeness of delirium. This reminds me how frequently I have found, among the poets of asylums, the tendency to describe insanity has been a favourite theme with great poets who have suffered from ill health. Tasso, the now, Barbara, Musset. Mancini, immediately after his recovery, painted a woman offering for sale the picture executed by a madman, and Gill, in the hospital of St. Anne, painted a raving maniac with terrible truth to nature. Absurdity one of the most salient characteristics of insane art is, as might be expected, absurdity either in drawing or colouring. This is especially noteworthy in some maniacs, owing to the exaggerated association of ideas, through which the connecting links, which would serve to explain the author's conception, are totally lost. Thus an artist painted a marriage at Cana, with all the figures of the apostles exceedingly well drawn, but in place the figure of Christ was a large bunch of flowers. Paralytic patients draw objects without any sense of proportion. Their hens are the size of horses, and their cherries of melons. Or, while striving out of affection in the design, the execution is merely childish. One who believed himself a second Jorge's veteranet drew horses by means of four straight strokes and a tail. Another drew all his figures upside down. Other dementia patients, owing to the same amnesia, which is apparent in their speech, leave out the most essential points of their conception, like M. at Pesaro, who made an excellent drawing of a general, seated, but forgot the chair. Frigerio. Imitation. There are some who are very successful in imitation, but it can produce nothing original. They will, for instance, copy the facade of the asylum, or heads of animals, with the minute accuracy of detail which characterizes primitive art. In this branch I have seen successful work done by cretins and idiots, the latter drawing in exactly the same manner as primitive man. Uniformity Many continually repeat the same idea. Thus one, mentioned by Frigerio, filled sheets of paper with a bee gnawing the head of an ant. Another who believed that he had been shot would paint nothing but firearms. A third confined himself to arabesques. Summary these traits explain the instance of partial perfection to be found in dementia patients, for a repetition of the same movement tends to bring it nearer and nearer to perfection. At other times, as we have seen in the extempore of poets and authors of the asylum, it is the tendency and energy of the hallucinations which makes a painter of a man who was never one before. Blake was able to picture to himself as living and present, 
persons already dead, angels, etc. This was the case, also, with a strange and sane poet, John Clare, who believed himself a spectator of the Battle of the Nile and the death of Nelson, and was firmly convinced that he had been present at the death of Charles I. In fact, he described these events with such remarkable fidelity and accuracy that it is scarcely probable he could have done it so well had he been in full possession of his reason, the more so as he was entirely without culture. This explains why insane painters and poets are so numerous. It is easy to reproduce clearly what one sees clearly. Moreover, the imagination is most unrestrained when reason is least dominant, for the latter, by repressing hallucinations and illusions, deprives the average man of a true source of artistic and literary inspiration. For the same reason, too, art itself may, in its turn, encourage the development of mental disease. Vasari relates that one Spinelli, a painter of Arezzo, having attempted to paint the deformity of Lucifer, the latter appeared to him in a dream and reproached him with having made him so ugly. The painter was so affected by this separation as to fall seriously ill, and it continued to haunt him for years. Music in the Insane Musical ability is often diminished in those who, previous to their illness, cultivated the desire with passion. Dr. Adriani observed that musicians, under his care of ins for insanity, almost entirely lost their powers. They could still play any piece, but it was done quite mechanically and without expression. Other dementia patients would play the same piece, sometimes even a few phrases, over and over again. Donizetti, in the last stage of dementia, no longer recognized his favorite melodies. His last work showed traces of that fatal influence which critics have also observed in Schumann's Symphony of the Bride of Messina, composed during his attacks of insanity. These facts, however, do not contradict our assertion that insanity awakens new artistic qualities in persons not previously gifted in that way. They only show that, as we have seen in the case of professional painters, they can give no additional power or skill to those who already possess them when attacked by disease. A megalomania formerly a syphilitic patient, under the care of Dr. Tamburini, sang beautiful airs when under excitement. At the same time, instead of playing an accompaniment, she improvised, on the piano foot, two distinct motives which had no connection with each other or the air she was singing. This fact confirms the observations of lies as to the independent action of the cerebral hemispheres. A young man attacked by Pelagar, who recovered in my hospital, composed expressive and original melodies. M. Raggi told me that he had had, under his care, a melancholic patient who, during her attacks, played without enthusiasm and even with repugnance, but when the fit passed off, would spend whole days at the piano and execute the most difficult partitions with a truly artistic enthusiasm. In the same way, a paralytic showed through the whole course of his illness a genuine musical mania, during which he imitated all instruments, and had shed himself in frantic enthusiasm at the piano passages. Reggi also observed a paralytic dementia patient who, after breaking his thigh bone by a leap from a window, rendered every bandage which could be devised useless by singing. For days together, motives from Il Travatore at the top of his voice, and accompanying his singing with abrupt rhythmical movements of the pelvis. A fancy for monotonous chanting also showed itself in another paralytic who believed himself to be a great admiral. In maniacs, acute and joyous notes predominate, and still more, the repetition of the rhythm. Everyone who has paid even a short visit to an asylum has noticed the frequency of singing and shouting and high, thin voices, and with them a sound of hands. Nor it is it hard to understand this, if we remember how Spencer and Adrigo have shown that law of rhythm is the most general form under which, in the whole of nature, energy is manifested from the crystal to the star or to the animal organism. Man, therefore, only follows a general organic law in giving way to this impulse, which he does the more readily, the less he is controlled by reason. This explains the number of poets of the new school who are found in asylums. This is the reason why savage nations have a natural inclination for music, and a missionary told Spencer, the men to whom he taught the psalms with music in the evening, could repeat them by heart on the following day. Savages, in speaking, make use of a sort of monotonous chant analogous to our recitative. Primitive poetry was always sung when it saw the different words connected with singing 
applied to poetry and poets. The mysterious magic formulas and recipes of the ancients were also sung or chanted, whence the word enchantment, even at the present day, in the neighbourhoods of Nove and Aux. I have heard peasant women, in making inquiries of one another, modulate their voices in true musical rhythm. Modern improvisatori do not seem able to produce their verses except when singing and agitating all their muscles. It must be remembered that, according to the observations of Herbert Spencer, the act of singing employs the exaggerates the sign of the natural language of passion. Mental excitement is transformed into muscular energy. An infant will laugh and bound in its nurse's arms at the sight of a brilliant colour or the hearing of a new sound. Strong sensations or painful emotions cause us to gesticulate. In short, they excite the muscular system, which is acted upon in proportion to the intensity of the sensations. Slight pain calls forth a groan. Greater pain a cry. The pitch of the voice varies with the force of the emotion, so that in the strongest emotions it rises to the octave, or higher, and singing is always involuntarily accompanied by tremors and agitations of the muscles. What could be more natural than that? In the conditions in which the emotions are most energetic, and so frequently atavistic, as is the case in sanity, these tendencies should be reproduced on a larger scale. This too explains why so many morbid men of genius should be musicians. Mozart, Schumann, Beethoven, Donizetti, Pergolese, Venetia, Rissi, Rocchi, Rossell, Handel, Dussek, Hoffmann, Gluck, Petrilla. Musical creation is the most sensitive manifestation of thought, the one most intimately connected with the affective emotions, and having less relation to the external world than any other, which causes it to stand more in need of the fervent but exhausting emotions of inspiration. Perhaps to study these peculiarities of art in the insane, besides showing us a new phase in this mysterious disease, might be useful in aesthetics, or at any rate in art criticism, by showing that the exaggerated predilection for symbols, and for minuteness of detail, however accurate, the complication of inscriptions, the excessive prominence given to any one colour, it is well known that some of our foremost painters are great sinners in this respect, the choice of licentious subjects, and even an exaggerated degree of originality, are points which belong to the pathology of art. End of chapter 2 Section 12 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3 Literary and Artistic Metoids. Definition Physical and Physical Characteristics. The Literary Activity. Examples Lawsuit Mania. Metoids of Genius. Possessio. The Decadent Poets. For Lane, Matoids in Art. We have just been considering, in Mad Men, the substantial character of genius under the appearance of insanity. There is, however, a variety of these, which permits the appearance of genius and the substantial character of the average man. And this variety forms the link between Mad Men of Genius, the sane, and the insane properly so called. These are what I call semi insane persons or matoids. This variety constitutes, in the world of mental pathology, a particular species of a genius distinguished by modestly as odd, queer, strange, persons of insane temperament, and previously by Morel, Le Grand du Soil, and Schul, Geistes Krankheit, Volume 2, 1880, regard them as hereditary neurotics, Regai as neuropathics, and now many as paranoiacs, a terminology which produces a hopeless confusion. The graphomaniac representing the commonest variety has true negative characteristics, that is to say, the features and cranial form are nearly always normal. Possessio, C. Ancettini, F., P., etc. His characteristics are not the result of hereditary, at most, he is a son of a man of genius. Florenz, Brusaeus, Spandri, Nestor, etc. This form of aberration is most frequently found in men. I only know of one exception in Europe. Louise Miguel, and appears more especially in red cities, worn out with civilization. The metoid shows far fewer signs of degeneracy than the insane, probably so-called. Of 33 metoids, only 21 show degenerative characters, 
and of these last twelve had two. Two were found to have three, and there were two of four, and only one was six. Another negative characteristic is the survival of family affection, even that of the human race in general, some as reaching such a point as to become exaggerated altruism, though in many cases vanity enters largely into the composition of this virtue. Thus Bocioso thinks of and provides for the well-being of posterity and even of the dead. Thus D loves his wife and grandchildren and costly works for his family. Sian Chattini supported a deaf and dumb sister. Sabarbo, Lazaretti, Copperpillar adorn their wives. In prison, a few days ago, I had occasion to perform the operation on blood transfusion and wasted much time in trying to find a healthy individual from whom to take the blood. All refused, but a consumptive metoid, as soon as he heard of the matter, volunteered for the operation, and was overwhelmed with shame when I would not make use of him. They have an exaggerated conviction of their own personal merit and importance, with a peculiar characteristic that this opinion shows itself rather in writing than in words or actions, so that they do not show irritation at the contradictions and evils of practical life. Sin Chattini compares himself to Galileo and to Jesus Christ, but sweeps the barrack stairs. Passanante proclaimed himself president of the political society while working as a cook. Mangione classified himself as a matter to Italy and to his own genius, yet he condescended to act as a broker. Cassant claimed to be a cardinal, but in the meantime he was a clever parasite and made large profits through his very insanity. The shepherd Blewett believed himself to be an apostle and count of permission, and, like the author of Scott Tattinge, deigned to address himself to none but royal passengers, yet he did not refuse to carry on the trade of a horse-breaker. Stuart, the eccentric author of the new system of physical philosophy, who travelled all over the world to discover the polarity of truth, asserted that all the kings of the earth had entered into alliance to destroy his works. He therefore gave the latter to his friends, with a request to wrap them up well and bury them in remote localities, never revealing the latter except on their deathbeds. Martin Williams, brother of that Jonathan Williams, who, in an attack of insanity, set fire to York Minister, and of John Williams, who struck out a new line in painting, published many works to prove the theory of perpetual motion. After having convinced himself by means of thirty-six experiments of the impossibility of demonstrating it scientifically, it was revealed to him in a dream that God had chosen him to discover the great cause of all things, and perpetual motion, and this he made the subject of many works. These persons would not come under the heading of metaloids, even in their writings. The earnestness and persistence in one idea which make them resemble the monomaniac and the man of genius were not often associated with the pursuit of absurdity, continual contradictions, and the prolixity and utility of insanity. One tendency overpowers all others, one which we find predominant in insane genius, viz. personal vanity. Thus, out of 215 metaloids, we find 44 prophets. Philopanti, in the Dio Liberal, places his father, Berillo, a carpenter, and his mother, Berilla, among the demigods. He discovered three atoms, and gives a minute narrative, year by year, of the actions of each. Cordigliani prepared to insult the Chamber of Deputies in order to obtain an annuity from the government, and thought this action much to his own credit. Gretel thought he was saving the Republic by the murder of the President, and had himself called a great lawyer and philosopher. In the same way, Pazanante, after having preached the abolition of capital punishment, condemns the guilty members of the Assembly to death, and, having given orders to respect the forms of government, insults the monarchy, makes an attempt at regicide, and proposes to abolish all misers and hypocrites. A physician, S., prints a statement that bloodletting exposes to an excess of light. Another announces in two thick volumes that diseases are elliptical. Critics have said, referring to the works of demons, that his dialectic quintessence and sextessence are a true quintessence of absurdity. Gleases affirms that flesh is atheistical. Fusi, a theologian, asserts that the menstrual blood has the property of quenching conflagrations. Hannah Gwynn, he used to write in the air with his fingers, and had an aromal trumpet by means of which he communicated with the spirits dispersed through the air, declares that in the future age many men shall become women and demigods. Henry On, in the Academy des Inscriptions, advanced the theory that Adam was forty feet in height, 
Noah 29, Moses 25, etc. Lero, the celebrated parish deputy, who believed in metempsychosis and the Kabbalah, defined love as the identity of the reality of a part of the totality of the infinite being, etc., and wished to insert the principle of the triad in the preamble of his constitution. As Gill maintained that men might live forever if only they had faith, it is true that here and there some new and vigorous notion emerges from the chaos of such minds, because the only symptom of genius developed in them by psychosis is less degree of aversion to novelty, or to employ my own terminology, on mycionism. Thus, for example, amid the most absurd opinions, Sian Shatini had some very fine passages. All animals have the instinct of self-preservation, with the minimum fatigue of escaping from troublesome thoughts and enjoying the delights of life, and to obtain these things. Liberty is indispensable to them. All animals except man gratify and always have gratified these instincts, and perhaps will always continue to do so. Mankind alone constituted as a society find themselves fettered, and in such a way that no one has ever succeeded, not merely in bringing them into a state of peace and liberty, but even showing how they maintain this end. Will I propose to demonstrate this proposition, as a locked door cannot be opened without breaking it, say by means of a key or a picklock, so as man has lost his liberty by means of the tongue, nothing but the tongue, or its equivalents, can set him free without injury to his nature. Amid the doggerel jargon of the Scottedinge, I find this beautiful line on Italy. Padrona er sciava sempre e ficli tua nemica. We shall see in Pesanante's biography that sometimes in his writings, and still more in his speeches, he struck out vigorous and original ideas which, in fact, led many persons into error as to the nature and reality of his disease. I may mention the sentence, where the learned lose themselves, the ignorant man may triumph. And another, history learnt from the people is more instructive than that which is studied in books. Lua distinguishes the maid from the virgin, in that the first has the will for evil without the power, and the second has neither the power nor the will. It is natural that matoids should repeat in their conceptions the ideas of stronger politicians and thinkers, but always in their own way, and always exaggerated. Thus Bossisio exaggerates the delicate consideration of our lovers of animals, and anticipates the ideas of Mille, Clemence Royer, and Comte on the necessity for the application of the Malthusian theory. In the same way, De Tomasi, a dishonest broker, discovered a practical explication, except for the morbid eroticism which he added to it, of the Darwinian system of natural selection. Cien Chattini wishes to put socialism into practice. Now the stamp of insanity is evident, not so much in the exaggeration of their ideas, as in the disproportion of the latter among themselves, so that, from some well-expressed and even sublime conception, we pass suddenly to one which is more than mediocre and paradoxical, nearly always opposed to the received ideas of the majority and at variance with some position and education of the other. In short, we have by that means of which Don Quixote, instead of extorting our admiration, makes us smile. Yet his actions in another age, and even in a different man, would have been admirable and heroic. In any case, among metoids, traits of genius are rather the exception than the rule. Most of them show a deficiency rather than exuberance of inspiration. They fill entire volumes without sense or savour. They eke out the commonplaceness of their ideas and the poverty of their style with a multiple of points of interrogation and exclamation with repeated signatures, with special words coined by themselves, as in the habit of monomaniacs. Thus Menke already observed that some metoids contemporary with himself had invented the words derapti felisan. Berbiguer created the word farfiderism, a monomaniac. Le Barrier wrote a work entitled Dominat Mos Herseri, intended to show farmers how to attain double harvests, and sailors to avoid storms. He entitled himself Dominat Mos Herseri Fatiwa. Cian Chardini invented the traverso of the idea. Pari invented Cafangalia and Morbozu, and we owe to Waltok, Elytrologia, and Anthropomognotologia, and G. Lepidarmocrinia, and Glesostomopactica. We often find an eccentric handwriting, with vertical lines cut by horizontal ones, and transverse furrows, even with unusually formed letters, as in Cienciatini. They frequently introduce drawings into their sentences, as if to heighten their force, 
thus returning as we've already seen to be the case with megalomaniacs to the idea of graphic writing of the ancients in which the figure served as a determining symbol while tuck published two books on psychology a new kind of philosophic system which however has found a serious commentator in the same philosopher which speaks volumes for the seriousness of some philosophers according to this system ideas are represented by so many images impressed on each of the cerebral convolutions thus a symbol of physics is a lighter candle that of electrology or the faculty of judgment is the nose or the sense of smell of ethics a ring out of motion a fishing hook the author, despairing, and of good reason, of making himself understood in words, philosophizes with his pencil, and has crammed his book with diagrams of brains covered with such figurative signs. In order to prove the applicability of these principles to literature, he has presented us with a tragedy, Job, in which the characters have their heads covered with similar signs, and chant verses worthy of the system, e.g., O that I could separate the two united conceptions of myself and impiety, I am just satan is impious the jesuit missionary paoletti wrote a book against st thomas and illustrated it with a drawing of the vessels used in the tabernacle so as to determine the future condition of the sons of adam with regard to predestination the divine and human wills are figured as two balls revolving in opposite directions and finally meeting at a common centre the titles of all their works show an exuberance which is really singular I possess one of eighteen lines, not counting a note included in the title page itself, and intended to explain it. A socialistic work published in Australia by an Italian, an impure Italian, has a title arranged in the shape of a triumphal arch. It is precisely on the title page that nearly all of them at once betray the taint of madness. This example, from the work of the Matoid de Mons, will suffice. The demonstration of the fourth part of nothing is something everything is the quintessence extracted from the quarter of nothing and that which depends on it containing the precepts of the holy magic and devout invocations of demons to discover the origin of the evils which afflict france many have the crotchet of mixing up with their sentences accumulated series of numbers which is also sometimes done by paralytics in a mad production of sovbires entitled six 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 all the verses are accompanied by the number 666. This strange thing is that, at the same time, a certain porter in England had published a work on the number 666, declaring it the most exquisite and perfect of numbers. Lazaretti, too, had a singular partiality for this number. Spandry, Levron, and C have a similar preference for the number 3. A special characteristic found in Matoids, and also, as we have already seen in the insane, is that of repeating some words or phrases hundreds of times on the same page. Thus in one of Passanante's chapters, the word reprovates occurs about 143 times. Some have had special paper manufactured for their works, like Wogman, who had it made with different colours on the same sheet, an enormous increase of expense, so that a volume of 400 pages cost him over 2,200 sterling. Philon had every page of his book on a different colour. Another characteristic is that of employing an orthography and calligraphy peculiar to themselves, with words in large type or underlined. They will sometimes write even private letters in double column, or with vertical lines transversed by horizontal and sometimes by diagonal ones. They sometimes underline one letter in preference to others in the same word, passante or they write in detached verses like those of the Bible, or introduce points after every two or three words, as in the MS, in my possession, of a certain ballone, or parathesis, or even one within the other, as Madrol used to do, or notes upon notes, even in the title page, as in the case of Cass, and of La. The letter, a university professor, in a work of twelve pages, has nigh consisting of notes alone. Hepain invented a physiological language, which consists in the main of our own letters reversed out of numbers used in their places. Many have a calligraphy quite peculiar to themselves, clothes continuous with lengthened letters and always extremely legible. Many, like some of the insane whom they surpass in this point, continually intersperse their conversation with puns and plays on words. A certain Jessio 
wished to prove the analogy of the hand and the week in which God created the world by means of a pile of the words main and semain, Eckhart, who had himself said that it is the peculiarity of the insane to occupy themselves with useless trifles, wrote the biography of the madman of Valenciennes and the strange book entitled Anagramata Poema N. 7. Chance, 95th edition. As a matter of fact, it was the first. Rev. Cor et Augmenti a Anagrammatopolis, la an 14 de la er Anagrammatique Valenciers, 1821. 16. The book is almost entirely composed of inversions of words. The following is an example. Lectur il seed que givus dies, quile sbier fera la bruise, quile dupier est sans pedur, que on put macula sans clamur, la nomad a mis la madone, e la paterne de petron, quint le grand asia et at diacre, le cafier cultive du fiancre. And so on for twelve thousand lines, concluding with this. Moi jivas posia mon repos. Here it is well to note that, on the margin of a copy of the Anagramata belonging to the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris, is the first confession in the author's handwriting. Anagrams are one of the greatest inanities of which the human mind is capable. One must be a fool to amuse oneself with them, and worse than a fool to make them. This is a correct diagnosis of his case. Philopanti, in the Dio Liberale, explains Luther's propaganda by a caprice on the part of the deity who caused Marge to become a monk. The latter thus became Martin, and then Martin Luther. The origin of Gleese's vegetarian mania was a dream in which he heard a voice crying in his ears. Gleese's means a Gleese. He thus thought to himself, suddenly appointed by God, to preach his doctrine to mankind. Dumonin has the plague decapitated take away his head from hence i fear that his head will deprive my people of their heads by a new mischief but a still more prevailing characteristic of the singular copiousness of their writings they were left behind no less than 180 books each more foolish than the other we shall see how mangion who in addition was crippled in one hand and could not write deprived himself of food to defray the cost of printing and some have spent more than 100 scudi per month to enable him to gratify his taste for authorship we know how many reams of paper passanati covered and how he attached more importance to the publication of a foolish letter of his than his own life guitiao used so much paper as to incur a considerable debt in which he was unable to pay the list of george fox's works is so long that the bibliographer lones does not venture to give it Howard Lance's essay on Tournay consists of 117 volumes. Sometimes they content themselves with writing and printing their vagaries, and make no attempt to diffuse them among the public, though they assume that the latter must be acquainted with them. In these writings, apart from their morbid prolixity, let it be noted that the aim is either futile or absurd, or in complete contradiction with their social position and previous culture. Thus two physicians write on hypothetic geometry and astrology, a surgeon, a veterinary surgeon, an obstetric practitioner, on aerial navigation, a captain on rural economy, a surgeon on therapeutics, and a cook on high political questions. A theologian writes a treatise on menstrua, a carter on theology. Two porters are the authors of tragedies, and a custom-house officer of a work on sociology. As in the subjects chosen, an examination of 186 insane books in my collection gives the following result. 51 deal with personal topics. 36 are works on medicine. 27 are works on philosophy. 25 contain lamentations. 7 are dramatic. 7 are religious. 6 are poetry. 4 are on astronomy. 4 are on physics. 4 are on politics. 4 are on political economy. 3 are on rural. 2 are on veterinary medicine. Two are on literature, two are on mathematics, one is on grammar, one a dictionary. I do not count miscellaneous works such as controversial treatises, essays on mechanics, studies in magnetism, funeral orations, eccentric theological works, researches in literary history, proclamations, matrimonial advertisements, etc. 
Some statistics compiled by Philomnest gives a list of such books known in Europe, which are thus classified. Theology, 82. Prophecy, Esoteric Mysticism, 44. Philosophy, 36. Politics, 28. Poetry and Drama, 9. Languages and Grammar, 8. Erotic Literature, 5. Hieroglyphics, 3. Astronomy, 2. Aeronautics, 2. Chemistry, 1. Physics, 1. Zoology, 1. Strategy, 1. Chronology, 1. Hygiene, 1. Pedagogy, 1. Archaeology, 1. While poetry prevails among the insane, theology and prophecy predominate in the metoids, and so on in diminishing proportions for the more abstract, uncertain, and incomplete sciences, as we may see by the scarcity of the naturalists and mathematicians. It is well to note the small number of atheists, three only, amidst such a swarm of theologians and philosophers, 162. Spiritualism, on the other hand, is so much in favour that Philomnest gave up the task of cataloguing the works which treated of it. All topics are welcome to metoids, even those most foreign to their profession or occupation, but they are found to choose by preference the most grotesque and uncertain subjects or questions which it is impossible to solve. Such are the quadrature of the circle, hieroglyphics, exposition of the apocalypse, air balloons, and spiritualism. They are also fond of treating the subject most talked of, what one might call the questions of the day. Speaking of demons, who has already been mentioned, Nordier said, He was not a monomaniac, very much the contrary. He was a many-sided madman, always ready to repeat any strange thing that came to his ears, a chameleon-like dreamer, who insanely reflected the colours of the moment. Such so at the time of our great national deficits, projectors appeared by the dozens, with proposals to restore the Italian finances, either by means of assignats, or by the spoliation of the Jews or the clergy, by forced loans, etc. Later on came the social and religious program, Passanante, Lazaretti, Possissio, Cianciatini. At the present moment, the question most under discussion is that of the Pelagra. Thus we have, among others, Pari, who has discovered the cause of the disease in certain fungi, which fall from the roofs of dirty huts into peasants' food, and make them ill. The proof is evident. Photograph the section of a hut, and place it under the microscope. And you will find, on comparison, that fungi are more numerous than in townhouses where pelagria is unknown. But why do these fungi produce the pelagra? The reason is very simple. These fungi contain the substance fungina, which burns at 47 degrees Celsius, sick. Now when the outside temperature is at 13 degrees and the body at 32, sick, the two quantities of caloric are added together, and we burn. This is why sufferers from the pelagra appear scorched by the sun. It is noteworthy that in nearly all Possissio Cianciatini, Passanate, Magione, De Tomasi, B, the convictions set forth in their written works are exceedingly deep and firmly fixed. They show as much absurdity and prolixity in their writings as they do common sense and prudence in their verbal answers even rebutting objections with a single monosyllable, and explaining the own eccentricities with so much good sense, and sometimes acuteness, that the unlearned may well take their fancies for wisdom, while later on they relieve their insane impulses by covering reams of paper. The Guardian is a true sentinel of the people and government. Liberty, the circulation of the press, was a sentence of passanantes, which at first seems a mere play on words, but he explained it, to experts in these terms. The liberty of the press, the free circulation of journals, constitute a surveillance over the rights of the people. When he asked Bossicio why he was so eccentric as to wear sandals and walk about bareheaded and half naked in the heat of July, he replied, to imitate the Romans, and to keep the head healthy, and lastly, to call public attention to my theories by some verbal sign. Would he have stopped to speak to me if I had not been dressed like this? Moreover, matoids, the verse being the case both with genius and insanity, are united by common interest and sympathy, and above all by hatred to their common enemy, the man of genius. They form a kind of freemasonry, all the more powerful that it is irregular, founded on the common need of resisting the ridicule which inexorably attacks them on every side, on the need of extirpating 
or at least supposing the natural antithesis genius though hating one another they are firmly united and though they do not enjoy one another's triumphs they rejoice in common over the victims who never fail to fall to the lot of one or the other for as we have seen the vulgar called upon to choose between the matoid and the man of genius never hesitate to sacrifice the latter even at the present day many practitioners who take the dosimetricans seriously laugh at homeopathy and the academic multitudes who laugh at the schliemann and Artigor, never treated the archaeological discoveries of father secchi in the same way this is also shown by the emphatic and senseless address presented to Coccopelio and Sbarbaro by many individuals who were still more insane than their idols. This explains why, in spite of the fact that universal suffrage was introduced under the Roman Republic of 1849, the populace never thought of electing Ciceracchio to the Parliament. Ciceracchio was a rough working man, but he was sane. One characteristic which further distinguishes matoids from criminals and from many of the actually insane is the extreme abstemiousness, which sometimes equals the excesses of the early Cenobites. Bossicio lived on polenta without salt, Passante on bread only, Lazaretti often on nothing but a few potatoes, Mangion on peas, beans, rice, etc., at thirteen sous a day. This may be explained by their finding sufficient support and comfort in their own grotesque lucubrations, as is the case with ascetics and great thinkers. And besides, being usually poor, they prefer to spend their small means in securing the triumph of their ideas, rather than in satisfying their stomachs. All the more so, as nearly all of them, Cian Chatini, or Cisio, F., for instance, were scrupulously honest and almost excessively methodical, giving account even of scraps of waste paper, which they catalogued with singular order. In short, such men, certainly insane in their writings, and sometimes as much so as any patient in an asylum, are scarcely so in the ordinary acts of life, in which they show themselves full of good sense, shrewdness, and even a sense of order, so that they are quite the reverse of men of real genius, especially those inspired by madness, whose ability in literature is nearly always in inverse proportion to their aptitude for practical life. This is how it happens, the many authors of medical eccentricities are practitioners of great repute. Three such are directors of hospitals. The author of the Scottetenge is a captain and a commissariat officer. Another, the inventor of almost prehistoric machines, an author of works which are more than humorous, fills an office which exposes him to continual contact with cultivated men who have never suspected him of madness. Five are professors, two of whom are attached to a university. Three are deputies two senators, one is a councillor of state, one councillor of prefecture, and another councillor of the court of Cassation, three are provincial councillors, and five priests, and nearly all of them are of advanced age and respected in their vocations. Frecot was mayor of Heslop, Leroux and Asgill were members of parliament, Matoy theologians, Simon Morin, Le Breton, Gilfrio, Fali, Fenini, have unfortunately been taken so seriously as to be burned alive or hanged. Joris's bones were burned with his writings under the gallows of Bayle. Keller was beheaded for the sole offence of having corrected Joris's proofs. We shall see, in the following chapter, how many others, Smith, Fourier, Klinov, Fox, found fanatical followers. Their calmness, in spite of obstinate persistence in a delusion, which distinguishes them from more ordinary insane patients, may also be observed in monomaniacs, even in their most prominent characteristic, and is not rarely found in some of the stages of inebriety. But precisely as in the ordinary insane, so also in toids, the calm sometimes suddenly ceases, and gives place to impulsive forms of mania and delusion, especially under the stimulus of hunger or irritated passion, or during the return of the various neuroses which accompany and often generate the disease, as in the case of Cordigliani and Mangion. This is why it is important to note that many are subjects to symptoms which indicate the pre-existence of disturbance of the nervous centres. Gerard and Spandry have convulsive movements of the face, lowering of the right eyebrow, and with on the right side. Anesthesia was found in Lazaretti, Mangione, 
anti-Tomasi, delusions of short durations in Cordigliani. P, a young man of distinguished abilities, became actoid early after attack of typhus fever. Colin became a prophet at 18, after suffering from disease of the brain. These impulsive outbursts make such cases extremely important to alienist physicians, who, finding no similar cases in any of the better-known forms of mental disease, often erroneously infer imposture or soundness of mind, and still more to politicians, who, by not at once placing such men, at first it is true, far more ridiculous than dangerous, in asylums, expose themselves to perils perhaps greater than those threatened by actual madmen, who betray themselves at once, thus making it possible to take measures for rendering them harmless. There is a much more dangerous variety of these graphomaniacs, those whose disease was formerly known as lawsuit mania. These individuals feel a continual craving to go to law against others, while considering themselves the injured party. They display an extraordinary activity, and a minute knowledge of the law, which they always try to interpret to their own advantage, heaving up petition on petition, memorial on memorial, in such quantities as is difficult to imagine. Many attach themselves to some person to obtain whose influence they are continually scheming, then they apply to the king or the parliament. They are apt to succeed at first, especially with members of parliament, or at least to be considered merely as overzealous suitors. At last, however, when their persistence has wearied every one out, they convert their forensic and literary violence into deeds, certain that everything will be pardoned them in consideration of the justice of their cause nay, that their action will have the effect of deciding the suit in their favour. The result, to tell the truth, sometimes ensues, thanks to the institution of the jury. Thus G, having lost his cause, shot at and wounded Count Colley, but was acquitted through the singular eloquence he displayed before the jury. Ten years later, he forced his way, armed, into an apartment which he had already sold, and which, nevertheless, he insisted on having back as the erotomaniac falls in love with an ideal person and imagines himself loved by one who has never even seen him so they can see no aspect of the cause but their own and the lawyers and judges who do not support them become enemies on whom they concentrate the fiercest hatred and whom they look on as a cause of every misfortune that may befall them it is not rare to find them constituting themselves judges in their own cause pronouncing sentence on their own responsibility on their adversaries and sometimes going the length of executing the same a certain b from whom the parish priest had taken a field by a perfectly legal and regular contract took it into his head that he had the right to assault all the priests of his village because he said catholicism is in opposition to the government for the same reason he tried to burn down the church and all this after a series of lawsuits and proclamations very just it may be conceded in principle but certainly not in application these persons have too a similar kind of handwriting with very much lengthened letters and they likewise abuse the alphabet their theme however is confined to their immediate circle and they show more violence in dealing with it they are only touched by rebound as it were on social and religious questions yet the personal litigations of many of these suitors are mixed up with political differences and this is the kind from which most danger is to be expected in our day. These are usually individuals whose scant education and extreme poverty do not allow them to air their ideas in print, so that they have to relieve their feelings by deeds of violence. Such was Sandon, who caused such annoyance to Napoleon and to Billiot, and was a German political matoid, such too were Cordigliani, Passanante, Manguion, and Gautau. Kraft Ebbing speaks of a man who had founded a club of the oppressed for the assistance of those who could get no justice from the courts and forwarded its rules to the king. Matoids of Genius Not only is there an imperceptible gradation between sane and insane, between madmen and matoids, but also between these last, who are the very negation of genius, and men of real genius, so much so that among my collection there are certain individuals I find a difficulty in classifying. Such, for instance, is Bossicio of Lodi. El Bossicio of Lodi, 53 years of age, has one cousin, a Crittin. His mother is sane and intelligent, his father intelligent, but given to drink. He had two brothers who died of meningitis. 
As a young man, he became a revenue officer, left his native town in 1848, and when nearly dying of hunger at Turin, threw himself from a balcony and broke his legs. Having obtained promotion in 1859, he fulfilled his duties in a satisfactory manner up to the year 1866, when, though still showing intelligence accuracy in his duties of his office, he began to perform eccentric actions, especially inexplicable in a member of the bureaucracy. Thus, one day, he bought all the birds for sale in the village of Basilengo, and then opened their cages and set them at liberty. He took to reading newspapers all day long, and began to send energetic protests to the government, petitioning them to put a stop to the disforesting of the country, the massacre of birds, etc. Being dismissed from his post with a meagre pension, he suddenly gave up all the luxuries of life, and took no food but polenta without salts. He left off, one at a time, all his clothes except shirt and drawers, and spent all his scanty means on the purchase of books and papers, and in publishing works on the regeneration of posterity, which he distributed gratuitously. Criticisms on My Times, The Cry of Nature, and 113 of The Cry of Nature. To anyone who studies these books, and still more, to one who hears him talk, there is evident that he has worked out on his own head a system not entirely logical. We suffer loss, he says, though to grape disease through the diseases among the silkworms and crabs, through floods. All these things are caused by injury done to the globe through the destruction of forests and the extermination of birds. And, this is where we first perceive his madness, the torture inflicted on it by the railways which pass over its surface. In economical matters, we are doing equal ill. By raising ruinous loans, we are compromising the future of that posterity whose champion he has appointed himself. Add to this, he continues, that the ancient Romans took much exercise, and not the luxury that we have, and did not take coffee. All these things compromise posterity, because they ruin the germs of humanity, and what ruins them far more is the ill treatment of women, marriages for the sake of money, and certain forms of ill-judged charity. Unhappy children, crippled or consumptive, are kept alive, who have killed in time, will not reproduce themselves, and in the same way, if, instead of keeping sickly individuals alive in hospitals, at great trouble and expense, people were to help the strong and healthy when they fall ill. The race would be improved. And thieves and murderers, are they too not sick men who ought to be exterminated, if the race is not to be ruined? How deadly and bestial is human greed? Everything is neglected for the sake of satisfying the appetites, without a thought for the fate of the generations who are to succeed us. The ill omen mania for procreation, which is inexorably precipitating all nations into an abyss whence one can see no outlet, and which arrested the attention of Malthus, reminds me of the story of Midas, who asked of a god that everything which he touched might turn to gold. The divinity consented, but his first transports of joy were followed by grief and despair, as his very food being changed to gold, he saw himself contemned by himself to die of hunger. I think there could be no better example than this to prove the existence of an active and powerful mind, unsound on a single given point. Anyone who knows the writings of Clements Royer and Comte will, in fact, find nothing insane in these ideas of Bostisior's, except his refusal to eat salt, which he scarcely justifies by adducing the example of savages who are strong and healthy without it. His notion of railways ruin their globe, and his very airy fashion of dress. For this last whim, however, he gives a tolerably good reason by alleging the example of Roman simplicity, and by the assertion, not altogether without foundation, that the wearing of the hat tends to promote baldness. Moreover, he observed, very justly, that without these eccentric habits, he would be unable to gain a hearing and promulgate his ideas. A truly morbid symptom, however, is to be found in the fact that he based all his conclusions on the information gained from political journals, poor material indeed, for study. However, he justified himself thus. What can I do? They are modern studies, and I cannot do without them, much as I dislike them, as I have no other means of gaining information about mankind. But the point where his insanity comes out most clearly is in the importance attached by him to the slightest fact gathered up in these sweepings of the political world. If a child falls into the water at Lisbon, or a lady sets her skirts on fire, he immediately infers from these facts the degeneracy of the race. The student of hygiene must be astonished at seeing a man retain robust health, and Bossiso walks his twenty miles a day on unsalted polenta. The psychologist cannot refuse to recognise, in this case, 
that madness acts like leaven on the intellectual powers and excites the psychic functions so as almost to reach the level of genius though not without traces of disease it is certain that if Bossicio had been a student of law or medicine instead of a poor exciseman and had been grounded in the culture which he only gained at haphazard and under the influence of mental disease he might have become a clemence royer or a comte or at least another fourier for his philosophic system is in the main similar to that of the latter except for the peculiarities engrafted on it by mental aberration but when we think of the integrity of his life the method and order to be perceived in all his affairs we can dismiss him merely as a man of unsound mind and when we remember the relative novelty of his ideas can we confuse him with the many absurd metoids already described certainly not let us suppose that giuseppe ferrari instead of a superior culture had only received bossicio's education we should certainly have had in place of a savant justly admired by the world something similar to bossicio certainly indeed those symptoms of historical arithmetic with kings and republics dying on a fixed day at the will of another can only belong to the world of mental alienation the same thing might be said of michelet if one thinks of his fancy natural history his academic obscenities his incredible vanity and the latter volumes of his history of france which are nothing but a tangled thicket of scandalous anecdotes and grotesque paradoxes so too of fortier and his disciples who predict the mathematical exactness that eighty thousand years hence man will attain the age of one hundred and forty four that in those days we shall have thirty seven millions of poets unhappy world likewise thirty seven millions of mathematicians able to newton of le mercier who along with some very fine dramas wrote some in which speeches are assigned to ants seals and the mediterranean and of bourquillio who asked painters to depict for him an earthquake in the air and describes a mounted giving a pair of spectacles to a bell tower the same is true of the heir of confucius the astronomer who created the dio liberale of the suedo geologist who had discovered a secret of embalming bodies which might be known to any assistant demonstrator of anatomy and who believes that the world can be purified by cremation in italy a man has for many years been a professor in one of the great universities who in his treatises created the nation of the cagots and suggested a certain instrument for resuscitating the apparently drowned which would have been enough to suffocate a healthy person another talked of baths at the temperature of minus twenty degrees celsius and the advantages of sea water owing to the exaltations of the fish yet his volumes contain some very fine things and have reached a second edition and none of his colleagues ever suspected that his mind was not perfectly sound how is he to be classified he occupies a middle place between the madman the man of genius and the graphomaniac with which last he has in common the sterility of his aims and his calm and persistent search after paradoxes italy for the rest as i have shown in tri tribuni has had and idolized for a brief quarter of an hour two metoids of considerable gifts cocapelier and sparbaro who in the midst of immoralities trivialities contradictions and paradoxes had a few traits of genius explicable by a less degree of messianism and a greater facility in adopting new ideas decadent poets some acquaintance with this new variety of literary madmen will explain to us the existence in the seventeenth century of the french Precaux, and at the present day that of the parnassians symbolists and the decadents i have read their verses say le maitre and not even seen as much as a turkey in the fable who if he did not distinguish very well at least saw something i have been able to make nothing of these series of words which being connected together according to the laws of syntax might be supposed to have some sense and have none and which spitefully keep your mind on the stretch in a vacuum like a conundrum without an answer antidentele o enesnatoire mondu evanosement tracens pour l'être sans histoire tel vous de l'evres resumant tout ombre hors de un territoire setente iterativement et la lueur excellentoire despotales le rumenet one of them however has explained to us what they intend doing in a pamphlet modestly entitled traits du verbe 
by Stefan Mallarmé. By this it appears that they have invented two things, the symbol and the poetic instrumentation. The invention of the symbolist seems to consist in not saying what feelings, thoughts, or states of mind they express by images, but even this is not new. A symbol is, in short, an enlarged comparison of which only the second term is given, a connected series of metaphors. Briefly, the symbol is the old allegory of our fathers. Now here is a second discovery made by our wild-eyed symbolists. Men have suspected ever since Homer's time that there are relations, correspondences, affinities between certain sounds, forms, and colours, and certain states of mind. For instance, it was felt that the repeated sound of A had something to do with the impression of freshness and pace produced by this line of Virgil. Basketur in silva magna formosa juvenca. It was known that sounds may, like colours, be striking or subdued, like feeling sad or joyful. But it was thought that these resemblances and relations are somewhat figurative, having nothing constant or sharply defined, and that they are, at least, hinted at by the sense of the words which compose a musical phrase. Now attend to this, for the gentlemen. A equals black, E equals white, I equals blue, O equals red, U equals yellow. Again, black equals the organ, white equals the harp, blue equals the violin, red equals the trumpet, yellow equals the flute. Again, the organ expresses monotony, doubt, and simplicity. The harp, serenity, the violin, passion and prayer, the trumpet, glory and ovation, the flute, smiles and ingenuousness. It is difficult to make out to what degree the young symbolites still take account of the sense of words. That degree, however, is in any case very slight, and for my part, I cannot well distinguish the passages where they are obscure from those where they are only unintelligible. In short, a poetry without thoughts, at once primitive and subtle, which does not, like classic poetry, express a connected series of ideas, nor like the poetry of the Parnassians, the physical world in its exact outlines, but states of mind in which we can scarcely distinguish ourselves from surrounding objects, where sensation is so closely united in sentiment, or that it grows so rapidly and naturally out of the former, that it is quite sufficient for us to note down our sensations of random as they present themselves, to express ipso facto the emotions which they successfully give rise to in the mind. Do you understand? Neither do I. One would have to be drunk in order to understand this. I can only conceive that the poetry, an attempt to find, which has here been made, could be that of a solitary, a nerve sufferer, an almost madman. This poetry thus flourishes on the borderland between reason and madness. Yet these metoids have their man of genius. Verlaine. Let us hear Le Matre on this subject. I imagine he must be almost illiterate. He has a strange head. The profile of Socrates, an enormous forehead, a skull knobbed like a battered basin of thin copper. He is not civilized, he ignores all received codes of morality. One day he disappears. What has become of him? It would be in character for him to have been publicly cast out from regular society. I see him behind the gate of a prison, like Francois Villon, not for having, like him, become an accomplice of thieves and rogues for the love of a free life, but rather for an air of oversensitiveness for having avenged, by an involuntary stab, given as it were in a dream, a love reprobated by laws and customs of the modern and western world. But though socially degraded, he remains innocent. He repents as simply as he sinned, with a catholic repentance, all term tenderness, without reasoning, without pride of intellect. In his conversion, as in his sin, he remains a purely emotional being. Then it may be, a woman took pity on him, and he let himself be led like a little child. He reappears, but continues to live apart. No one has ever seen him on the boulevards, or in a theatre, or at the salon. He is somewhere at the other end of Paris, in the back room of a wine merchant shop, drinking blue wine. He is as far from us as if he were an innocent satyr in the great forests. When he is ill, or at the end of his resources, some doctor, whom he knew formerly, when in jail, gets him into the hospital. He stays there as long as he can and writes verses. He hears queer, sad songs whispered to him out of the folds of the cold white calico curtains. He is not déclassé, for he never had a class. His case is rare and peculiar. He finds means to live in a civilized society as he could live in a state of the freest nature. 
it may be that he has sometimes felt for an instant the influence of some contemporary poets but these have done nothing for him save to wake and reveal him to the extreme and painful sensibility which is his whole being in the main he is without a master he mounts language at his will not like a great writer because he knows it but like a child because he is ignorant of it he gives wrong senses to words in his simplicity little as we might expect it this poet whom his disciples regard as such a consummate artist writes on occasion if we may dare to speak out like a pupil of the technical schools or a second-rate chemist subject to lyric outbursts after this it is amusing to see him while posing as the implacable artist the sculptor of strokes the gentleman who distrusts imagination write with the keenest sense of enjoyment a nos qui cecilons les mots con des coups et qui fessions des vers mus tres freudment secul nos fort a nos est ox leurs des lamps la science conquis et le sommeil dompte yet this writer so wanting ordinary technical skill as yet written i cannot tell how verses of a penetrating sweetness a language charm which is peculiarly his own and which perhaps arises from union of these things charm of sound clearness of feeling and partial obscurity in words thus when he tells us that he is dreaming of an unknown woman who loves him who understands him and weeps with him he adds son nom jimmy souvens qui est la douce et sonore comme sous des aims qui la verxila son regard es prevail au regard des statues et pour sa voix l'entwain et calme et grève elle a le inflexion des voix chères qui se sont i am very fond of the chanson d'automne though certain words blem and suffocant are not perhaps used with entire accuracy and scarcely correspond with the langua described just before les sanglots longs des virons de l'automne blessant mon cure de un langua monotone tout suffocant et blem quand sonne la hua je me souvens des jours anciens et je pliwa et je le mauvais ut vot mauvais qui m'importe de cardilla parella a la fule morte he celebrates the virgin in exceedingly fine hymn jenny vu plus a mire qui ma mire mari et comige et as faible et bien machant en cor ox main laches les iux e bluis des shamans elis passea mes iux et me jungent les mains et me insigne les mots per les quis en ador et tuis es bonze futs versus croi et lucais comige in vocois el insignent mes reins his pity inspires him with some very sweet lines ecutes la chanson bien dus quine pleurer quel por vos pleur elle est discute elle est ligere an frisson de io sur de la mousse elle dit la voix grecnu qui bibont se est notre vie qui de la haine et la envie reine est la mot venu a colles la voix qui persiste dans son naif epithelame elle est reine se meleur l'aime Quid fer an la mos trist jene me souvens plus qui tu le me fon le jai fait dans tous les mouvements bizarres de ma vie de me malheurs solon me la emet et le lure des auteurs et de moi de la route se vie je en reine en retenu qui le grace dieu dieu but even in the poem's certain names we already meet with pieces of an oddity difficult to define pieces which seem to belong to a poet who is slightly mad or perhaps to one who is only half awake and whose brain is darkened by the fumes of his dreams or of drink so external objects only appear to him through mist and the indolence of his memory prevents him from getting hold of the right words take this for an example la lune plaquerette ses tens de zinc parangas of tous des boots de fume en forma de zinc sortain and tous et noirs des hoods tweets pointus le ciel et et gris le bis pleurait ainsi qu'un basson 
Alun el matuo for lex de squid. Maluet de etrage eger facon. Moege alis revant du divan platon. Eti fidaeis. Eti salamine et de marathon. Sutli all cling not at des blues bex de gaz. That is all. What is it? It is an impression. The impression of a gentleman who walks about the streets of Paris at night and thinks about Plateau and Salamis and thinks it funny to think of Plateau and Salamis sous or desbex de Grez. Why should it be funny? I cannot tell. Amis donc la raison que tu dures for eclits. Impruntent de el sur le lieu lestre et le brix. One might almost say that Paul Verlaine is the only poet who has never expressed anything but sentiment and sensation as expressed them for himself and for no one else, which dispenses him from the obligation of showing the connection between his ideas, since he knows it. This poet never asked himself whether he should be understood, and he has never wished to prove anything. This is why, said Gaz accepted, it is almost impossible to give a resume of his collections, or to state their main idea in a sufficient form. One can only characterize them by means of the state of mind of which they are most frequently the rendering. Semi-intoxication, hallucination which distorts objects and makes them resemble in a garret dream. Uneasiness of the soul which, in the terror of this mystery, complains like a child. The languor, mystic sweetness, and a lulling of the mind to rest. And the Catholic conception of the universe accepted in all simplicity. There is something profoundly and voluntarily and illogical in the poetry of M. Paul Verlaine. He scarcely ever expresses movements in full consciousness or entire sanity. It is on this account, very often, that the meaning of his song is clear, if it is so at all, to himself alone. In the same way, his rhythms are sometimes perceptible by no one but himself. I do not infer here to the interlaced feminine rhymes, alliterations, as for instance within the line itself of which none has made us more frequently or more successfully than he. But there are two sides to him. On one he looks very artificial. He has an eyes poetic of his own, which is entirely subtle and mysterious, and which I think he was very late in discovering. De la musique van toute chose, et pour cela préfère l'empire, plus vague et plus sur le bout dans l'air, sans rien et l'eau qui presque au copose. Il faut aussi que tu ne les bons. Toi sois tes mots sans quel que me plaise. Rien de plus chale que la chanson gris. O de indices au précis jont. Quand nos volons à nos n'accord. Passe la couleur, rien que la nos. O, à nos, c'est le faïence. Le vieux orveuf est la flûte à cor. On the other side, he is quite simple. Jésus fait nous comme orphelines. Reach de mel sueurs des tranquilles, vers le homes des grands villes. Les ne m'en pas trop malin. Or elsewhere, j'ai prefer de un basier, quand du un habiel. Je souffle et je viel, sans me reposer, j'ai un pure de un basier. It will be seen that the decadence correspond exactly to the diagnosis of literary metoids, in all their old vacuity, but with the appearance of novelty. At the same time, there are among them real men of genius who, amid the frequently atavistic oddities of matoidism, have struck an original note. All these cases show us that the gradations and transitions between sanity and insanity are far from being as hypothetical as Livy asserts them to be. Moreover, all this is in perfect harmony with the internal evolution which we see going on in the ample realm of nature, which, as has been well said, never proceeds by leaps, but by successive and gradual transformations. Now it is natural that, as these gradations exist in this very strange form of literary insanity, they should also be found in the forms of criminal insanity, and that, in consequence, many of those asserted to be guilty or mad are only half responsible, although no human thought can trace the limits with entire certainty. It is well to observe here what a difference appearance madness assumes, according to the age in which it occurs. Had Bossicio lived in the Middle Ages, or in Spain or Mexico at a later period, the kind-hearted liberator of birds, the matur for posterity, would have become a St. Ignatius or Torquemada, the positivist atheist and ultra-Catholic, commanded by a cruel deity to immolate human victims. But Bossicio was an Italian, living in 1870. 
this case affords an excellent explanation of the occurrence in remote times and among savage or slightly civilized nations of numerous outbreaks of epidemic insanity and shows that many historical events may have been the results of mania on the part of one or more persons cases in point are those of the anabaptists the flagrants the witch mania the taiping revolution mental aberration gives rise in some men to ideas which though bizarre are sometimes gigantic and rendered more efficacious by a singular force of conviction so to sweep along the feeble-minded multitude who are all the more attracted by any singularity in dress attitudes or abstinence which such disease alone can suggest and render it possible that these phenomena are made inexplicable to them and therefore worthy of veneration by their ignorance and barbarism the ignorant man always adores what he cannot understand our poor sufferer from hallucinations want nothing but a favourable epoch to impress his ideas on the multitude neither muscular strength nor a certain vigour of thought nor extraordinary endurance under privations nor disinterestedness nor conviction in another epoch italy would have found her mahomets in basicio matoids in art at a competition opened in rome for designs for a proposed monument to victor emmanuel the subject being an international one metoids came forward in crowds in fact we find in dossier's curious book no less than thirty nine out of two hundred ninety six thirteen per cent a number which would be raised to twenty five per cent if we had thirty eight more who in addition to their eccentricity gave tokens of being imbecile the most general characteristic of these productions is their stupidity one of them proposes a square stone box without a roof similar to the magnanaries or roofless stone buildings used in the south of france for silkworms which he calls a right quadrangular tower destined to receive the late king's remains and protect them against the inundations of the tiber tris monument destined to live for centuries consists of a column surrounded by obelisks by four flights of steps and four triangles each surrounded by twelve small spires each of the latter is to support a bust each of the columns a statue of some great italian with regard to six statues the artist reserves the right of changing them at the death of our illustrious men Sela, namayendi etc this is a case of saying perish the astrologer another competitor to in fact have rejected rooms to serve as public laboratories to the base of their columns there's a curious coincidence an emulation of hatred in nearly all most of them make use of celebrated monuments whose destruction is of course in sine qua non to the erection of theirs but if wanting in every sign of genius these designs are not deficient in allegorical symbols of the most grotesque type or in inscriptions some of them indeed are nothing but a mass of irrelevant inscriptions relating to everything in the world except the poor re galantuomo himself but more particularly to the supposed genius of the artist here we find the main characteristic of such minds vanity heightened to the point of disease makes each of them think his own production a masterpiece ken Ford declares that he is neither engineer nor architect but inspired by god alone a b does not send his design to the committee because it is too grand and another ends by saying how mighty is the thought of the artist nearly all are absolutely ignorant of the art in which they claim to excel thus does he found among the projectors teachers of mathematics and of grammar doctors in medicine and in law military men accountants and others who themselves assert that they had never before handled pencil or compasses at the same time their far from humble social position bears out what i consider to be one of the principal points viz that we have before us as might be suspected idiots or persons actually insane but men quite respectable outside their special artistic mania such should be m a member of the russian archaeological society or the hellenic Siliage, architect in chief of Rumelia and the palaces of the sultan knight and a commander of various orders etc etc when we compare these stupid abortions with the pictures inspired by insanity i am now speaking of those painters who like various poets and musicians in losing their reason lost artistically more than they gained especially the right proportion and the harmony of colour we shall often find the absurd and disproportionate but also at the same time a true even excessive originality mingled with a savage beauty sui generis which up to a certain point recalls the masterpieces of medieval and still more of chinese and japanese art so extraordinarily rich in symbols we shall see in short that art suffers here 
not from a defect but from an excess of genius which ends by crushing itself in conclusion it is very evident that the insane artist is as superior to the metoid in the practice of his art as he is inferior to him in practical life that in short in the region of art the matwood approaches nearer to the imbecile and the lunatic to the man of genius end of section twelve section thirteen of the man of genius by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recorded by leon harvey chapter four Political and Religious Lunatics Matoids Part played by the insane in the progressive movements of humanity Examples Probable Causes Religious Epidemics of the Middle Ages Francis of Assisi Luther Savonarola Cola d'Arinzi San Juan de Duas Campanella Prosper Infantin Lazaretti Passinante Guitao South Americans all this helps us to understand why the great progressive movements of nations in politics and religion have so often brought about or at least determined by insane or half insane persons the reason is that in these alone is to be found coupled with originality which is a special characteristic of the genius and the lunatic and still more of those who partake of the character of both the exaltation capable of generating a sufficient amount of altruism to sacrifice their own interests and their lives for the sake of making known the new truths and often of getting them accepted by a public to which innovations are always unwelcome and which frequently takes a bloody revenge on the innovator such persons says maudsley are apt to seize on and dispute the bypass of thought which have been overlooked by more stable intellects and so by throwing a side light on things to discover unthought of relations one observes this tendency of mind even in those of them who have no particular genius or talent for they have a novel way of looking at things do not run in the common groove of action or follow the ordinary routine of thought and feeling but discover in their remarks a certain originality and perhaps singularity sometimes at a very early period of life notable again is the emancipated way in which some of them discuss as if they were problems of mechanics objects or even round which the associations of ideas and feelings have thrown a glamour of conventional sentiment in regard to most beliefs they are usually more or less heterodox or heretical though not often constant being apt to swing round suddenly from one point to a quite opposite point of the compass of belief inspired with strong faith in the opinions which they adopt they exhibit much zeal and energy in the propagation of them they are careless of every obstacle and untroubled by the doubts which arise in the minds of calm and sceptical thinkers thus they are frequently social or religious reformers it should be understood that they do not create anything but only give a direction to the latest movements prepared by time and circumstance as also thanks to their passion for novelty and originality they are nearly always inspired by the latest discoveries or innovations and use these as their starting point in guessing at the future thus schopenhauer wrote at an epoch in which pessimism was beginning to be fashionable together with mysticism and only fused the whole into one philosophic system caesar found the ground prepared for him by the tribunes when says taine a new civilization produces a new art there are ten men of talent to express the idea of the public and group themselves round one man of genius who gives it actuality thus de castro moreto lopez de la viga round Calderon, van dyck jordaens divos and Snyder's round rubens luther summed up in himself the ideas of many of his contemporaries and predecessors it is sufficient to mention savannah the spherical shape of the earth had already been maintained by st thomas aquinas and by dante before the discoveries of columbus which were also antedated by those of the canary islands iceland and cape verde if the new ideas are too divergent from prevalent popular opinion or too self-evidently absurd they die out with their author if indeed they do not involve him in their fall arnold Brescia, nunston campanella tried to shake off the dominion of the clergy and take away the temporal power of the pope they were persecuted and crushed the insane person says Maudley, is in a minority of one in his opinion and so at first is a reformer the difference being that the foremost belief is 
and advance on the received system of thought, and so in time gets acceptance, or the belief of the former, being opposed to the common sense of mankind, gains no acceptance, but dies upwards, processor, or with the few foolish persons whom it has infected. Of late years there has arisen in India, owing to the efforts of Keshab Chandar Sen, a new religion which defies modern rationalism and scepticism. But here also the madness of Keshab evidently outran the march of the times, for the triumph of a similar religion is not probable, even among us, with a much greater progress in knowledge. Thus, too, Buddhism, finding the ground contested by the caste system in India, took no firm hold there, but extended itself in China and Tibet. Keshab was induced to take up this line of action by a form of madness analogues, to which we shall was a C&B of Modena. In fact, this strange rationalist belief in Revelation, and in 1879 he declaimed, I am the inspired prophet, etc. The same thing may be said of politics. Historical revolutions are never lasting, unless the way has been prepared for them by a long series of events. But the crisis is often precipitated, sometimes many years before its time, by the unbalanced geniuses who outrun the course of events foresee the development of intermediate facts which escape the common eye, and rush without a thought of themselves on the opposition of their contemporaries, acting like those insects which, in flying from one flower to another, transport the pollen which would otherwise have required violent winds, or a long space of time to render it available for fertilization. Now we add the immovable, fanatical conviction of the madman to the calculating sagacity of genius, we shall have a force capable, in any age, of acting as a lever on the torpid masses, struck dumb before this phenomenon, which appears strange and rare, even to calm thinkers and spectators at a distance. And further, the influence which madness, in itself, already has over barbarous peoples at early periods, and we may well call the force an irresistible one. The importance of the madman among savages and the semi-barbarous peoples of ancient times is rather historical than pathological. He is feared and adored by the masses, and often rules them. In India, some madmen are held in high esteem, and consulted by the Brahmins, a custom which many sects bear traces. In ancient India, the eight kinds of demonomania bore the names of the eight principal Indian divinities. The Yakshyagraya have deep intelligence. The Devagraya are strong and intelligent, and esteemed and consulted by the Brahmins. The Gandharvagarya serve as Choristers to the gods, but in order to know what a point the veneration of the insane may reach, and how little modern India has changed in this respect, it is quite sufficient to observe that there exist at present in the country forty three sects which show particular zeal towards her divinity, sometimes by drinking urine, sometimes by walking on the points of sharp stones, sometimes by remaining motionless for years exposed to the rays of the sun, or by representing to their own imagination the corporeal image of the god and offering up to him, also in imagination, prayers, flowers, or food. The existence of endemic insanity among the ancient Hebrews, and by parity of reasoning among their congeners, the Phoenicians, Carthagians, etc., the same words being used for prophet, madman, and wicked man, is proved by history and language. The Bible relates that David, fearing that he would be killed, feigned madness, and that Achish said, have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? This passage is evidence of their abundance, and also of their inviolability, which is certainly owing to the belief still common among the Arabs, which causes the word Nabi, prophet, to be constantly used in the Bible in the sense of madman, and vice versa. Saul, even before his coronation, was suddenly seized by the prophetic spirit, so much to the surprise of the bystanders that the event was made the occasion of a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? One day after he had become king, the spirit of an evil deity weighed upon him, and he prophesied, he raged, in the house, and attempted to transfix David with a lance. In Jeremiah twenty nine twenty six we read, The Lord hath made thee priest, for every man is mad and make himself a prophet, that thou shouldest put him in prison, and in the stocks. In 1 Kings 8, we see the prophets of the groves, and of Baal, crying out like madmen, and cutting their flesh. In the first book of Samuel, we find Saul as a prophet rushing naked through the fields. 
Else we see prophets publicly approaching places of ill fame, cutting their hands, eating filth, etc. The Mejdub of the Arab and the Persian Tavana are the modern analogues. Mejdub Bubim says Berbruker is a name given to these individuals who under the influence of special circumstances fall into a state which exactly recalls that of the convulsionaries of St. Medard. They are numerous in Algeria, where they are better known under the names of Esawa or Amamarim. Mullah Ahmed, in the narratives of his journey, translated by Berbuger, speaks of Sidi Abdullah, the Mentutab, who brought the best influence to bear on the Hamis, his thievish and vicious fellow citizens. He would remain for three or five days like a log, without eating, drinking, or praying. He could do without sleep for forty days, at the end of which he was seized with violent convulsions. Further on he speaks of one of the city at the El Kadir, who wandered from place to place, forgetful of himself and his family, and indifference probably due to his sainthood. Drummond Hay shows us how far respect for the insane is carried in Morocco and among the neighbouring nomadic tribes. The more tells us that God has retained their reason in heaven, or else their bodies upon earth, and when madmen or idiots speak, the reason is, for the time, permitted to return to them and that their words should be treasured up to those of inspired persons. The author himself and an English consul were in danger of being killed by one of these novel saints, who, naked and often armed, insisted on acting out the strangest caprices which enter their heads, and those who oppose them do so at their peril. In Barbary, says Pananti, the caravans are in the habit of consulting the mad Santons, Vasli, to whom nothing is forbidden. One of them strangled every person who came to the mosque. Another of the public baths violated a newly married bride, and her companions congratulated the fortunate husband on the occurrence. The Ottomans extended to the insane the veneration which they have for dervishes, and believe that they stand in a special relation to the deity. Even the ministers of religion receive them into their own houses with great respect. They are called Yulia, Ula Deli, divine ones, sons of God, or more accurately, madmen of God, and the various sects of dervishes present phenomena analogous to those of madness. Every monastery has its own species of prayer or dance, or rather its own peculiar kind of convulsion. Some move their bodies from side to side, others backwards and forwards, and gradually quicken the motion as they go on with their prayer. These movements are called makadbi, heightening of the divine glory, or Ovres Tawid, praise of the unity of God. The Kufes are distinguished above all other orders by exaggerated sanctity. They sleep little, lying, and when they do, with their feet in water and fast for weeks together. They begin the chant of Allah, advancing the left foot and executing a rotatory movement with the right, while holding each other by the forearm. Then they march forward, raising their voices more and more, quickening the motion of the dance, and throwing their arms over each other's shoulders till worn out and perspiring, with glazing eyes and pale faces, they fall into the sacred convulsion, Haluk. In this state of religious mania, says our author, they submit to the ordeal of hot iron, and, when the fire is burned out, cut their flesh with swords and knives. In Bataki, when a man is possessed by an evil spirit, he is greatly respected. What he says is looked on as the utterance of an oracle, and immediately obeyed. In Madagascar, the insane are objects of veneration. In 1863, many people were seized with tremors and impelled to strike those who came near them. They were also subject to hallucinations and saw the dead queen coming out of her grave. The king ordered these persons to be respected, and for a space of at least two months, soldiers were seen beating their officers and officials their superiors. In China, only the well-defined traits of insanity are to be found in the only Chinese sect which was ever conspicuous in that sceptical nation for religious fanaticism. The followers of Tao believed in demoniacal possession and endeavoured to gather the future from the utterances of madmen, thinking that the possessed person declares in words the thought of the spirit. In Oceana, at Tahiti, a species of prophet is called Iotoa, i.e. possessed of the divine spirit. The chief of the island said that he was a bad man, Tuato Enno, or Mai, the interpreter said that these prophets were a kind of madmen, some of whom in their attacks were not conscious of what they were doing, nor could they afterwards remember what they had done. With regard to America, 
schoolcraft in that enormous medley entitled historical and statistical information of the indian tribes eighteen fifty four says that the regard for madmen is a characteristic trait of the indian tribes of the north and especially of oregon who are considered the most savage among these latter he mentions a woman who showed every symptom of insanity sang in a grotesque manner gave away to others all the trifles she possessed and cut her flesh when they refused to accept them the indians treated her with great respect the patagonians have women doctors and magicians who prophesy and emit convulsive attacks men may also be elected to the priesthood but they must then dress as women and cannot be admitted unless they have from their childhood shown special qualifications what these are is shown by the fact that epileptics are appointed as a matter of course as possessing the divine spirit in peru besides the priests there are prophets who uttered their improvisations amid terrible contortions and convulsions they were venerated by the people but despised by the higher classes all revolutions in algeria and in the sudan are due to lunatics or neurotics who make by their own neurosis and the religious societies in which they attach themselves instruments for invigorating religious fanaticism and getting themselves accepted as inspired messages of god such were the mahdi omar and a madman who headed the great revolt of the tapings in china phenomena which present such complete uniformity must arise from like causes these seem to me to be reducible to the following one the mass of the people accustomed to the few sensations habitual to them cannot experience new ones without wonder or strange ones without adoration adoration is i should say the necessary effect of the reflex movement produced in them by the overwhelming stock of the new impression the peruvians supplied the word huilca divine to the sacred victim the temple a high tower a great mountain a ferocious animal a man with seven fingers a shining stone etc in the same way the semitic el divine is synonymous with great light new as applied to a strong man as well as to a tree a mountain or an animal after all it is quite natural that men should be struck by the phenomenon of one of their fellow creatures completely changing his voice and gestures and associating together the strangest ideas when we ourselves with all the advantages of science are often puzzled to understand the reasons for his actions two some of these madmen possess as we have seen and shall see again in the middle ages and among the indians extraordinary muscular strength the people venerate strength three they often show an extraordinary insensibility to cold to fire to wounds as among the arab santons and among run lunatics and to hunger four some affected either by theomania or ambitious mania have first declared themselves inspired by the gods or chiefs and leaders of the nation etc drew after them the current of popular opinion already disposed in their favour five the following is the principal reason many of these madmen must have shown a force of intellect or at any rate of will very much superior to those of the masses whom they swayed by their extravagances if the passions redouble the force of the intellect certain forms of madness which are nothing but a morbid exaltation of their passions may be said to increase it a hundredfold their conviction of the truth of their own hallucinations the fluent and vigorous eloquence with which they give utterance to them and which is precisely the effect of their real conviction and the contrast between their obscure or ignoble past and their present position of power or splendour give to this form of insanity in the mind of the people a natural preponderance over same but quiet habits of mind lazaretti briand loyola molinos joan of arc the anabaptists etc are proofs of this assertion and it is a fact that in epidemics of prophecy such as those which prevailed in the savines and recently at stockholm ignorant persons servant maids and even children excited by enthusiasm are fired to deliver discourses which are often full of spirit and eloquence a maid servant said can you put a piece of wood in the fire without thinking of hell the more wood the greater the flames another prophetess a cook cried out god pronounces curses on the wine of wrath i e brandy and the sinners who drink of it shall be punished according to their sin and torrents of this wine of wrath shall flow in hell to burn them a child of four said may god in heaven call sinners to repentance go to golgotha there are the festal robes 
6. Mania. Lambarus peoples often take the epileptic form, as among the savage Negroes of Judea, among their ponies, and among the Abyssinians in the affections analogous to the tarantula which are called Tigretia. Thus in Greece, instance is recorded of an epidemic madness among the people of Abdera, who had been deeply moved by the recital of a tragedy, and those the aids who appeared at Athens and Rome, worshippers of Bucchus, thirsting for luxury and blood, and seizing with sacred fury, were affected by erotico religious insanity. But this is more especially seen in the Middle Ages, when mental epidemics were continually succeeding one another. The strangest forms of madness were thus communicated, like a true contagion, from whole villages to whole nations, from children to old men, from the credulous to the most resolute sceptics. Demonomania, more or less associated with nymphomania and convulsions, etc., produced sometimes witches, sometimes persons possessed with devils, according as was boasted of and displayed, or suffered with horror by its victims. It showed itself in the most obscene hallucinations, especially in commerce with evil spirits, or the animals which represented them, the antipathy to sacred things, or those believed to be such, e.g. the bones said to be relics, or in an extraordinary development, sometimes of muscular, sometimes of intellectual power, so that they spoke languages of which they had previously only the slightest knowledge, or recalled or connected the most remote and complicated reminiscences. This form of insanity was sometimes associated with erotic ecstasies or partial anesthesia, and often with a tendency to biting, to murder, or to suicide. Sometimes there was a shuddering horror, often of gloomy hallucinations, but always a profound conviction of their truth. When the prophetic enthusiasm became epidemic in the Savanes, women and even children were reached by this contagion and saw divine commands in the sun and in the clouds. Thousands of women persisted in singing psalms and prophesying, though they were hanged wholesale. Whole city, says Villani, seemed to be possessed of the devil. At aix la chapelle in 1374, the spread from epileptics and clerics to the people in general, affecting even to crepid old men and pregnant women, a mania for dancing in the public squares, crying, Here is Saint Johann, so so, frisch and roh. This was accompanied by religious hallucinations, in which they saw heaven opened and within it the assembly of the blessed. The subjects also had an antipathy to anything red, unlike tarantula subjects, who were madly attracted to red. The mania extended to Cologne, where 500 persons were seized, with it, thence to Metz, where there were 1,100 dancers, Strasbourg, and other places. Nor did it cease speedily, for it recurred periodically in subsequent years, and on the day of St. Vitus, probably chosen as a passionate account of the Celtic entomology of his name. Thousands of dancers took places near his relics. In 1623 these pilgrimages still continued. Most curious is that epileptic mania for pilgrimages, developed among children in the Middle Ages, when men's minds were cast down with grief for the loss of the Holy Land in 1212, a shepherd boy of Clos in Vendôme thought himself sent by God who had appeared to him in the shape of unknown man, accepted bread from him, and entrusted him with a letter for the king. All the sons of the neighbouring shepherds flocked to him. Thirty thousand men became his followers. Soon there arose other prophets of eight years old, who preached, worked miracles, and led hosts of delirious children to the new saint at Clos. They made their way to Marseilles, where the sea was to withdraw its waves in order to let them pass over dry shod to Jerusalem. In spite of the opposition of the king and their parents, and the hardships of the journey, they reached the sea, were put on board ship by two unscrupulous merchants, and sold as slaves in the east. The first impulse towards the epidemic form caused by mania was a veneration for individuals affected by it, which rendered them liable to be taken as models. But the principal cause is just that isolation, that ignorance, which is the accompaniment of barbarism. It is above all the advance of civilization the greater contact of a greater number of persons which gives definite form to the sense of individuality sharpening it by means of interest dividends ambition emulation ridicule but above all by the continual variety of sensations and consequent variety of ideas thus it seldom happens that great masses of people are equally predisposed towards and impressed by the same movement in fact their epidemics of mental alienation have shown themselves even in the most recent times it has always been among the most ignorant classes of the population and in districts remote from the great centres of communication. 
always, moreover, in mountainous countries, certainly through atmospheric influences, as well on the account of greater isolation, as in Cornwall, Wales, Norway, Brittany, the barking women of Joselin, in the remotest colonies of America, in the distant valley of Mortezines in France, and the alpine gorge of Versignes in Italy, where Franzolini has so well described it. Thus at Monza Magnetta, where later on we shall find Lazaretti, the chroniclers record that one Audiberti lived in an extraordinary state of filth, and was for this reason venerated as a saint. Not far from this place, Bartolomeo Brandano, a tenant of the Olivetan monks, who lived towards the end of the 16th century, perhaps overcome by the sufferings of his country during the occupation by the Spanish army, was seized by religious monomania and believed himself to be John the Baptist. He assumed the dress of the saint, and covered with a hair shirt reaching to his knees, with bare feet, a crucifix in his hand, and a skull under his arm. He travelled through the district of Siena, preaching, prophesying, working miracles, and finding proselytes. He then went to Rome, and on the square of St. Peter's preached against the Pope and the Cardinals. But Clement seven, instead of having him hanged, sent him to the Torre di Nona prison, where it was usual at the time to seclude the insane, when they were not burnt at the stake for being possessed of demons. When he came out of prison, he returned to Siena, and several times insulted Don Diego Mendoza, commander of the Spanish army. But Don Diego, unable to tell whether he was a saint, a prophet, or a madman, had him seized and taken to the prison of Telamon, so that governor might decide the question. The Sienese governor would have nothing to do with him, and said, If he is a saint, saints are not sent to the galleys. If he is a prophet, prophets are not punished. And if he is mad, madmen are exempt from the laws. Brandano was thus liberated in a short time, and, after having preached a sermon to the prisoners, he went away, and returned to his prophecies and his exorcisms. Even recently, in the remote village of Busca, at Piedmont, two saints have risen, one of whom had been a convict for twenty years, and the other already had a congregation of over three hundred members. Not far from there, in the alpine village of Montenero, there appeared in 1887 the epidemic delirium of the second coming of Christ, in expectation of which event more than three thousand inhabitants assembled in spite of the snow. At the same time, a vagabond messiah was arrested at Vesula in the Abruzzi. The retrograde metamorphosis of the intellectual faculties passed through slighter gradations in the barbarian than in the civilized man. The former is much less able to distinguish illusions from realities, hallucinations from desires, and the possible from the supernatural, and also to keep his imagination in check. The Norwegian preaching epidemic of 1842 was termed Mad Krankheit, the maid servant's disease, because it attacked servants, hysteric women in general, and children of the lower classes. The Red Ruth epidemic was diffused entirely among persons whose intellect is at the very lowest class, whereas when, in recent years, the craze of magnetism and the still more foolish one of table wrapping appeared, they never presented any other characteristic than that of widely diffused errors and mental alienation in this direction could only boast of isolated victims. It is not long since the Haitian Negroes looked on certain trees which had been hung with clothes as images of saints, and the Nubians see their gods in the grotesque forms of splintered rocks. The slightest cause predisposes the barbarian to terror, and from terror to superstition is but a short step. This last which disappears before the logic of the sarcasm of civilized people is the most important factor in the development of insanity. Adeller, speaking of the Stockholm epidemic of 1842, mentions it as a historical fact that, in the places where the disease first appeared, people's minds had for a long time past been disturbed and excited by sermons and devotional exercises, and that, in these places, the number of those affected has perceptibly increased. This is the explanation of ancient and modern prophets, and their sudden power which left traces on the history of nations. Many unhappy persons affected by ambitious mania or theomania looked upon as prophets, and the delusions taken for revelations, and this is the origin of a number of sects which have intensified the struggle between religion and liberty, both in the Middle Ages and in modern times. Picard, for example, imagined himself to be a son of God, sent to earth as a new Adam to re-establish the natural laws which consisted, according to him, in going naked 
and in the community of women. He met with believers and imitators, and founded the sect of the Adamites, who were exterminated by the Hussites in 1347, but were afterwards revived under the name of Tolupins. In the same way, the Anabaptists at Munster, at Appenzell, and in Poland, believed that they saw luminous forms of angels and dragons fighting in the sky, that they received orders to kill their brothers or their best beloved children, homicidal mania, or to abstain from food for months together, and that they could paralyze whole armies by their breath or by a look. Later on, those sects of Calvinists and Jansenists, which caused the shedding of so much blood, had, as Camille had demonstrated, an analogous origin. This is also the origin of the belief in wizards and demoniacs. If we glance over lists of literary madmen and illuminati given by Delepayer, Philomenst, and Edelang, the number of followers found by many of them makes us laugh and sigh in the same breath for the extent of human folly. Let us mention, for example, Kleinov, who in the middle of the 18th century claimed to represent the King of Zion, whose sons his followers asserted themselves to be, and Joachim of Calabria, who declared that the Christian era was to end in 1200, when a new messiah was to appear with a new gospel. Swedenborg, who believed that he had spoken with the spirits of the various planets for whole days and even for months together, who had seen the inhabitants of Jupiter walking partially on their hands and partially on their feet, those of Mars speaking with their eyes, and those of the moon with their stomachs, incredible as it may seem, as believers and followers even up to the present time. Irving, in 1830, asserted that he had received by divine inspiration the gift of unknown tongues, and founded the sect of the Irvingites. John Humphreys Noyes of the United States believed himself to have the gift of prophecy, and founded the sect of perfectionists established at Onidia who considered marriage and property as theft, did not recognize human laws and believed every action, even the commonest, to be inspired by God. At the beginning of the century, that providence of monarchy, Julie de Crudener, possessed great influence. She was hysterical, and so far erotic as to throw herself on her knees in public before a tenor. Afterwards, impelled by disappointment in love towards the ancient faith, she believed herself chosen to redeem humanity, and found in this belief the vigor of a burning eloquence. She went to Baal and turned the city upside down by preaching the speedy coming of the Messiah. Twenty thousand pilgrims responded to her call. The Senate became alarmed and banished her. She hastened to Baden, where four thousand people waiting on the square to kiss her hands and her dress. A woman offered her ten thousand florins to build a new church. She distributed them to the poor, whose reign was at hand. She was exiled from Baden and returned to Switzerland, followed by crowds. Though persecuted by a police, she passed from town to town, followed by acclamations and blessings. She said that her works were dictated to her by angels. Napoleon, who had treated her with content, became for her the dark angel. Alexander of Russia, the angel of light. Her influence became the inspiration of the latter, so much so that the idea of the Holy Alliance seemed to be due to her alone. Loyola, when wounded, turned his thoughts to religious subjects, and terrified by the Lutheran revolt, planned and founded the great company. He believed that he received the personal assistance of the Virgin Mary in his projects, and heard heavenly voices encouraging him to persevere in them. An analogous phenomena may be observed in the lives of George Fox and the early Quakers. End of section 13。section 14 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4. Political and Religious Lunatics and Metoids. Part 2. Francis of Assisi. The son of a religious woman. Francis of Assisi was forced to devote himself to business after receiving only the elements of education from the priests of St. Giorgio. Being rich and able to spend money as he pleased, he became the life and soul of the joyous companies of young men, whose custom it was to go about the city by day and night, singing and diverting themselves. He seemed to be the son of a great prince, rather than of a merchant. The citizens of Assisi called him the Flower of Youth, and his companions deferred to him as to their leader. He excelled in singing. His biographers praised his sweet and powerful voice, and was also dexterous in feats of arms. When taken prisoner in a skirmish between the burghers of Perugia and those of Assisi, 
he encouraged his companions in prison and exhorted them to cheerfulness both by word and example his naturally refined and noble disposition was shown both in his persons and manners and in a liberality which delighted in giving to the poor it is said that in his twenty-fourth year a severe illness confined him for a long time to his bed at the beginning of his convalescence he left the house leaning on a stick and stood still to gaze at the beautiful country which surrounded a city but could find no pleasure in it as he had once done from that day forward he was sad and thoughtful he often left his companions and retired to a cave where he spent hours in meditation in order to relieve his sufferings he had recourse to prayer and prayed so fervently that one day he thought he saw before him christ nailed to the cross and felt the passion of christ impressed even upon his bowels upon the very marrow of his bones so that he could not keep his thoughts fixed upon it without being overflowed with grief he was then seen wandering about the fields with his face bathed in tears and when asked whether he felt ill he replied i am weeping for the passion of my lord jesus his friend said to him think of choosing a wife and he replied yes i am thinking of a lady of the noblest the richest the most beautiful that was ever seen who was the lady of his thoughts he revealed on the day when laying aside the dress of his rank he threw a beggar's mantle over his shoulders to the unbound anger of his father who in vain tried to imprison him and to the great scandal of every one by many we read of the fioretti he was thought a fool and as a madman he was mocked and driven away with stones by his relations and by strangers and he suffered patiently all mockery and harsh treatment as though he had been deaf and dumb francis of assisi however was original and great not through those qualities which he had in common with the vulgar herd of ascetics abstinences mortifications prayers ecstasies visions but on account of something which was without his knowing it the very negation of asceticism the affirmation and the triumph of the gentlest and sweetest feelings of humanity the ascent abhorred condemned and fled from nature life all human affections in order to steep himself in solitary contemplation francis by example and precept preached the love of nature concord mutual affections between human beings and work the ascetic called everything beautiful in the world the work of satan francis brought about a true revolution by calling it the work of god praising and thanking god for it it was a new kind of loving and passionate pantheism which inspired him with the soul of the sun in which all creatures animate and inanimate are joined in fraternal embrace in which the beautiful and radiant sun the bright and precious moon and stars the wind the clouds the clear sky water useful humble precious and chaste fire shining joyous hardy and strong mother earth who sustains and feeds us together with man who up to that time had been taught to despise everything that might distract him from the selfish thought of his fate in the next world all these are called upon to sing the glory of the lord who is good to bless him for having made the universe so rich for right and beautiful so worthy to be loved if we think of this bold and far-reaching change we shall no longer smile in reading the psalm remembering too that it was the first attempt made by the italian people to express their religious feelings in the vulgar tongue for such a song to burst from the impassioned heart of francis the germs of universal love which he cherished there must already have come to perfect growth he must have freed himself entirely from the ancient terror which in the common superstitious belief peopled woods mountains air and water with hidden enemies as also in order to bring men back to mutual love in an age when those whom one wall and one ditch confined gnawed one another he had through his natural tendency to extremes to include not only brother sire and sister moon but even brother wolf having composed the song francis was so well pleased with it that he had adapted it to a musical melody to order to his disciples and thought of choosing among his followers some who should go about the world singing praises of god and asking as their only recompense that the listeners should repent should call themselves just god's jesters jaculatores domini thus he gave the first and most vigorous impulse to religious poetry in the vulgar tongue luther luther attributed his physical pains and his dreams to the arts of the devil though all those of which he has left us a description are clearly due to nervous phenomena he often suffered e g from an anguish which nothing could lighten caused according to him by the anger of an offended god 
At twenty-seven he began to be seized with attacks of giddiness, accompanied by headaches and noises in the ears, which returned to the ages of thirty-two, thirty-eight, forty, and fifty-two, especially when he was on a journey. At thirty-eight, moreover, he had a real hallucination, perhaps favoured by excessive solitude. When, in 1521, he writes, I was in my Patmos, in a room which was entered by no one except two pages who brought me my food. I heard one evening, after I was in bed, nuts moving inside a sack, and flying off themselves against the ceiling and all round my bed. Scarcely had I gone to sleep when I heard a tremendous noise, as if many berries were being thrown over. I rose and cried, Who art thou? Commended myself to Christ, etc. At the church at Wittenberg, he had just begun explaining the epistle to the Romans, and had reached the words, And just shall live by faith, when he felt these ideas penetrate his mind, and heard that sentence repeated aloud several times in his ear. In 1507, he heard the same words when on his journey to Rome, and again in a voice of thunder, as he was dragging himself up the steps of the Scala Santa. Not seldom he confesses, as it happened to me to awake about midnight, and dispute with Satan concerning the Mass, and he details the many arguments adduced by the devil. Savannah For the illustration in every respect, most apostates, if it did not seem almost a national blasphemy to say so, is that offered us by Savonarola. Under the influence of a vision, he believed himself, even from his youth, sent by Christ to redeem the country from its corruption. One day, while speaking to a nun, it seemed to him that heaven suddenly opened, and he saw in a vision the calamities of the church, and heard a voice commanding him to announce them to the people. The visions of the Apocalypse and of the Old Testament prophets passed in review before him. In 1491, he wished to leave off treating of politics in his sermons. I watched all Saturday, and the whole night, but at daybreak, while I was praying, I heard a voice say, Fool, dost thou not see that God will have thee go on in the same way? In 1492, while preaching during Advent, he had a vision of a sword on which was written, Gladius Domini Super Teram. Suddenly the sword turned towards the earth. The air was darkened. There was a rain of swords, arrows, and fire and the earth became a prey to famine and pestilence. From this moment he began to predict the pestilence which in fact afterwards came to pass. In another vision, becoming ambassador of Christ, he makes a long journey to paradise, and there holds discourse with many saints and with the Virgin, whose throne he describes, not forgetting the number of the precious stones with which it is adorned. We shall see how a similar scene were described by Lazaretti. Savannah Rola, was continually meditating on his dreams, and tried to distinguish which among his visions were produced by angels, which were the work of demons. Scarcely ever he is touched by a misgiving that he may possibly be in error. In one of his dialogues he declares that to feign one's self a prophet in order to persuade others would be like making God himself an impostor. Might not be, continues the objector, that you were deceiving yourself. No, is the reply. I worship God. I seek to follow his footsteps. It cannot be that God should deceive me. Yet with contradiction peculiar to unhinged minds, he had written a short time before, I am not a prophet, no, the son of a prophet is your sins and make me a prophet before. Moreover, in one page he says that his prophetic illumination is independence of grace, whereas a few pages back he had declared that the two were one and the same thing. Valari justly remarks that this is the singularity of his character, that man who had given to Florence the best form of republic, who dominated an entire people, who filled the world with his eloquence and had been the greatest of philosophers, should make it his boast that he had heard voices in the air, saw the sword of the Lord. But as the same author well concludes, the very puerility of his visions proved that he was the victim of hallucinations, and a still stronger proof of their uselessness, even hurtfulness, as far as he himself was concerned. What need was there? He wished to cheat the masses, to write treaties on his visions, to speak of them to his mother, to write reflections of them on the margins of his Bible, those things which his admirers would have been most eager to hide, those which the simplest intelligence would never have allowed to get into print. These very productions he continued to publish and republish. The truth is that, as he often confessed, he felt an inward fire burning in his bones and forced him to speak and as he was himself swept away by the force of that ecstatic delirium, so he succeeded in carrying with him his audience, who were moved by his words in a way we find hard to understand when we compare the impression produced with the text of the sermons themselves. This helps us to understand how, exactly in the same manner as Lazaretti, 
and propagated his divine madness among the people not only epidemically by the contagion of ideas but producing actual insanity in persons who being nearly or quite without education preached and wrote extempore in consequence of their madness thus domenico cecchi was the author of the work entitled sacred reform which contained the very just suggestions of relieving the great council from minor business taxing church property imposing a single tax and creating a militia also that of fixing the amount of girls dowries in his preface he writes i set myself with my fancy to make such a work and i can make no other and by day and night methinks i have made such efforts that i might call them miraculous but as come to pass i myself stand amazed threat a certain giovanni a florentine tailor seized with morbid enthusiasm wrote terzine in which he extolled the future glories of france and produced verses worthy of lazaretti the prophecies like the following yet it must needs that the puissant shall descend with irons on his feet into the sewer since he has been the cause of so much woe if i were asked whether in our asylums we often meet with types analogous to these i shall reply that there is perhaps not an asylum in italy which has not received one of these strange lunatics Cola de Renzi. in thirteen thirty rome was sinking to chaos historians have left us an appalling picture of the disorders of the time the absence of any regular government and lawless tyranny of the robber barons the general conditions of the age were favourable to popular movements king robert the protector of the barons was dead and Toti, thirteen thirty seven genoa under adorno in thirteen sixty seven and florence thirteen sixty three had initiated a democratic regime which ushered in the terrible chiompi revolution of thirteen seventy eight a premature thriller revolt ran through europe and was felt even in feudal monarchical france where the movement was organized for a short time at paris under marcel under these circumstances cola a young man born in the tiber district in thirteen thirteen the son of an innkeeper and a washerwoman or water seller who thought at first little better than a field labourer had studied as a notary and acquired a considerable knowledge of the history and antiquities of his country saw his brother murdered by the wretches who formed the government or rather the misgovernment of rome then he who as the anonymous historian tells us always had a fantastic smile on his lips and already when meditating on ancient books and the ruins of rome he often wept exclaiming where are the good romans of the old time where is their justice was seized as he afterwards acknowledged by an irresistible impulse to put into action the ideas which he had acquired from books in his capacity of notary he devoted himself to the protection of miners and widows and assumed the curious title of their consul just as there were in his time consuls of the carboners cloth workers and other guilds in thirteen forty three in one of the numerous small revolutions of the period the people had attempted to overthrow the senate creating the government of the thirteen under the papal authority on that occasion Coelho was sent as spokesman of the people to Avignon, where he vividly depicted the evils prevalent in Rome, and by his bold and powerful eloquence, amazed and won over the cool-headed prelates, from whom he attained the appointment of notary to the urban chamber in 1344. On his return to Rome, he continued to exercise his office with exaggerated zeal, and got himself called consul, no longer of the windows, but of Rome. He excelled others in courtesy, was also inflexible in the administration of justice and never failed to involve himself in long harangues against those whom he called the dogs of the capital one day in a moment of exaggerated fanaticism he cried to the barons in full assembly ye are evil citizens he who suck the blood of the people and turning to the officials and governors he warned them that it was their place to provide for the good of the state the result of this was a tremendous buffet dealt him by a chamber lane of the house of Colonna he then took matters more calmly and began to depict the former glories and present miseries of rome by means of paintings in which the homicides adulterers and other criminals were represented by apes and cats the corrupt judges and notaries by foxes and the senators and nobles by wolves and bears on another day he exhibited the famous table of Vespasian and invited the public including the nobles to a dramatic explanation of it he appeared arrayed in a german cloak with a white hood and a hat also wide and surrounded by many crowns one of which was divided in the midst by a small silver sword the interpretation of these grotesque symbols which already indicate his madness the continual use of such being as already stated characteristic of monomaniacs till they end by sacrificing to their passion for symbols the very evidence of the things which they wish to represent is unknown 
thus applying somewhat after his own fashion the decree of the senate which granted to vespasian the right of making laws at his pleasure of increasing or diminishing the gardens of rome and of italy if he had been a scholar he would have said the area of the roman district and of making and unmaking kings he called on them to consider into what a state they had fallen remember that the jubilee is approaching and that you have made no provision of food or other necessities put an end to your quarrels etc but along with these he delivered other discourses which were to say the least eccentric e g i know that men wish to find a crime in my speeches and that out of envy but thanks to heaven three things consume my enemies luxury envy and fire these two last words were greatly applauded i do not understand them however especially the last i believe that they were applauded precisely because the audience did not understand them as happens to many street orators with whom resonant and meaningless words supply the place of ideas and are even greeted with greater enthusiasm the fact is that among the upper classes he passed for one of those persons of unsound mind who were then in great request for the amusement of society the nobles especially of colonna disputed the pleasure of his company with each other and would tell them the glories of his future government and when i am king or emperor i will make war on all of you i will have such an one hanged and such another beheaded he spared none of them and mentioned them by name one by one to their faces and all the time both nobles and commons he continued to speak of the good state and of how he was going to restore it here i insert a parenthesis it has been said by petrarch in particular that he feigned madness and was a second brutus but when we see his love for pomp luxury strange symbols and garments gradually increasing as he advanced in his political career and after his rise to power we no longer have any doubt as to the reality of his madness he continued to put forth new symbolic pictures among others one with this inscription the day of justice is coming await this moment be it noted that this picture represented a dove bringing a crown of myrtle to a little bird the dove stood for the holy spirit as we shall see one of the favourite objects of his delirium and the bird was himself who was the crown rome of glory at last on the first day of lent thirteen forty seven he affixed to the door of san giorgio another placard before long the good state of rome shall be restored not being feared by the nobles who thought him mad he was able to conspire secretly or rather to keep up the ferment of public opinion by taking apart gradually one by one the men who seemed to him best adapted for the purpose and assigning them their posts on mount aventine towards the end of april on a day when the governor was to be absent in this assembly the only one which up to that time had been held in secret the mode of bringing about the good state was deliberated on here we show the eloquence of a man who speaks from conviction and of things which are too true not to produce a deep impression he described the discord of the great the debasement of the poor the iron men roaming about in quest of plunder wives dragged from their marriage beds pilgrims murdered at the gates priests drowned in sensual orgies no strength or wisdom among those who held the reins of power from the nobles there was everything to fear and nothing to hope where were they in the midst of all these disorders they were leaving rome to enjoy a holiday on their estates while everything was going to wreck and ruin in the city as the members of the popular party were hesitating for want of funds he gave them a hint that these might be obtained from the revenues of the apostolic chamber reckoning ten thousand florins for the tax on salt alone one hundred thousand for the hearth tax figures which sismondi chapter thirty eight declares to be absolutely erroneous he also gave them to understand that he was acting in accordance with the wishes of the pope which was false and that he was able with the consent of the letter to seize upon the revenues of the holy see on may eighteen thirteen forty seven in colonna's absence he had proclamation made through the streets by sound of trumpet that all citizens were to assemble in the night of the day following in the church of st angelo to take measures for the establishment of the good state on the nineteenth rienzi was present at the meeting in armour guided by a hundred armed men and accompanied by the papal vicar and by three standards covered with the most extraordinary symbols one of them representing liberty one justice and one peace among the measures which he caused to be adopted by this improvised assembly were some which would be well suited to our own times the following for instance all lawsuits were to be terminated within fifteen days 
the apostolic chamber was to provide for the support of widows and orphans every district of rome was to have a public granary if a roman were killed in the service of his country his heir is to receive a hundred lira if he were a foot soldier and a hundred florins if a horseman the garrison of the cities and fortresses to be formed of men chosen from among the roman people every accuser who could not make good his accusation to be subject to the penalty which his victim would have incurred the houses of the condemned not to be destroyed as was then the case in all communities but to become the property of the municipality Cola received from this popular assembly entire lordship over the city he associated the papal vicar with himself as a harmless assistant and taught himself tribune and performed an actual miracle in restoring peace where there had been chaos he saw the proud barons even the rebellious and powerful prefect of vico prostrate at his feet he executed severe justice upon the most powerful nobles as well as the populace members of the orsini Savilli, and gaetani families were hanged by him for violation of the laws and was more even priests such as the monk of st anastasius who was accused of several murders by means of the so-called tribunal of peace he reconciled with each other one thousand eight hundred citizens who had previously been mortal enemies he abolished more accurately speaking tried to abolish the servile use of the title don which is still rampant among us in the south he prohibited dicing concubinage and fraud in the sale of provisions which last was the measure which conduced most to his popularity finally he created a true citizen militia a real national guard he caused the estusians of the nobles to be erased from all palaces equipages and banners saying that there was to be in rome no other lordship than the pope's and his own he re-established a tax on every hearth in all the towns and villages of the roman district and was obeyed even by the tuscan communities who might have claimed exemption the collectors were not sufficient for the work all the governors except two submitted and he finally appointed a kind of justice of the peace to decide even criminal cases he did even more he was the first to conceive what even dante had not thought of and at least neither goeuf nor Gobelin. under the headship of the roman municipality in which like marcel of paris he attempted to assemble a true national parliament he was the first man in italy to think of this and was only understood by thirty-five communes at avignon finally he was able to archive what i consider his greatest enterprise to gain himself pardoned after a course of speech and action so hostile to the papal court by those who never pardon the clergy of their ferocious and implacable age and not only pardoned but sent back through a short period in which an inferior capacity to a position fought with the greatest dangers to that order but all these miracles alas lasted for only a few days only the man who in his political ideas surpassed not only his contemporaries but many modern thinkers and preceded mazzini and cavour to the idea of unity was in fact a monomaniac as is recorded by the historians re and papincourt if he was great in conception he was uncertain and incapable of practical matters this is fully shown e g when though he had his greatest enemy the prefect of Rico, in his hands he let him go keeping his son as a hostage and when he failed to profit by his unexpected victory over the barons always incapable of taking any resolution which is not merely theoretical he believed that everything he did was done by the grace of the holy spirit under his auspices we have seen that he began his enterprise he was still further confirmed in his delusion by a heresy which had then recently sprung up according to which the holy spirit was to regenerate the world and especially by the fact very insignificant in itself that a dove alighted near him while he was showing the people one of his allegorical pictures to this dove he attributed his successful beginning as he ascribed to his prophetic inspiration the victory over the coluna and that over the prefect in the most important affairs he believed that he heard in himself through the medium of a dream or other sign the voice of god with whom he took counsel and to whom he referred everything sustained by the prestige of this inspiration he furthermore enacted religious laws e g one compelling profession once a year and a pain of confiscation to the extent of one-third of a man's property he did not fail to exhibit the usual contradictions peculiar to the insane very religious himself he had no hesitation in comparing himself to christ only on account of the coincidence implied in his having gained a victory at the age of thirty three after his debate he again compared himself to him in a play upon numbers such as is common among the insane because he was for thirty-five months an exile in the magella 
in a wild and lonely hermitage, surrounded by several persons subject to hallucinations, followers of the Holy Spirit, who prophesied that he would once more be victorious, and even rule over the whole world. The megalomaniac delirium which usually prevailed in his case explains the greater part of these contradictions. He believed that, in his own person, were centred all the hopes of the Messiah of Italy, who was to restore the Roman Empire, nay, even redeem the world. In a moment when he must have thought himself near death, in the prison of Prague, he thought himself the victim of diabolical imaginations, or believed that he was obeying the will of heaven. Thus he wrote, I kiss the key of the prison, as if it were the gift of God. One day he arose from the throne, and advancing towards, with faithful followers, said in a loud voice, We command Pope Clement to present himself before our tribunal, and to live at Rome, and we give the same command to the College of Cardinals. We decide to appear before us the two claimants, Charles of Bohemia and Ludwig of Bavaria, who take upon themselves the title emperors. We command all the electors of Germany to inform us on what pretext they have usurped the inalienable right to the Roman people, the ancient and legitimate sovereigns of the empire. Then he drew his sword, waved it three times towards the three divisions of the known world, and said three times, in a transport of ecstasy, this too belongs to me. All this because he had bathed in the Porphyry basin of Constantine, to the great scandal of his followers, and believed that he had thus succeeded to the power of that emperor. While he was going on this course, the papal legate, by whose concurrence alone all these eccentricities could, at a certain point, be justified, protested with all the force his slight degree of energy would allow. It would be pretty much as if the Council of San Marino were to take it into his head, on the strength of majority of votes, or because he had worn a hat belonging to Napoleon I, that he could summon before his tribunal the emperors of Austria, Germany and Russia, with a few dukes into the bargain, and this would appear ridiculous in our own times, when in theory at least, right is stand above might. What must it have seemed in that age? Nor was this a mere momentary aberration. We still possess the diplomatic communication, dated August 12th, destined for the emperors. After that mad theatrical ceremony, I extract some passages. In virtue of the same authority, and of the favour of God, the Holy Spirit, and the Roman people, we say, protest, and declare that the Roman Empire, the election, jurisdiction, and monarchy of the sacred empire, belong, by full right, to the city of Rome, and to all Italy, for many good reasons, which we shall mention at the proper place and time. After having summoned the dukes, kings, etc., to appear between this day and that, or the Pentecost next following, before us in St. John Lateran, with their titles and claims, failing which, on the expiry of their term, they will be proceeded against according to the forms of law and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Moreover, he adds, as though he had not yet expressed himself clearly enough, besides what has been heretofore said, in general and in particular, we cite in person the illustrious princes Louis, Duke of Bavaria, and Charles, Duke of Bohemia, calling themselves emperors, or elected to the empire, and besides these, the Duke of Saxony, the Marquis of Brandenburg, etc., that they may appear in the said place before us in person, and before other magistrates, failing which we shall proceed against them as contumacious, etc. This was too much. The mutual animosity of the Colonna and the Orsini was momentarily suspended. They united their forces to combat him openly and conspire against him in secret. An assassin sent by them to attempt the tribune's life was arrested when put to the torture, accused the nobles. From that instant, Rienzi incurred the fate of a tyrant, and adopted tyrant's suspicions and rules of conduct. Shortly afterwards, under various pretexts, he invited to the capital his principal enemies, among whom were many of the Orsini and three of the Colonna. They arrived, believing themselves, called to a council banquet and Rienzi, after inviting them to take their place at table, had them arrested. Innocent and guilty had to undergo this terror alike. After the people had been summoned to the spot by the sound of the great bell, they were accused of a conspiracy to assassinate Rienzi, and not a single voice or hand was raised to defend the heads of the nobility. They passed the night in separate rooms, and Stefano Colonna, battering at his prison door, several times entreated that he might be freed by a swift death from so humiliating a position. The arrival of a confessor and the sound of the funeral bell showed them what was awaiting them. The great hall of the capital, where the trial was to take place, was hung with white and red, as was usual when a death sentence was about to be pronounced. All seemed ready for their condemnation, when the tribune, touched by fear or pity, 
after wrong speech to the people in their defence caused them to be acquitted and even granted them some offices such as the prefecture of arms which could not fail to be formidable weapons against him it was not the sort of thing which was done in those days and even petra thought he had been too lenient while the lower classes expressed their sense of his folly in a coarse and more energetic fashion such was his madness says the anonymous historian that he allowed his enemies to entrench themselves afresh and then sent a messenger to summon them to his presence the messenger was wounded whereupon he summoned them a second time then had two of them painted hanged head downward they in their turn took the town of nepi from him for which he could devise no other retribution than the drowning of two dogs supposed to represent them after the bloodless and useless marches he returned to rome and having put on the dalmatica of the emperors had himself crowned for the third time worse still he at the same time expelled the papal legate bertrando thus throwing away his last anchor of safety at the moment when he needed it most besides the eccentricity of his consecration as knight of the holy spirit preceded by the bath in the vase of constantine which though it can readily be explained by the ideas of the period did him serious injury in the estimation of the majority and especially the religious as being an act of profanation he was guilty of the egregious political folly of declaring that after that ceremony the roman people had returned to the full possession and jurisdiction of the world that rome was the head of the world and the monarch of the empire and the election of the emperors were privileges of the city of the roman people and of italy this is clearly a declaration of war against both pope and emperor later on on august fifteenth with his usual monomanic tendency to symbolism he crowned himself with six wreaths of different plants either because he loved religion myrtle because he honoured learning partly because of its resistance to poison as the emperor was supposed to resist the malevolence of his enemies to these he added no discoverable reason the metro of the trojan king and a silver crown all this proves says gregorovius that it was his intention to get himself crowned emperor and as it was the custom of the roman emperors to promulgate edicts after their coronation so he immediately after this ceremony by political decrees confirmed to the whole of italy the right of roman citizenship alberto argentaro as that he threatened pope clement with deposition if he did not return to rome within the year and that he would have elected another pope villani says that he wished to reform the whole of italy in the ancient manner and subject it to the dominion of rome to understand how truly insane was this project it must be remembered that his sacred militia that which he believed most faithful numbered no more than one thousand six hundred men and the whole army counting both horse and foot did not on an outside calculation exceed two thousand after defeating the nobles without any merit on his part he who had formerly been so generous forbade the widows to weep for the dead and was guilty of words and actions which even in the ferocious age struck his sacred knights as he called them as so barbarous and foolish that they refused to bear arms for him any longer from this moment date on one hand his undoubted insanity on the other the contempt of all honourable men vigorously expressed by petrarch himself in a well-known letter it can now be understood why he was even from the time of his first exploits so fond of pompous titles after calling himself consul of the windows and consul of rome he adopted the title of tribune which afterwards became clement and severe tribune the contradiction being nothing to him so long as he could suggest the name of servius boethius whose arms he had also adopted and not long after this referring with that kind of play upon words so dear to the insane and to idiots to his nomination in august august tribune we can also comprehend that stripped of all his power an exile and a prisoner he should have turned to the prosaic emperor charles IV, telling him his dreams as we shall see with complete confidence in their reality at rome after his first fall which was perhaps one cause of the indulgence with which he was treated by the pope there had been a new outburst of disorder which a tribune who has remained almost unknown one baron Celli, in vain endeavoured to stem nor did renzi himself meet with any better success on his return shorn of his ancient prestige and without that youthful audacity which united to a maniacal erethism has increased the strength of the poor scholar a hundredfold and he was overthrown by the populace themselves for men whether mad men of genius or complete geniuses have no power against the natural force of things marcel had no success at paris though he had far greater force at his disposal and was allied with the chacorie of the country districts 
but Rienzi could not even succeed in realizing the prodigies of insane genius, since he had by this time fallen to true dementia. It appears that in the early stages of his government he was a sober and temperate man, so much so that he had to make an effort to find time to eat. From this he passed to the opposite extreme of continuous orgies and actual dipsomania, which excused by alleging the effects of a poison which he believed to have been administered to him in prison. I believe, on the contrary, that this phenomenon was occasioned by the progress of his malady, since we see that it began in the early months of his first tribunate, and since slow poisons produce emaciation, not obesity, in their victims. At every hour he was eating dainties and drinking. He observed neither time nor order. He mixed Greek with Flavian wine. He drank new wine at any hour. He used to drink too much. Moreover, he had now become enormously stout. He had a face like a friar, round and jovial as that of a bonze, a ruddy complexion and a long beard. His eyes were white, and suddenly he would turn red as blood and his eyes would become inflamed. In short, as is usually the case with persons inclined to dementia, his body became enormous and his eyes were often bloodshot while his face acquired an entirely brutal cast of expression. His mind was much less active, and his temper fundamentally changed, while the fickleness, restlessness, and oddity, which had served to excite great admiration for him in the mind of the populace, now had so degenerated as to redound to his injury. Those who saw most of him said that he changed his mind, as well as his expression of face, from one minute to the next, and was never constant to the same thought of a quarter of an hour altogether. Thus he began the siege of Palestrina, and then abandoned it. He would appoint a skilful commander, and then cashier him. In later times, when he was forced to impose taxes on wine and salt, even for the poor, he restrained his luxurious tendencies, and became apparently temperate. But his other evil propensities did not change. To the intermittent generosity of which he had given proofs in his early period succeeded a cold selfishness, which excited horror even in that cruel age, where, for instance, he had Fra Monreal beheaded for not repaying a sum of money which reigns he had lent him. His friend, Padolfono Padolfini, respected in all Rome as a model of an honourable man, was beheaded by him, without a shadow of a reason, merely for envy of his reputation. Thus he sacrificed, or despoiled of their property, the best men in the country, and passed from the extreme of timidity to that of ferocity. He was seen to laugh and weep almost at the same time, in both cases without sufficient cause. His paroxysms of joy were followed by sighs and tears, but it is chiefly in his letters that the whole of his genius and that of his madness is revealed. The letters of Cola di Renzi were sought for and collected with singular curiosity, as though Petrarch, several times writes to him, they had fallen from the antipodes, or the sphere of the moon, for collections of his letters are extant, at Mantua, at Turin, 22 closely written pages, at Paris, and at Florence, the last same band autographs. They have been published and republished by Gay, Desaid, Hobhouse, Oximior, Peluzel, and Papincourt, and would by themselves be sufficient material on which to base a diagnosis. In fact, there is not one of them which does not bear the impress, either of a morbid vanity or of those trivial repetitions and plays upon words especially characteristic of the insane. The first point to note is their great abundance, in an age when very little was written. When his residence in the capital was sacked, after his first flight, what most surprised those who entered his private office was the mass of letters which had been drafted and never sent. It was well known that the numerous staff of clerks employed by him could not keep pace with the amount of matter he dictated, and that he was continually sending couriers not only to friendly republics, but to indifferent or hostile potentiates, like the King of France, who sent a jesting reply by an archer, a functionary somewhat analogous to a modern policeman. Thus, too, the lords of Ferrara, Mantua, and Padua returned him his letters. Add to this their style, their exaggerated length, the addition of postscripts longer than the letter itself, and their singular signature, richer in laudatory titles, than was ever used except by Oriental princes. These letters have, indeed, a flavour of their own, a vivacity breaking loose from the restraints of the classical writers who served as his, his models, an exuberant self-confidence which, at first sight, obliged the reader to put faith in the falsehoods with which they swarmed. Nay, it seems that, as happens with some lunatics and some incorrigible liars, he ended by himself believing in his own functions. Leaving aside many strange blunders, surprising in a Latin scholar, and the prolixity already mentioned, without dwelling on the very undiplomatic want of delicacy 
present to a morbid extent and all the more surprising in a statesman of that age when reserve was more general than at present one fact particularly strikes me an inveterate habit of punning a symptom of extreme frivolity which was certainly not a characteristic of medieval diplomacy what man in his senses would even in the depths of the dark ages have written as he did to pope clement in the letter dated august fifth thirteen forty seven the grace of the holy spirit having freed the republics under my rule and my humble person having been at the beginning of august promoted to the militia there is attributed to me as is the signature the name of the title of august give as above on the fifth of august humble creature candidate of the holy spirit Niccolo the severe and clement liberator of the city zealous for italy lover of the world who kisses the feet of the blessed note that after all this signature the letter goes on for three pages more on much more serious topics which he had postponed the pun on august in this respect a clear proof of his insanity is to be found in the letter which he wrote in the elation of his victory over the barons not to dwell on the strange familiarity with the deity which he shows when he writes that god formed to war those fingers which had been trained to the use of the pen whereas a matter of fact he had no knowledge whatever of the art of war it is well to note that among his gravest charges against the colonna was that of their having sacked a church where he had deposited his golden crown still more strange is the following claim to prophecy addressed to the clergy who is dealing in such matters are likely to be most sceptical concerning them we should not forget to tell you that two days before these occurrences we had a vision of pope boniface who foretold our triumph over those tyrants we made a report thereof in full season and the presence of the assembled romans and going into st peter's to the altar of st boniface we present to him a chalice and a veil this vision at last thanks to heaven was fulfilled thanks to the help of the blessed martin his tribune here he forgets that two pages previously in the same letter he had attributed his victories to st lawrence and st stephen as his traitors he continues had plundered the pilgrims on the day of his festival that saint took vengeance on them by the hand of a tribune three days afterwards this is to say on the day of st columba who glorified the dove columba of our flag note the puns in the above he concludes with some of those postscripts which are so frequent in the letters of monomaniacs and are found in nearly all of his given at the capital on the very day of the victory the third of november on which day there persisted six tyrants of the house of colonna and none remained but the unhappy old man stefano colonna who is half dead he is the seventh and this is how heaven was willing to make the number of the slain colonna equal the crowns sick of our coronation and the branches of the fruit-bearing tree which recall the seven gifts of the holy spirit absolute insanity is shown both in the idea and the word in which he makes the deity intervene to extinguish a family of heroes for the sake of a sinister freak of language in order the man who a few pages previously with a hypocrisy soon believed by facts had written consistently with our character we were not willing to employ the severity of the sword however just against those whom we might bring back to grace by right injury to freedom justice and peace both comic and insane is the way in which in another letter to rinaldo orsini september twenty two thirteen forty seven he tries to disguise by a number of useless fictions the enormous error of which he had been guilty in setting at liberty the nobles arrested shortly before we wish that your paternity should know how having judged certain nobles lawfully suspected by the people and by us it pleased god that they should fall into our hands we see on the contrary that he had expressly invited them we caused them to be shut up in the dungeons of the capital but finally our scruples and suspicions having been removed we made use of an innocent artifice sick, to reconcile them not only with ourselves but with god wherefore we procured them the happy opportunity of making a devout confession it was on the fifteenth of september that we sent confessors to each of them in prison and as the latter were ignorant of our good intentions and believed that we were going to be severe they said to the nobles the lord tribune will condemn you to death meanwhile the great bell of the capital tolled without ceasing for the assembly and thus the terrified nobles gave themselves up for lost and in the expectation of death confessed devoutly and with tears i then made a speech in praise of them etc let the reader judge of the condition of the moral sense in a man who could write thus it should be noted besides that diplomatically an excuse of this sort especially in dealing with priests who being in the trade so to speak 
would know its exact value, would not only be useless, but even constitute a serious accusation. Nor is his conclusion less strange. With all their hearts are so united to ours, and to those of the people, that this union must last for the good of our country, because thus they see that we are impartial, and do not wish to be as severe as we might be. But his useless hypocrisies do not end there. The confusion of the patricians probably suggested the order already mentioned that all citizens were to confess and receive the communion at least once a year, under pain of losing a third of their goods. Half of the forfeited property go to the parish church of the defendant, the other to the city, and the notaries were obliged to act as spies for every testator. Now, Rainsy, in a postscript to the above letter, and I repeat that I have frequently observed in modern maniacs this fad of postscripts occurring at the end of letters, gives notice of his new edict, adding, It seems most fitting that, as a second Augustus provides for the temporal profit of the Republic, he should also seek to favour and promote its spiritual welfare. This, if one thinks about it, was a reservation of the special rights and duties of the pontiff, even according to the most modern view of them, as also when he prescribed the clergy's special ceremonies and ecclesiastical processions of his own invention, and enacted decrees against the members of religious orders who should fail to return to Rome. This, in fact, was one of the principal accusations, and a just one, levelled against him at Prague at a Vignon, and one which he only rebutted by false statements. Elsewhere he speaks of being inspired by the Holy Spirit, with a confidence which would be altogether unintelligible except in a man who was perfectly sincere, and therefore under the influence of hallucination. A glance at other letters explains at once that the bath in the vase of Constantine was for him, what the tattooed marks on his forehead were to Lazaretti, one of those symbolic freaks to which the insane attach peculiar significance, in fact a kind of imperial investiture. A long letter Charles IV, written from prison in July 1350, dwelling on a supposed intrigue of his mother with the Emperor Henry VII, bears in subject matter and style the unmistakable impress of insanity. A little later, August 15, 1350, we find him writing to the Emperor another letter full of senseless puns, in which he tells him, with doubly absurd freaks of thought and language, how, in the idea that the mother of Servinius Boethius was descended from the kings of Bohemia, and he called Boethius the younger and himself the severe, and now how he had adopted from them the device of the seven stars, matters which could neither interest the emperor nor be of advantage to himself, but have all the characteristics of insanity. So also, when he wrote that he was persuaded by the prophecies of the Mangilla hermits already mentioned, that his second exaltation should be more than glorious than the first, as the sun long hidden by the clouds appeared more beautiful into the eye of the beholder, perhaps the lord, justly indignant at the wicked and unheard of murder of Rienzi's illustrious grandfather, Henry the Seventh, and the losses in souls and bodies suffered by the world during the interregnum. He raised up Cola for the advantages of Charles, chosen him to re-establish the empire, and ordained that he should be baptized in the Lateran, in the Church of the Baptist, and the Bath of Constantine, that he might be the forerunner of the emperor, as John the Baptist was of Christ. Charles, it is true, has said that the empire could only be restored by a miracle, but was not this miracle that one poor man should be able to succour the falling empire, as St. Francis had succoured the church? Let him awake, and gird on his sword. Let him not count for anything the revelation of the friars, since the whole Old and New Testaments were full of revelations. He could alone become master of Rome, if he did not do so at once. Charles would lose at least 100,000 gold florins from the tax on salt and the other revenues in the city, which had been increased by the approach of the Jubilee. Within a year and a half, the Pope should die, and many cardinals be slain. In fifteen years, there should be put one shepherd and one faith, and the new Pope, the Emperor Charles, the college should be, as it were, a symbol of the Trinity on earth. Charles should reign in the West, the Tribune in the East. For the present, he was content with supporting the Emperor in his journey to Rome. He was willing to open the way for him with the Romans and other peoples of Italy, who would otherwise be adverse to the Empire, so that Charles might come along them peaceably and without bloodshed and his arrival should not be the signal for mourning to the city and the whole nation, as had that of former emperors. So far did he go, that the Archbishop of Prague wrote to him, that he wondered how the tribune, who had done things which at first appeared to come from God, could be so far from exercising the virtue of humility as to consider his own revelation the work of the Holy Spirit, and to call himself the candidate of the latter, words which may well be noted by those 
who see in his madness only the effect of the superstitions of the period the emperor replied with much common sense advising him to cease from ignorant hermits who think themselves to be walking in the spirit of humility without being able even to resist their sins and save their own souls and to speak fantastically of knowing hidden things and governing in the spirit all that is under heaven and telling him that out of love to god and his neighbours he has caused thee to be imprisoned with a so of tars and withal out of love for thine own soul to cure it let already consoles him to lay aside all the vagaries and whatever his origin may have been to remember that we are all god's creatures sons of adam made out of the earth etc a curious lesson democracy given by a king of bohemia to the ex-tribune of an italian republic but all was useless and when after many vicissitudes he once more acquired a shadow of his former power by the aid of money obtained by sheer trickery he announced the fact of florence in a pompous proclamation adding that women men boys priests and lay folk had gone to meet him with palms and olive branches and trumpets and cries of welcome these speeches seem so very extravagant that their genuineness has been doubted by zephyrina re or the encounter the extreme improbability of petrarch's having defended him or the emperor regarded him with favour for a single moment had he really entertained ideas so eccentric and heretical but that however improbable such is the fact is already evident a priori to any one who even without examining these strange letters and still stranger circulars has observed the progressive development of insanity in Cole's career and knows that it was just through his unheard of audacity that he triumphed and that the bohemians were not so much scandalized as struck dumb by his eloquence and afterwards astonished and deeply moved by his recantations moreover these writings were refuted by the bohemian bishops in a document which is still extant and afterwards retracted by himself with a delicacy of which historians have not taken sufficient account they were not consigned to their entirety to the papal court along with the person of the tribune whose condemnation indeed could bring neither pleasure nor profit to the host who had been already forced by political considerations to betray the confidence reposed in him he remained meanwhile an isolated phenomenon an enigma to historians since it was not so much history as the science of mental pathology which could succeed in completely explaining him that science has pointed out to us in rienzi all the characteristics of the monomaniac regular features in handwriting exaggerated tendency to symbolism and plays upon words an activity disproportioned to his social position and original even in absurdity which entirely exhausted itself in writing an exaggerated consciousness of his own personality which at first aided him with the populace and supplant the want of tact and practical ability but which led him into absurdities and effective moral sense a calm marking the approach to dementia which was only disturbed by the abuse of alcohol or by a spirited opposition campanella if cola da rienzi was a strange problem for historians until resolved by the modern psychiatric studies on monomania not less strange has been the problem presented by campanella who from being a humble and disdained monk in a forgotten district of calabria claimed to be a monarch and as it were a demigod against the power of spain and of the pope and then suddenly became and died a zealot for both contradicting himself even against his own advantage certainly against that of his fame at last it seems to me the problem is approaching solution after the classical works of badacchino of spaventa of fiorentino but above all of amabile especially since carlo Folletti has passed those powerful works through the alembic of his synthetic criticism and removed from this strange metal the stains deposed by legends and historical prejudices campanella remarks Folletti, with his badly formed skull surmounted by seven inequalities hills as he himself called them possessed most sensitive nerves an acute intellect and easily exalted emotions the mystical education of the order to which he belonged completed the work of nature having entered a dominican monastery at the age of fourteen he always lived outside the real world he spent eight years in the schools of calabria amid disputes with his masters and fellow pupils and then departed almost fled from cosenza and went to naples no good fortune met him there soon after his arrival he chanced to speak slightly of excommunication he was at once denounced imprisoned taken to rome tried and condemned on leaving prison he decided to go to padua on the way he was robbed of his manuscripts three days after reaching padua he was accused of using violence against the general of the dominicans 
and some fresh imprisonment and fresh trial discharged and set at liberty he took part in public discussions but the doctrines he openly professed led to another trial and imprisonment he was only twenty six and already spent three years in prison at the age of twenty in the monastery of cosenza campanella had associated with a certain abremo from whom he received lessons in necromancy and who predicted that he would one day be king this was the starting point of his wild and ambitious imaginations it should be added that when studying astrology especially in fifteen ninety seven he talked with many astrologers mathematicians and prelates who all held that the end of the world was approaching excited by their arguments he gave himself to the study of prophecy seeking it in the bible the fathers and the poets of antiquity in the symbols of the white horses and the white-robed elders of the new zion he saw the brothers of saint dominic convinced that the prediction of the holy republic referred to the dominicans he retired to stillo all the political and social disorders of his time were for campanella manifest signs and to these were added earthquakes famines floods and comets evidently the prophecies were being fulfilled no doubt sixteen hundred was the fatal year which would indicate the beginning of great changes and revolutions campanella spread the prophecies and prepared the ground for the holy republic there can be no question that these predictions and preparations led to a real rebellion because they fitted in with the miserable conditions of calabria such prophecies pleased many who cherished desires of revenge in the ears of these exasperated people campanella's words sounded like a call to rebellion maurizio di rinaldi the leader of the band so understood it as did other bandits rinaldi cared little for religious reforms and knew nothing of what the seven seals of the apocalypse signified he understood however that his arm was needed and persuaded that it was not possible to fight against spain with writings and words and the weapons of brigands he sought the aid of the turks he was a real rebel the real matter in the liberation of calabria from subjection to spain of all the chief persons concerned in this disturbance he alone confessed himself a rebel the others either deny the existence of a rebellion or profess their innocence seeing the old world doubled by the discovery of new lands and europe turned upside down by wars campanella thought of a universal monarchy with the pope and himself the king and pastor turn to his utopia of the city of the sun which all are educated in common all the solarians call each other brother they are all sons of the great father adorned on the summit of the mountain on which the city is built there is not and cannot be among them any selfishness all consider the common good and under the guidance of the priest and head live happily together since all are instructed and knowledge is the foundation of every honour there is no noble strife of intelligence the solarian citizens have made wonderful progress in the arts and sciences they have ships to plough the seas without sails and without oars and cars that are propelled by the force of the wind they have discovered how to fly and they are inventing instruments which will reveal new stars they know that the world is a great animal in whose body we live that the sea is produced by the sweat of the earth and that all the stars move they practice perpetual adoration offer up bloodless sacrifices and reverence but do not worship the sun and the stars all this simplicity happiness and prosperity are due in the first place to education and to communism and in the second place to the magistrates who are all priests the spiritual and temporal head is hoc who is assisted by pom sim and more pom has charge of all that refers to war sim presides over the arts industries and instruction more directs human generation and the education of children he regulates the sexual relationships in order to produce healthy and robust offspring and he permitted the strong to procreate the rest are allowed to sacrifice to the terrestrial venus after fecundation has been ascertained the city of the sun is not in favour of war but has not refused to fight in battle the citizens are invincible because they fight in defence of their country natural law justice and religion the felicity of the city of the sun is rested therefore a community of goods of women of pleasures and of knowledge on wholesome generation on sacerdotal government and on simplicity in religion campanella aimed at founding the calabria a facsimile of the city of the sun the whole of his trial pharisee showed that he wished to reform religion and render it more in harmony with human nature by his own confession it is proved that he wished to establish a sacerdotal government no other affirms in fact that he aimed to become king of calabria in order to extend his authority thence over the whole world capital's mind was in such condition that it may be held with amabile 
that he saw the possibility of founding a republic similar to that described in the city of the sun naturally the head of this little holy republic the hawk of the city of the sun would be a philosopher and therefore himself all nations observing the felicity enjoyed by the citizens of the new scion would accept the new law and thus Capanella would become the monarch and guide of the world only a lunatic would consider it possible to undertake the reorganization of society at a stroke albi mis fundamentalis changing the form of government and overturning the most ancient customs institutions laws and traditions but the madness diminishes if this reorganization is a consequence of a profound and general upheaval like the proclaimed by the prophets for the end of the world in his writings certainly we find puerilities which go to prove insanity if he had been an ordinary man they would not be remarkable they would harmonize with the common prejudice of the day but he had broken with theology and undertaken to examine its ratio he had caught a glimpse of the modern state and he proposed reforms which for his time were most liberal and remarkable thus he writes law is a consent of all written and promulgated for the common good a poll thirty two the law should establish equality i bid forty the laws should be such that the people can obey them with love and fear mon di spagna c eleven heavy taxes should be levied on articles that are not necessary and are of luxury the light ones on necessaries b two doc one hundred ninety seven page ninety one there should be unity of government mon di spagna c twelve the barons should be deprived of their just carcerandi i bid c fourteen they should be deprived of fortresses i bid the national army should be established education should be free i bid medical aid should be gratuitous b two doc ninety seven page eighty two in fact capanella proposed what sully reculeau colbert and louis fourteen did for the french nation now when a man who reasons so profoundly fails to see the absurdity and impossibility of becoming with a few followers in a remote country style the monarch and reformer of the whole world he can only be insane and so he was judged by the more sagacious among his contemporaries thus father giacinto the confident regular wrote no one believes so easily in his story that is told him and examines things that he believes to be de facto with less judgment and again i shall always hold him for a man wilder than a fly less sensible in worldly affairs than a child Pedro called him bonhomme following human intellect cavanella reached pantheism the soul of things the transformation of animate and inanimate beings veneration of the sun the beneficent star living temple statue and venerable face of the true god stricken by adversity not assisted by his god he returned to catholicism to the angels and miracles to the future life which promises enjoyments which cannot be had on earth and the restoration of the beloved lost like all madmen incapable of moderation he became furiously intolerant hence his ferocious suggestions for oppressing the protestants and the title which he took of emissary of christ or of the most high he imagined that his works would serve to confute the protestants wrote and disputed against lutherians and calvinists wished to find colleges of priests for the diffusion of catholicism gave advice to those who would none of it for overthrowing heresy and propagating the true faith in short he ended as he had begun in a delirious dream of religious ambition which only varied in subject going from one pole to the opposite but i repeat this phenomenon of contradiction and on the passage from opposite excesses of feeling is one of the most marked characters of monomania and especially religious monomania i remember nuns of whom i had charge at the asylum of Pesaro, who on first becoming insane were violent and blasphemous and later on in the course of their madness apostles of christianity and thus it is easy to see what the misery may and the influence of insanity develop extraordinary prodigality we have seen lazaretti a drunkard and a blasphemer become austere and pious under the influence of insanity and then from being a fanatical papist becoming and dying an anti-papist when he found himself repulsed by the vatican recently dinino in his book il messiae degli abruzzi had described a certain priest become a messiah who while insane attempted reforms at all events and rites and who during the last month of his life like campanella starred himself in penitence for his revolutionary sins and in spite of farce and penances believed that he was damned end of section fourteen
Section 15 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 Political and Religious Lunatics and Metoids. Part 3 San Juan de Dios. Juan Suidad was born on March 8, 1495, in the town of Montemoro or Novo, in Portugal. He seems to have been tormented by the spirit of adventure from his childhood, as he left his father's house at the age of eight. A priest took him as far as Oropesa, where he entered the service of a Frenchman in the capacity of shepherd. After some years, he became tired of his work, and being tall and strong enlisted as a soldier. The life he led in the army cannot be described. The officers set the example and plundered as greedily as the privates. One of the former entrusted his share of the booty to Juan, who either lost it or stole it. He was condemned to death, and was just going to be hanged when a superior officer passing by granted him his life, but dismissed him from the army. He then returned to Oropesa, and resumed his former position. Towards 1528 he enlisted a second time, and marched under the orders of the Count of Oropesa. When the war was over, he returned to Montemor, or Novo, to see his parents but he lost his memory and forgot his father's name. He then left the place and went to Ayamonte in Andalusia, where he became a shepherd. It was there that he believed himself to have been called, and later on, to have had a dream in which he dedicated himself to God and to the poor. Those were the days when the Barbary pirates flourished, making descents on ill-defended countries and kidnapping their inhabitants, whom they sold at Fez, Algiers, and Tunis. Two religious orders had made it their special task to collect arms for the ransom of the Catholics who were being sold in the slave market. It seems that Juan Suetad had the intention of consecrating himself to this sacred duty. He embarked for Ceuta, where he entered the service of an exiled and ruined Portuguese family, whom it was said he supported by his labour as an artisan. After a time he grew weary of this life, he left his master and sailed for Gibraltar, where he established a small trade in relics and other sacred objects. The sale of these having brought him some money, he left Gibraltar and settled at Granada, where he opened a shop. He was then aged forty-three, and was just about to undergo that mental convulsion which determined his vocation. On the 20th of January, 1539, after hearing a sermon by Juan de Avila, he was seized by a fit of frantic devotion. He confessed his sins in a loud voice, rolled in the dust, pulled out the hair of his head, tore his clothes, and rushed through the streets of Granada, imploring the mercy of God, and followed by boys shouting after him as a madman. He entered his library, destroyed all the secular books in his possession, gave away the sacred ones, distributed his furniture and clothes to anyone who was willing to have them, and remained in his shirt, beating his breast and calling on every one to pray for him. The crowd followed him noisily as far as the cathedral, where half-naked he again began his vociferations and bursts of despair. The preacher, Juan de Avila, having been informed of the conversion occasioned by his words, listened to the poor man's confession, consoled him, and gave him advice, which does not appear to have had much effect, since on leaving him, so he dad rolled himself in a dung heap, proclaiming his sins in a loud voice. The crowd amused themselves by hissing him, throwing stones and mud, and otherwise maltreating him. Some, however, took pity on him and conducted him to the place set apart for the insane in the royal hospital. He was subjected to the treatment then in vogue, that is, he was bound and scourged in order to deliver him from the evil spirit supposed to possess him. This attack of mania appears to have been one of great violence. In general, with regard to mental maladies, the more excessive the alienation, the more easily it ceases. It is said that in the midst of the blows inflicted on him, he took a vow to receive poor madmen and treat them as is fitting. When the nervous exasperation was calmed, he employed himself in attending on the sick, and later on obtained his liberty and a certificate testing his sanity, having made a vow to go on pilgrimage to the shrine of the Virgin of Guadalupe. He started barefoot, without a farthing, in the middle of winter. On his way through the forest and across the moors, he picked up dry sticks and made them into a faggot, which, then he reached an inhabitable place, he gave in exchange for a little food and a night's lodging. It is said that when he reached Guadalupe, he had a vision which exercised a decisive influence on him. The Virgin appeared to him, and gave him the child Jesus, naked, with clothes to cover him. This was to show him that he ought to have pity on the weak, shelter the destitute, and clothe the poor. At least such was his interpretation. 
His mission dates from that day, and he executed it with so much more zeal, as he believed it to have been laid upon him by the virgin whom he adored. Dressed in a white garment, which an Hieronymine monk had given him, with a wallet on his back and a pilgrim's staff in his hand, he returned to Oropesa and went to lodge in the poorhouse. The misery of the inmates so touched him that he went outside the city, begged arms for them, and gave them all that he received. Later on he took to selling faggots in the public square, giving to the poor and sick all that he gained, and slept in stables through the charity of their owners. One day, having seen a notice posted up in the square, house to let for the poor, he conceived the idea of making it into an asylum, having begged money from the rich, with which he bought mats, blankets, and utensils, he received and sheltered forty-six sick and crippled paupers. In order to maintain them, he went about the streets at the dinner hour to collect from the rich the remnants of their meals, crying, Do good, my brethren, it will return in blessing to yourselves. John de Dios's example provoked emulation. Several men offered themselves to help him. He instructed them in their new duties, and thus became the head of the group, which, by multiplying, had become the great congregation now in existence. The resources now put at his disposal permitted him to treat the sick, as is fitting. It is worthy of attention that Juan de Dios was a reformer in the matter of treating the sick, only placing one patient at each bed. He was the first to divide the sick into classes. He was, in short, the creator of the modern hospital, and the founder of casual wards, for he opened a connection with the hospital, a house where the homeless poor and travellers without money could sleep. It was at this period that he took the name Juan de Dios. The good done by him did not remain unknown, and the name of Juan de Dios, father poor, was spread abroad through Spain. Profiting by this, he made a journey as far as Granada, and returned with abundant contributions. He was exhausted by hardy work and exposure rather than by years. He treated himself with exaggerated austerity, always travelling on foot without shoes, hat or linen, only covered with a single grey garment. He fasted with extreme frequency, and imposed on himself the most trying exertions. He would rush through a burning house to save the sick. He often threw himself into the water to save children. He may be said to have died of the hardships he endured. During his last days, he sent for Antonio Martin, his earliest disciple, and recommended the work to his care. Feeling the approach of death, he left his bed to pray and died on his knees. He was born on March 8, 1495, and died on Saturday, March 8, 1550. He had a splendid funeral. Sick men touched the bear in the hope of being healed. The sheet which covered the corpse was torn to pieces, and each rag became a relic. He was canonized September the 21st, 1630, by Urban the 8th, and is now known as San Juan de Dios. Prosper and Fantin Prosper and Fantin, though an engineer, a railway director, and otherwise connected with such rational and prosaic subjects as mathematics, nevertheless, in 1850, believed himself to be that in fact was the head of a new religion, a variation of that of St. Simon. He had a handsome face and large forehead of an Olympian cast. He was very kind-hearted, but profoundly convinced of his own infallibility on in all subjects, on industrial and philosophical questions, on painting as well as on cooking. He had what, in a peculiar language of modern manners, he called circumferential ideas, in which every new fact found, in his pre-established place, the proper solution. The new religion was to equalize men and women and to make the language of finance and industry poetical. He himself represented the father, and was always hoping to find the mother, the free woman, the Eve, a woman reasoning like a man, who knowing the needs and capabilities of women, would make the confession of her sex without restriction, so as to furnish the elements for a declaration of the rights and duties of women. But the right woman was never found, for Madame de Stael and George Sand, to whom he and his friends first turned, laughed them. They sought her in the east at Constantinople, and found instead a prison. But, for all that, he never lost his illusion. He used to say that only great men could found a new religion. His goodness was exquisite. He constantly sacrificed himself for his followers, his sons as he called them. These wore at one time, like certain monomaniacs, a symbolical uniform, white trousers to represent love, red waistcoat for work, and blue coat for faith. This signified that his religion was founded on love, strengthened the heart with work, and was wholly encompassed by faith. Every one was to have his name written on his shirt front, and to wear in addition a collar adorned with triangles, and a semicircle, which was to become a circle as soon as the mother, Eve, aforesaid, had been found. 
These are the symbols usual with the monomaniac and the metoid. This is seen in their programs, in which they announce, in type of various sizes, that man recalls the past, women represents the future, the two united see the present. Yet in spite of all this, he foresaw, and even tried to undertake the Suez Canal, and counted among his followers such men as Chevalier, Lambert, and Jordan. Lazaretti An example, the more curious as well as authentic, as it has manifested itself in recent years, under the eyes of all, and has arrived at the dignity of an historic event, is the case of David Lazaretti. This man was born at Archidoso in 1834. His father, a carter, appears to have been given to drink, but was of great strength. He had some relatives who were suicidal and others insane. One in particular died a religious maniac and believed himself to be the eternal father. Lazaretti's six brothers were all strong men of gigantic stature, ranging from 1.9 to 1.95 metres in height, which, however, is not uncommon in that part of the country, of quick wits and tenacious memory. David was distinguished from the rest by his superior stature, by the distinction and regularity of his features, by greater intelligence, by the large size of his head, which is dilacocephalic in form, and by his eyes, which some found fascinating, though to many, says the advocate Pugno, they seem to have the character of possession of, of insanity. It is asserted that he was hypnospatic and perhaps impotent in his youth, and now is of no slight importance if we remember that moral, and especially Le Grand de Soul, have often discovered them in hereditary madmen. Even from his childhood, he showed these contradictions, those tendencies to extremes in character, which are frequent precursors of insanity. Thus, when a boy, he wished to become a monk. Later on, after he had taken to his father's trade, he began to lead a regular life, and gave himself up to alcoholic intemperance. In the meantime, however, he cultivated his mind by a course of reading, which was singular for a man in his position, including Dante and Tasso, and at fifteen he was called Thousand Ideas, from the strange songs he invented. Though he could never succeed in learning the rules of grammar, he was quarrelsome, he used the foulest language, and was treated by all, so much so that one day, on the occasion of a festival, unarmed and followed only by his brothers, he put to flight the entire population of Castel de Piano. Yet he was exactly excited by a speech, a poem, a sermon, a play, anything that appeared noble and great. He had an extreme veneration for Christ and Mahomet, whom he used to call the two greatest men that had ever appeared in the world. According to his own confessions, he had, at the age of fourteen, various hallucinations of the same kind as those which proved so fatal to him in 1878. It is certain, besides that, at one time in his youth, he had a strong sympathy for a Jewess of Pizzicliano, awakened by the eloquence with which she defended her religion. Yet at that time, he was accustomed to say that there were three things he bored, women, churches, and dancing. In 1859, at 25, he enlisted as a volunteer in the cavalry, and in 1860 he took part in Cialdini's campaign, but rather as an officer's servant than as a soldier. Before starting, he wrote a patriotic hymn, which was sent to Proferio, and surprised him by the novelty of its thoughts and the beauty of some of the verses, contrasting strangely with the roughness of the phraseology and the numerous grammatical errors. After this, he again returned to his trade as a carter, at the same time to his habits of debauchery and foul language. He also rejoined his wife, whom he had married three years previously, and for whom he felt a poetic affection which he carried so far as to write love songs to her. Here again his ambitious ideas reappeared and induced him anew, though so uncultivated, to seek fame through his verses and tragedies, which read like burlesques. Gradually his fantastic delusions took another direction. In 1867, at thirty-three, he had, whether as an effect of drink or of political excitement, a return of the religious hallucinations of 1848 in more marked form than previously. One day he disappeared in consequence of a vision of the Madonna, who had commanded him to go to Rome and remind the Pope, who had first refused to receive him, but afterwards treated him with courtesy, though, it is said, not without advising him to try the remedy of a good shower bath of his divine mission. He then went to the hermitage of Montorio Romano in the Sabine Mountains, inhabited by a Prussian monk named Ignazio Micus. The latter kept him with him for three months in the quarter of the blessed Amadeus, directing him in his theological studies. It is very probable, though at this point we can only conjecture, as all direct evidence is wanting, 
that this mark assisted him to make the tattoo marks on his forehead which he claimed to have received from the hand of st peter and which he hid under a lock of hair from the gaze of the profane showing them only to true believers this tattooing according to the testimony of medical men consists of an irregular parallelogram on the upper side of which are thirteen dots disposed in the form of a cross to this mark and to two others which he afterwards produced on himself on the deltoid muscle on the inside of the leg he attributed through a tendency common among the insane a strange and mysterious significance as seals of a special covenant with god the image of the tattoo is displayed on the page from that moment a complete change took place in him such as is often observed in the insane from being quarrelsome blasphemous and intemperate he became tractable gentle and abstemious to the point of living on bread and water in sabina and in the tempora on the mountains on herbs with salt and vinegar at other times he had no other food but polenta or soup maigre or bread with onions or garlic on the island of monte cristo in eighteen seventy he lived for over a month on six loaves garnished with a few herbs and in the french monastery he got through several days on two potatoes a day what must have appeared still more strange and surprised even cultured minds was the fact that the chaotic and burlesque writer became sometimes elegant always effective full of vigorous images supplied by a piety comparable alone to that of the early christians this in fact struck the clergy of the district who hardly seeing him a repetition of the ancient prophets took him seriously all the more that according to their usual custom they perceived the means of making a profit out of him and getting a church rebuilt the people already justly astonished at his changed ways of life no less than by his tattooings his inspired speech his long neglected beard and grave bearing rushed in massa to hear him encouraged by the priests a procession was then organized in which lazaretti accompanied by priests and by some of the most influential among the lady marched to arcritoso rochel begna castel del piano pian castagniano sinegniano and santa fiora in all these places he was received with rejoicings by the people on their knees and the parish priests kissed his face and his hands and even his feet the construction of the church was begun and contributions to the building fund flowed in abundantly but though numerous the amounts were small the mountaineers being able to give much the notion was then suggested of employing the labour of their arms the side of the church had been selected not far from acredoso about a hundred paces from the village at the spot called la crosse de kanzaki where by a strange fatality he was to receive his death shot the faithful assembled by thousands to begin the building men women and children were employed in carrying for scenes beams of wood and stones but unfortunately architecture like grammar has rules and in carrying them out prophetic inspiration is of little use without training thus as lazaretti's verses remained lame so the materials collected with so much labour remained a useless heap like the tower which was reached to heaven and never became more than a pile of stones in january eighteen seventy he found in the society of the holy league a mutual assistance society which he called the symbol of charity in march of the same year after having assembled his followers at a last supper he set out accompanied by raffaello and Giuseppe, for the island of monte cristo where he remained for some months writing epistles prophecies and sermons he then returned to montelabro where he wrote down the visions or prophetic inspirations which he had and where he was arrested for sedition april twenty seventh after his liberation he found a society to which he gave the name of christian families this was considered very erroneously as a proof of continued fraud and he was arrested but discharged through the efforts of the advocate salvi after seven months imprisonment in eighteen seventy three lazaretti in obedience to other divine commands started on a journey passing through rome naples and turin where he proceeded to the Catrus at grenoble here he wrote the rules and disciple of the order of penitent hermits invented a system of cipher with a numerical alphabet and dictated the book of the heavenly flowers in which it is written that the great men shall descend from the mountains followed by a little band of mountain burghers to which are added the visions dreams and divine commands which he believed himself to have received in that place on his return to montalabro he found an immense crowd attracted both by devotion and curiosity encamped on the summit of the mountain to whom he addressed a sermon on the text god sees us judges us condemns us this he was denounced to the authorities as 
tending to overthrow the government and promote civil war in the night of november nineteen eighteen seventy four he was arrested a second time and brought before the court of Reti. this time the authorities were desirous of obtaining the opinion of non-specialist experts who with inexplicable want of perception pronounced him to be of sound mind and a cunning knave thus in spite of his strange publications and his tattoo marks he was condemned to fifteen months imprisonment and one year of police supervision for fraud and vagabondage the sentence however was referred to the court of appeal of perugia and on the second of august eighteen seventy five he was allowed to return to montelebro where he reconstituted his society and placed the priest in peruzzi at the head of it his health had suffered in prison and for this reason perhaps also to avoid new arrests and to enjoy the glory of easy matrimony among the legitimist fanatics he went to france in october being mysteriously carried as he expressed it by the divine power into the environs of a town in burgundy he produced a book which with good reason he calls mysterious entitled my wrestling with god or the book of the seven seals with a description and nature of the seven eternal cities a mixture of genesis and revelation with sentences and rhapsodies entirely of an insane character he also wrote a manifesto addressed to all the princes in christendom in which he calls himself the great monarch and invites them to make alliance with him for at an unexpected time the end of the world shall be manifested to the latin nation in a way quite opposite to human pride in the same document he declares himself leader master judge and prince over all the potentates of earth these writings were copied for him by the priest in Peruzzi, who corrected the most conspicuous mistakes and many of them attained not only the undeserved honour of appearing in print but also that of being translated into french by the aid of m leon Dufaget and various italian and foreign reactionaries who were taken lazaretti seriously however a short time after he was so far carried away by delirium as to begin inveighing against the corruptions of the priesthood and the practice of auricular confession for which he wished to substitute a public one thereupon the holy see declared his doctrines false and his writings subversive and the same man who had formerly written a work in favour of the pope now wrote and dispatched on may fourteenth eighteen seventy eight an exhortation addressed to his brethren of the order of hermits against pavel idolatry and the beast of the seven heads after all this with the usual contradictoriness of the insane he went to rome to lay aside his symbolic seal and his rod and retracted before the holy office he afterwards returned to montelebro he continued to deliver addresses against the catholic church which he said had become a shopkeeping church and against the priests true atheists in practice who not believing themselves profit by the belief of others preaching the holy reformation and declaring himself the man of mystery the new christ leader and avenger he exhorted believers to separate themselves from the world and prove their separation by abstaining from food and from sexual intercourse even in the case of married persons who however if they indulged were required to pray for at least two hours naked outside their bed before the act he issued paper money for considerable sums in proportion to the means at the disposal of the community i e up to one hundred and four thousand francs but it should be noted that this was absolutely useless being kept shut up in a closed vase this idea savours unmistakably of insanity after announcing a great miracle he caused to be prepared with a part of the money collected banners and garments for the members embroidered with the animals which had appeared to him in his hallucinations all of strange and grotesque shapes he had a rich one made for himself and for the rank and file a square piece of stuff to wear on the breast which showed a cross with two c's reversed the usual emblem of the association in august eighteen seventy eight he assembled a larger number than ever and having prescribed prayers and fasts for three days and three nights delivered addresses some of which were public others private and reserved for believers who were divided into the various classes of priest hermits penitentiary hermits penitent hermits and civil associations of the holy league and christian brotherhood and caused the so-called confession of the amendment to be made on the fourteenth fifteenth and sixteenth august on the seventeenth the great banner with the inscription the republic is the kingdom of god was raised on the tower then having assembled all the members at the foot of a cross erected for the purpose the prophet administered the solemn oath of fidelity and obedience at this point one of david's brothers tried to persuade him to renounce his perilous enterprise but in vain for on the contrary he replied that those who pointed out the possibility of a conflict he would on the following day show them a miracle to prove that he was sent from god in the form of christ a judge and a leader and therefore invulnerable 
and that every power on earth must yield to his will a sign from this rod of command was enough to annihilate all the forces of those who dared oppose him a member having remarked on the opposition of the government he added that he would ward off the balls with his hand and render harmless the weapons directed against himself and his faithful followers and the government carbineers themselves would act as a guard of honour to them more and more intoxicated with his delirium he wrote in all seriousness to the delegate of public safety to whom he had already shown the preparations and later on giving a half promise to countermand the procession that he was no longer able to do so having received superior orders to the contrary from god himself he threatened unbelievers with the divine wrath if through want of faith they rebelled against his will with such intentions on the morning of august eighteenth he set about from montelabro at the head of an immense crowd going down towards archidoso he was dressed in a royal cloak of purple embroidered with gold ornaments and crowned with a kind of tiara surmounted by a crest adorned with plumes and he held in his hand the staff of which he called his rod of command his principal associates were dressed less richly than himself in strangely fashioned robes of various colours according to their position in the hierarchy of the holy league the ordinary members were dressed in their everyday clothes without other mark of distinction than the emblematic breastplate previously described seven of the graduates of the brotherhood carried as many banners with the motto the republic is the kingdom of god they sang the davidian hymn each stanza of which ended up with the refrain eternal is the republic etc it is needless to relate what took place in those last hours the man who had shortly before called himself the king of kings and believed himself invulnerable fell struck by a shot fired by the orders perhaps by the hand of a delegate who had many a time been his guest it appears that he exclaimed as he fell under the influence of a last illusion the victory is ours it is certain that position he had arranged was not only unarmed but appeared to be in every way calculated to turn out perfectly harmless nakuto has well remarked that an exclamation of the strange emblematic properties of the league proved beyond all doubt that the governor had mistaken a monomaniac for a rebel he took his stand on the passage of the nicene creed which states that christ rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the father whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead having waited in vain for the appearance of christ he came to believe that this part must be reserved for him christ had twelve apostles therefore he wished to have twelve christ had included st peter among the number and lazaretti also determined to have st peter who was distinguished by the badge of a pair of cross keys on his breast in imitation of the forty days fast lazaretti fasted in midwinter in the island of monte cristo and there received communications from god amid the noise of the tempest the crash of thunders and the shaking of the whole island there too he held a sort of last supper with his disciples on january fifteen eighteen seventy in the course of which he said thus it has pleased him who directs me in all my works know that this supper carries with it the greatest of mysteries think that you are in place which god has chosen for his dwelling or to speak more correctly for his adoration here here not far from us on this soil shall be raised marvellous pyramids in honour of his most holy name and the said pyramids shall be an oracle of the divine majesty to say the truth he did not at this supper institute any sacrament but that nothing might be wanting in his mad idea of imitating jesus christ he evolved a sacrament of his own that of the confession of amendment at bottom a slight variation of auricular confession all this however was not sufficient david lazaretti was determined to have his transfiguration and his earthquake and promised them for august eighteen eighteen seventy eight when the surgeon was hesitating to operate on one of his sons for calculus he took the knife out of his hand and performed the operation the boy died under it but lazaretti quite undisturbed kept on repeating the son of david cannot die at the post-mortem examination a second tattoo mark was discovered on his body this was the usual cross placed inside a reverse tiara his brothers questioned on the subject replied that he had a golden seal made in france which he called the imperial seal and after that immersing it in boiling oil he had branded first his own flesh and then that of his sons and his wife with the impression which is in fact a convincing proof of the insensibility to pain peculiar to the insane and of their tendency to express their eccentric ideas by means of figures and symbols he claimed to leave a visible sign on the descent which in common with all his family he boasted from the emperor constantine however not satisfied to descend from a royal race he also wanted to rule the world in his own person though afterwards he was willing to contend himself with the creation of a prince whom he would invest with it in a manifesto addressed to all christian princes 
he makes the following proclamation i address myself to all the princes of christendom catholics schismatics or heretics provided only they have been baptized it matters little whether or not they have been invested with power or the government of nations so long as they are sprung from royal blood i call them all and the first one who shall present himself to me who is not under twenty years of age or over fifty and has no bodily imperfection i constitute him king in my stead the strange thing is that he was taken at his word by the comte de chambord who sent an embassy to him i have need he continued of a christian alliance i am decided to-day to hasten this great enterprise and if they the christian princes do not come to me within the fixed term of three years from the date of publication of this programme i will leave europe and go to the unbelieving nations to do with them who have not been able to do with christians but in that case woe to all of you princes of christendom ye shall be punished by the seven heads of the great antichrist which shall arise in the midst of europe and above all by a youth who after my departure shall advance from the regions on the north towards central france and shall pretend to be that which i myself am from henceforward there appears in david lazaretti the fixed idea of being the king of kings and prince of princes to the head of the municipal body of archidoso who would not obey him he said i am the king of kings the monarch of all monarchs i bear on my shoulders all the princes of the world all the carboneers and soldiers there are are mine and dependent on me and there are no ropes that can bind me to minusi who was trying to escape unnoticed he said you don't know that i am the prince of princes the king of all the earth and if you try to run away i will have you stoned alive the witness g b rosi was present at the sermon on the seventeenth and heard david say that he was the king of kings christ the judge that the pope was no longer to reside at rome but that he lazaretti on certain conditions would provide him with another residence and that the king of italy too would be his subject the witness mariotti also deposed that he had heard david say in his sermon that he had no fear of force that even with a million of soldiers it was impossible for a subject to arrest his monarch lastly not to lengthen the series of proofs the witness giuseppe tonini heard him assert in the sermon that he was the king of kings and commanded the whole world while the witness valentino mazzetti says that lazaretti was determined to hold the position of august eighteenth at any cost and that do you think they are going to arrest us no no it is not possible for subjects to arrest their monarch the emblematic device he adopted is worth noting the double c to which he attached so much importance representing the first and second christ i e christ the son of st joseph of nazareth and christ the son of the late joseph lazaretti of archidoso in truth it is not in any way comprehensible what relation christ could hold to constantine the latter to david and all these to lazaretti but the relation exists precisely in those strange contradictions and absurdities which amid the persistence of the prince's idea constantly come to the service in monomaniacs so that some have wished to class their disease as dementia in fact although they keep up the character so to speak far better than general paralytics and try to give a plausible appearance to their delirium yet oftentimes when overpowered with the necessity of finding a vent for their persistent ambitious idea they pay no attention to the contradictions they fall into a pavia embroideress believing herself a descendant of the bonaparte family bottled her dress language and aspect with great success to those the members of the reigning families yet while she asserted herself to be the daughter of mary louise she at the same time claimed victor emmanuel as her father as in other occasions she tried to persuade us that she had found the poison of vipers in the eggs she was eating thus though at first calling on the pope to liberate italy lazaretti when excommunicated or merely treated with contempt by the pope wrote against papa idolatry though he wished to die a member of the catholic apostolic church he inveighed against a regular confession which is a very pivot of catholicism and while he called himself the son of david he also wished to be thought the son of constantine passanante passanante the would-be regicide of naples has no morbid hereditary antecedents at the age of twenty-nine his height was one point six three metres and his weight fifty one and a half kilograms i e fourteen kilograms less than the nobility in average his head may be described as almost submicrocephalic cephalic index eighty two probable capacity one thousand five hundred thirteen his features show the characteristics of the mongol and the cretan 
small and deeply set eyes abnormally far apart zygomatic bones highly developed beard scanty the pupils show a low degree of mobility and the genitals are atrophied a fact connected with that of almost complete anaphrodisia on the other hand the liver and spleen are hypertrophied which partly explains the increase of the temperature varying from thirty eight degrees to thirty seven point eight degrees at the armpits the weakness of the pulse eighty eight and the very slight degree of strength which moreover is less on the right side sixty kilos than on the left seventy eight kilos this last fact which perhaps arises from an old burn on the hand is most important because rendering the complete carrying out of the crime improbable especially taking into account the clumsy weapon with which he was armed and the unfavourable position which was the only one he could take the sensibility was perverted the tactile presenting five millimetres on the back of the hand where the normal sensitiveness is from sixteen to twenty and seven on the forehead where it is usually from twenty to twenty two that on the palm of the hand was not registered on the contrary the sensitiveness of the skin to puncture was much weakened in prison he had attacks of delirium accompanied by hallucinations all these characteristics are clear indications of disease both in the abdominal viscera and in the nervous centres this result is even more evident from the psychological study of the case a merely superficial examination might have induced the belief that his affections and moral sentiments were normal he showed indeed a horror of crime lived a most frugal and abstemious life while sometimes so religious sometimes exaggerated patriotic always appeared to prefer the advantage of others to his own he thus presented to those unversed in the study of mental pathology the appearance as it were of a matter to an idea which had been maturing for years the mouthpiece and tool of power sect who might call for execration politically but as an individual command respect this view however is at once seen to be fallacious even leaving aside the delirium which might have been the effect of imprisonment if we remember that as has already been said frugality and unselfishness are special characteristics of the metoid and not seldom also of the insane some of whom seem to more affection for their country and for humanity in general than for their families and themselves and if we notice the indifference or even pleasure which would in his writings he refers to the murders committed by his countrymen when to the sound of axes they make foreigners give them money above all the enjoyment with which he records the cruel practical joke played on a poor man who was very fond of his cherry tree by digging up the ladder bringing a bat stripped of its fruit and leaving it at his front door this morbid apathy is especially revealed in the want of emotion shown after the crime in the fact of the anger of the populace which were let loose against him yet even the greatest fanatics among political assassins such as orsini sand and nobiling have been overwhelmed by the emotion after the deed and have often attempted suicide the true mode of the act is quite sufficient to prove this being dismissed from his situation on account of his political vagaries arrested as a vagabond an addition ill-used by the police he thought with a vanity as boundless as his impertinence to gratify it or even to live of imitating the heroes he had heard talked of in the clubs and against whom he had himself declaimed so as to find a way of ending his life by the hand of another as i find myself ill-used by my employers and felt a horror of life i formed the design of assassinating the king so as not to have to kill myself he said to the magistrate immediately after his arrest to the judge as editor, i attempted the king's life in the certainty that i should be killed in fact two days previously he had been much more occupied with the dismissal from his place than with projects of regicide and at his arrest he did all he could to make his situation more serious reminding the delegate that he had forgotten his revolutionary card on which was written death to the king long live the republic it was a case of indirect suicide such as maudsley crichton esquirol and kraft ebbing have recorded in great numbers these however are only committed by the insane or by cowardly and immoral men i insist upon this motive all the more that he formed at the same time the means of satisfying that incoherent vanity which in him predominated over the love of life it is well known that many vain suicidal maniacs enjoy the sight of their own death surrounded by pomp like the englishman who had a mass composed executed in public and shot himself while the regiscat was being chanted if therefore we find in him any fanaticism it is not for politics but for his own ridiculous and ungrammatical effusions 
when he lost his temper and shed tears at the trial the outburst was not provoked by any insult to his party but by a refusal to permit the reading of one of his letters and when his reputation as a scullion was attacked by the assertion that he was continually reading instead of washing up the dishes which he flatly denied though he implied proof of unsoundness of mind would have been entirely in his favour his intelligence might be called unusual and original rather than superior to the average and appeared much more brilliant in his conversations than in his writings in which it is difficult to find a vigorous expression such as we so frequently meet within the works of the insane as distinguished from the toids however searching here and there amid the enormous mass of his writings and piecing out the gaps we meet with some few fragments which both original and curious for example though grotesque enough his idea of having deputies and officials chosen by lot like soldiers for the conscription that they may not be so proud is not without originality equally striking is the idea of forcing the convicts who pass their time in enforced idleness to cultivate waste lands of calling out the young men for conscription before they have chosen a trade and of crying out the emperor william who wants five milliards from france he who sows thorns should be made to walk barefoot good too in its way though somewhat turkish is that of establishing a free inn for travellers in every village still more remarkable is this which if it had not been written some time previously might be taken as referring to his own case it is all that the authorities should exercise severity of punishment towards a man whose only idea is to change the form of government and attack the head of the state the country is a mother of all without distinction to all without distinction law should be sister of death which has no respect for any but cuts them down when their times come his contrast between man isolated a man in association with his fellows is worthy of gusti when you see him alone he is weak as a glass tumbler you see a glass think of the strength of man there is no great difference but united men become hard and have the strength of a thousand samsons where he really appeared superior to the average was in his viva vos answers thus history studied practically among the people is more instructive than the history studied in books the people is the best teacher of history etc to justify the literary pretensions which seemed so inconsistent with his position as a poor cook he replied where the learned man goes astray the ignorant often triumphs when asked what takes place at the conscious when one is about to commit a bad action he replied in us there are as it were two wills one pushing us on the other holding us back and the one that proves strongest determines the action but it is precisely in his intermittent flashes of political insight so strange in his position that a morbid abnormality becomes evident for it must be remarkable that they constitute rather the exception than the rule all we find as a rule is a commonplace and the absurd in the same code he proposes to hang coiners and burn thieves and abolish the death penalty he wishes to kill the king in another article he demands for him a pension of two and a half millions Guitau. the same thing may be said of Guitau he presented an enormous number of degenerative characteristics his handwriting is quite that of the matoid and he was descended from a family which counted among its members many lunatics and fanatics advocate theologian politician and swindler he had tried all trades and claimed to have made a great discovery about the birth of christ the fact is that he had spoiled a great deal of paper and issued one or more journals and ridiculous works of the existence of hell and on truth which he believed to be written under divine dictation he thought that god would pay his debts as a reward for his eccentric preachings it was in obedience to a divine command that he killed garfield it was only done in revenge for his failure to appoint him u s consul at liverpool ambassador to austria etc which showed great ingratitude on garfield's part considering the trouble goteau had taken in his own belief to secure his election as president south americans the number of great men in the argentine republic suffered from cerebral affections is so considerable that it has enabled Mejia to compose on this subject a work which is among the most curious and valuable produced in the new world thus according to Mejia, rivadura was a hypochondriac and died of softening of the brain manuel gracia also suffered from hypochondria and finally succumbed to a brain affection admiral brown was subject to the delusion that he was persecuted valera was epileptic francia was a melancholiac rosas was morally insane and montegudo was hysterical end of chapter four part three
and end of section 15. Section 16 of The Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Part 4 Synthesis The Genre of Psychosis of Genius. Chapter 1 Characteristics of Insane Men of Genius. Characterlessness Vanity Precocity Alcoholism, fake of bondage, versatility, originality, style, religious doubts, sexual abnormalities, egoism, eccentricity, inspiration. The concept of the morbid and degenerative character of genius is confirmed and completed more and more when its isolated phenomena are subjected to a more rigorous examination, and, as in chemical reactions, to mutual contact. Even in fact, we analyse the lives and works of those great diseased minds which have become famous in history. We find that they can at once be distinguished by many characteristic traits from the average man, and also in part from other geniuses who have completed their life's orbit without trace of madness. 1. These insane geniuses have scarcely any character. The full, complete character, which bends not for any winds that blow, is a distinctive mark of honest and sound-minded men. Tasso, on the contrary, declaims against courts, and yet even to his last hour we find him perpetually coming back to beg their grudging favours. Cardin accuses himself of lying, evil speaking and gambling. Russell, though so sensitive, abandons to want the tenderest and kindest of friends, casts off his children, calumniates others and himself, and apostatizes three times over. From Catholicism, from Protestantism, and, what is worse, from the religion of philosophy. Swift, through an ecclesiastic, wrote the obscene poem of the loves of Strephon and Clo, and belittled the church of which he was a dignitary, though his pride reached the proportions of delirium. Lenau, religious to fanaticism in Savonarola, shows himself in the Albigensis even cynically sceptical. He knows it, confesses it, and laughs at it. Schopenhauer denounced women, and at the same time was too warm an admirer of the sex. He professed to believe in the happiness of Nirvana, and then predicted for himself more than a hundred years of life. 2. Genius is conscious of itself, appreciates itself, and certainly has no monkish humility, yet the conceit seething in diseased brains passes the limits of all truth and probability. Tessa and Cardan covertly and Mahabit omitly declare themselves inspired by God, and the slightest criticism therefore appeared to them as deadly persecution. Cardan wrote of himself, my nature is placed on the very limits of human substance and conditions and within the confines of the immortals. For so I believe that all men, and sometimes even the elements, were in a conspiracy against him. Perhaps it is on this very account that we have seen almost all these unhappy great spirits fly from association with other men. Swift humiliated and insulted cabinet ministers, and read to a duchess desirous of making his acquaintance that the greater men were, the lower must they bow before him. Lenau had inherited the pride of rank from his mother, and his delirium believed himself king of Hungary. 3. Some of these unfortunate men have given strangely precocious proofs of their genius. Tasso could speak when six months old, and knew Latin at the age of seven. Lenau, at a very early age, composed most touching sermons and played the bad pipes on the violin with astonishing skill. Cardin at eight had apparitions and revelations of genius, and Pierre was a mathematician at thirteen. Pascal, at ten, inspired by the noise made by a plate struck with a knife, worked out a theory of sound, and at fifteen composed his celebrated treatise on conic sections. Haler preached at four, and devoured books at five. Four. Many of them have been excessive in their abuse of narcotics, or of stimulants and intoxicants. Haler was in the habit of taking enormous doses of opium, and Rousseau was excessive in his use of coffee. Tasso was renowned as a drinker, and also the modern poets Cleist, Gerard de Naval, Musset, Merger, Majlath, Praga, and Rovami, as well as a very original Chinese writer, Li Te Po, who was inspired by alcohol and died of it. Lenau, also in his later years, was an immoderate consumer of wine, coffee, and tobacco. Baudelaire abused opium, tobacco, and wine. Cardin confessed himself an indefatigable drinker. Poe was a dipsomaniac. So was Hoffman. 5. 
Nearly all of these great men, moreover, showed anomalies of the reproductive functions. Toso, who was guilty of exaggerated licentiousness in his youth, was rigidly chased after his thirty-eighth year. On the other hand, Cardan, impotent in his youth, gave himself up to excess at thirty-five. Pascal, sensual in his early youth, afterwards believed even a mother's kiss to be a crime. Rousseau was affected by hypospadias and spermatoria, and like Baudelaire, was subject to a sexual perversion. Newton and Charles XII, so far as is known, were absolutely continent. They now wrote, I have the painful conviction that I am unsuitable for marriage. 6. Instead of preferring the quiet seclusion of the study, they cannot rest in any place, and have to be continually travelling. They now removed from Vienna to Stockerau, and then to Krumden, and finally emigrated to America. I need, he said, a change of climate every now and then disturb my blood. Tasso was continually travelling from Ferrara to Urbano, Mantua, Naples, Paris, Bergamo, Rome, and Turin. Poe was the despair of his editors, because he was continuously wandering between Boston, New York, Richmond, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. Giordano Bruno wandered to Padua, Oxford, Wittenberg, Magdeburg, Helmstadt, Prague, and Geneva. Rousseau, Card, and Cellini were constantly staying now at Turin, now at Paris, now at Florence, Rome, Bologna, or Lausanne. Change of place, says Rousseau, is a necessity for me. In a fine season, I find it impossible to remain for more than two or three days in one place without suffering. 7. Sometimes they changed their career and course of study several times in succession, as though the mighty intellect could not find rest and relief in a single science. Swift, in addition to his satiric poems, wrote on the manufacturers of Ireland, on theology, on politics, and on the history of the reign of Queen Anne. Cardan was at the same time a mathematician, physician, theologian, and literary man. Rousseau was painter, music master, charlatan, philosopher, botanist, and poet, and Hoffman, magistrate, caricaturist, musician, romance writer, and dramatist. Tasso, as it Gogol after him, attempted all variety of poetry, epic, dramatic, and didactic, in all meters. Newton and Pascal, in moments of aberration, abandoned physics for theology. Lenau cultivated medicine, agriculture, law, poetry, and theology. 8. These energetic and terrible intellects are the true pioneers of science. They rush forward regardless of danger, facing with eagerness the greatest difficulties. Perhaps because it is these which best satisfy their morbid energy, they seize the strangest connections, the newest and most salient points. And here I may mention that originality, carried to the point of absurdity, is a principal characteristic of insane poets and artists. Ampere always sought out the most difficult problems in mathematics, the abysses, as Arago has noted. Rousseau, in the Devon du Village, had attempted the music of the future, afterwards tried again by another insane genius, Schumann. Swift used to say that he only felt at ease when treating the most difficult subjects, and those most out of the line of his habitual occupations. In fact, in his directions to servants, he seems, not a theologian nor a politician, but a servant himself. His confession of a thief was believed to have been really written by a well-known criminal, so that the latter's accomplices, thinking that they were discovered, gave themselves up to justice. In the prophecies of Biggerstaff, he assumed the character of a Catholic and succeeded in deceiving the Roman Inquisition. Walt Whitman is a creator of a rhymeless poetry, which the Anglo-Saxons regard as a poetry of the future, and which certainly bears the imprint of strange and wild originality. Poe's compositions, says Baudelaire, one of his greatest admirers, seem to have been produced in order to show that strangeness may enter into the elements of the beautiful, and he collected them under the title of arabesques and grotesques, because these exclude the human countenance, and his literature was extra-human. Here too we note the predilection of insane artists for arabesques, and moreover for arabesques which suggest the human figure. Baudelaire himself created the prose poem, and carried to the highest point of adoration of artificial beauty. He was the first to find new poetic associations in the olfactory sense. 9. These morbid geniuses have a style peculiar to themselves, passionate, palpitating, vividly coloured, which distinguishes them from all other writers, perhaps because it could only arise under maniacal influences, so much so that all of them confess their inability to compose or even to think outside the moments of inspiration. Tasso wrote in one of his letters, I am unsuccessful and find difficulty in everything, especially in composition. My ideas, Rousseau confesses, 
are confused so in arising and developing themselves nor can i express myself well except in moments of passion the eloquent and vivid extordiums of cardan's works so different from the rest of his tedious books shows what a difference there was between the first and last moments of his inspiration haller though a successful poet himself used to say that the whole art of poetry consisted in its difficulty pascal began his eighteenth provincial letter thirteen times perhaps it was this analogy in character and style which was the cause of swift's and rousseau's predilection for tasso and drew the severe heller towards swift while ampere was inspired by rousseau's eccentricities and baudelaire by those of poe whose works he translated and of hoffman who he idolized Ten. nearly all these great men were painfully preoccupied by religious doubts raised by the intellect and combated as a crime by the timid conscious and morbid emotions Tasso was tormented by the fear of being a heretic, and Beer often said that doubts are the worst torture of man. Haller wrote in his journal, My God, give me, oh, give me one drop of faith. My mind believes in thee, but my heart refuses. This is my crime. Lenau used to repeat towards the end of his life, In those hours when my heart is suffering, the idea of God passes away from me. In fact, the real hero of his Savanarola is doubt, as is now admitted by all critics. 11. All insane men of genius, moreover, are much preoccupied with their own ego. They sometimes know and proclaim their own disease, and seem as though they wished, by confessing it, to get relief from his inexorable attacks. It is quite normal that, being men of great intellect and therefore acute observers, they should at last notice their own cruel anomalies and be struck by the spectacle of the ego, which obtruded itself so painfully on their notice men in general but more particularly the insane love to speak of themselves and on this theme they even become eloquent and the more shall be expected in those whose genius is accompanied and quickened by mania it is thus we get those wonderful records of passion and grief monuments of phrenopathic poetry which reveal the great unhappy personality of the writer cardan wrote not only his autobiography but also poems on his misfortunes and the work Dissomnis equally composed of his dreams and hallucinations the poets of whitman are the glorification of the ego rousseau by his confessions dialogues reveries like de musset in his confessions and hoffman in chrysler only give a minute description of themselves in their own madness thus also poe as baudelaire has well remarked took his text the exceptions of human life the hallucination which at first doubtful afterwards became a reasoned conviction absurdity enthroned in the region of intellect and governing it with a terrible logic hysteria occupying the place of the will the contradiction between the nerves and the mind carried so far that grief is driven to utter itself in laughter pascal who is driven by delirium into exaggerated humility who has said that christianity suppressed the ego has not written his autobiography yet he who shows traces of his hallucinations in the celebrated amulet and in his pensees subtly described himself when speaking of others it is certain that he was alluding to himself when he wrote that extreme genius is close to extreme folly and that men are so mad that he who should not be so would be a madman of a new kind and when he observed that maladies influence our judgment and sense and while great ones perceptibly alter them even slight ones cannot but influence them in proportion and that men of genius have their heads higher but their feet lower than the rest of us they are all on the same level and stand on the same clay as ourselves children and brutes Heller, in his diary, gives detailed notes of his own religious delusions, and often confesses to having completely changed his character in the course of twenty-four hours, and being giddy, mad, persecuted by God, and scorned and despised by men. Lessman, who, at a later time, hanged himself, wrote the humorous diary of a melancholiac, 1834. Tasso, in his letter to the Duke of Urbino, and in the stanza already quoted, clearly depicted his own insanity francesco he says elsewhere o francesco within my infirm limbs i have an infirm soul it is a curious fact that shortly before his first attack of mania he wrote these words as i do not deny that i am mad i must believe that my madness has been caused by drunkenness or love since i know well that i drink to excess etc dostoevsky continually introduces semi-insane characters and especially epileptics in Bessai and the idiot the moral lunatics of crime and punishment Gerard de Nerval was the author of Aurelia, which has been well called the Song of Songs of Fever, and is a mixture of poetry and gibberish. Barbara wrote Les Détruges, 
Buston described his own hallucinations. Alex, though not a medical man, wrote on the treatment of the insane. The now twelve years before he actually succumbed to the attacks of insanity, had for sin described it. All his poems depict, in colours painfully vivid, suicidal melancholic tendencies. Reader may judge of this from the mere titles of some of his lyrics. To a hypochondriac. The madman. The diseased soul. The violence of a dream. The moon of melancholy. I do not think that it is possible to find in the most doleful pages of J. Walter's so accurately and vividly coloured a description of suicidal tendencies as in the former extract from Seal and Crank. I carry a deep wound in my heart. I will carry it in silence to the grave. My life is broken from hour to hour. One alone can comfort me. But she lies in the grave. O oh, my mother, let myself be moved by my entreaties. If thy love still survive death, it is still permitted thee to care for thy child. O oh, let me soon escape from life. I long for the night of death. Oh, only help the crazy son to lay aside his grief. His tranquil then is, as I reobserved, a terrible truthful picture of that hallucination which preceded or accompanied the first attack of suicidal mania, and here the reader can easily trace in the phrases and ideas that disconnected the fragmentary character which is the mark of the delirious paralytic. Here is a specimen. The dream was so terrible, so wild, so frightful, that I wish I could tell myself it was nothing but a dream. Yet I continue to weep, and to feel that my heart beats. I awaken and find the sheets and pillow wet. Did I seize them in my dream and wipe my face? I do not know. While I was sleeping, my hostile guests have been holding an orgy there. Now they are gone. Those savages, they are gone. But I find their traces in my tears. They have fled, and left the wine on the table, etc. He had previously, in the Albigenses, dropped some allusions to the terrible impression made on him by his dreams. Terrible, often in the bite of dreams, it shakes, pains, presses, threatens, and in sleep it does not awaken in time, if the twinkle of an eye, he is a corpse. 12. The principal trace of the delusions of great minds is found in the very construction of their works and speeches, in their illogical deductions, absurd contradictions, and grotesque and human fantasies. Thus Socrates was clearly of unsound mind, when, after having all but arrived, intuitively, at Christian morality and Judaic monotheism, he directed his steps in accordance with the sneeze, or the voice and signs of his imaginary genius. Thus Cardan, who had anticipated Newton in discovering the laws of gravitation and dubious in theology, who in his book De Subtilitate explains as hallucinations the strange and portentous symptoms of the possessed, and also of some of those hermits who are accounted saints, carrying them with the delirium of quiet and fever. Cardan was insane when he attributed to the influence of a genius not only his scientific inspirations, but the creaking of the table and the vibration of the pen, when he declared that he had been several times bewitched, and when he produced his book on dreams, which speaks to the mental pathologist as a suedo membrane would to the physical. In this, at first, he puts on record the most accurate and curious observations of the phenomena of dreams, e.g., how severe physical pains act with less energy, slight ones are greater, a fact recently confirmed by psychiatrists that the insane are much given to dreaming, that in a dream, as on the stage, a long series of ideas passes in a very short space of time, and finally, and this is a remark of much justice, the men have dreams either entirely analogous to, or entirely at variance with, their own habits. But of these clear and undoubted proofs of genius, he reaffirms one of the most absurd and contemptible theories ever held by the populace of ancient times namely that the slightest accidental circumstance of a dream must be the revelation of a more or less distant future. Thus he draws up, with the sincerest conviction, a dictionary identical in form and origin, which lusts undoubtedly pathological with cabalistic productions. Every object, every word, which may find a place at a dream, is there attached to a series of illusions which serve to interpret each other. Father may signify author, husband, son, commander. Feet, foundation of a house, arts, workmen, etc. A horse appearing in a dream may signify flight, riches, or a wife. Shoemaker and physician are interchangeable in meaning. In short, it is not actual analogies which prevail, but analogies in words, in sounds, even in terminations. Orior and morior have an equal prophetic value, because, since they differ from each other only by a single letter, the one passes over to the other. We are seized with a compassion for human nature and for ourselves, and we find him relating that a knight 
who suffered from the stone always if he dreamed of food an attack on the following day and adding quibbles in them et dolores de gustera dicamas as no nature were in the habit of amusing herself by making puns in latin yet this was a man who had intuitively divided the admirable theory of painful sensations in sleep already alluded to and who a physician and one of no mean distinction had clearly conceived the sympathetic action of the solar plexus newton himself can scarcely be said to have been sane when he demanded his intellect to the interpretation of the apocalypse or the horns of daniel nor again when he wrote to bentley by means of the law of attraction one can very well understand the elongated orbits of comets but as to the nearly circular orbits of planets i see no possibility of obtaining their lateral difference this can only be accomplished by god yet in his optics newton had inveighed against those who after the manner of the aristotelians admit occult properties in matter thus arresting the researches of natural philosophers without leading to any conclusion in fact a century later the true cause which had escaped newton's observations was discovered by laplace ampere believed in all sincerity that he had found the method of squaring a circle Bascal, though he had been the first to study the laws of probability believed that the touch of a relic had power to cure a lacrimal fistula a statement which he printed in one of his works rousseau makes of his own maniacal savagery the ideal type of man and believes that every natural production if agreeable to the sight or taste must be nauseous so that arsenic according to him could not be harmful his life is made up of contradictions he prefers the country and lives in the rue platinier he writes a treatise on education and sends his children to the foundling hospital he educates on the claims of the various religions with the acuteness of an unbiased sceptic and throws stones at trees in order to divine the future and decide the question of his own salvation nay he writes to the deity and lays his letters on the altars of churches as though they were his exclusive abode baudelaire finds the sublime in the artificial like the rogue which enhances the beauty of a handsome woman he carries out an insane idea by describing a metallic landscape with neither water nor vegetation all is rigid polished shining without heat and without sun in the midst of the internal silence the blue water is enclosed like the ancient mirrors in a golden basin he finds his ideal in the latin of the decadence the only tongue which can thoroughly render the language of passion and adores cats to such a degree as to address three poems to them lenau in his moon of the hypochondriac sees contrary to the usual practice of poets in the cold moon without water and without atmosphere the sexton of the planets who with a silver thread entwined enchains the sleepers and draws them to death she beckons with her finger leads sleepwalkers astray and counsels the thief though as a young man he had frequently expressed his opinion that mysticism is a symptom of insanity he often showed mystical tendencies especially in his later poems in the koran there is not a single chapter which has any connection with another on the contrary it often happens that in the course of a single surah the ideas are interrupted and follow each other almost at random o mohammed writes morkos the most contradictory vertex may be pronounced for it is impossible to deny his great excellence while at the same time there is no disguising the fact that we find in him the most signal artifices of imposture the grossest ignorance and the greatest imprudence it appears to me moreover that the great writers who have been under the dominion of alcohol have a style peculiar to themselves whose characteristics are deliberate eroticism and an inequality which is rather grotesque than beautiful owing to the unrestrained fancy frequent imprecations and abrupt transitions from the deepest melancholy to obscene gaiety and a marked preference for such subjects as madness drink and the gloomiest scenes of death poe says baudelaire likes to place his figures against greenish or violet backgrounds surrounded by the phosphorescence of decay and the atmosphere of storms and orgies he throws himself into grotesquerie for the love of the grotesque into horror for the love of the horrible the same thing is done by baudelaire himself who loves to describe the effects of alcohol or opium there are days when my heart faints in me and the mud overwhelms me sang poor praga who killed himself with alcohol and who singing the praises of wine blasphemed thus let it come the reproach of the sober man come the contempt of the human race come the hell of the eternal father i will go down into it with my glass in hand steen the drunken painter usually painted drinking scenes hoffman's drawings ended in caricatures his tales in extra human extravagancies his music in a senseless succession of sounds alfred de musset saw in the lays of madrid sus an cold de signe un sin verge et dore coma la joie vigne 
Moger admired women with green lips and yellow cheeks, no doubt through a species of colour blindness, such as we have already met with among painters. 13. Nearly all of these great men, for instance, Cardin, Lenau, Tasso, Socrates, Pascal, attach great importance to their dreams, which no doubt assumed a more vivid and powerful colouring than those of sane persons. 14. Many presented voluminous but very irregular skulls, and like madmen, have ended by serious alterations of the nervous centres. Pascal's cerebral substance was harder than is normally the case, and left lobe had separated. The brain of Rassau revealed dropsy in the ventricles. Byron and Foscolo, great by centric geniuses, both showed premature ossification of the sutures. Schumann died of chronic meningitis and cerebral atrophy. 15. The insane characters of men of genius are scarcely ever found alone. Thus melancholia was associated and alternated with exaggerated self-esteem in Chopin, Comte, Tasso, Cardin, Schopenhauer, with alcoholic mania, impulsive insanity or sexual aversion in Baudelaire and Russell, with erratic and alcoholic mania, and that of self-esteem in Gerard de Nerval, in Coleridge. The mania of Morphia was associated with Folie du Dabt. 16. But the most special characteristic of this form of insanity appears to reduce itself to an extreme exaggeration of two alternating phases, viz. erethism, anatomy, inspiration and exhaustion, which we see physiologically manifested in nearly all great intellects, even the sanest, phrases to which they, or the like, give a wrong interpretation, according as their pride is gratified or offended. An indolent soul, afraid of every kind of business, a bilious temperament, which suffers easily and is sensitive to every discomfort, seem as though they could not be combined in one character, yet they form the groundwork of mine, such as Rousseau's confession in Letter 2. Therefore, as the ignorant man explains the modifications of his own ego by means of material and external objects, they often attribute to a devil, a genius, or a god, the happy inspiration of the exalted moments. Tasso, speaking of his familiar spirit, genius, or messenger, says, it cannot be a devil, since it does not inspire me with a horror for sacred things, nor yet a natural creature, for it causes to arise in me ideas which I never had before. A genius inspires Cardan with his written works, his knowledge of spiritual matters, his medical opinions, Tartini with his sonata, Mohammed with the pages of the Quran. Van Helmont asserted that he had seen a genius appear before him at all the most important moments of his life, and in 1633 he discovered his own soul, under the form of a shining crystal. William Blake often retired to the seashore to converse with Moses, Homer, Virgil, and Milton, with whom he believed himself to have been previously acquainted. When questioned as to their appearance, he replied, They are shades full of majesty, grey but luminous, and much taller than the generality of men. Socrates was counselled in his actions by a genius who, as he expressed it, was better than ten thousand teachers, and he often advised his friends as to what they ought or ought not to do according as he had received instructions of his daimonion. It is certain that the vivid and richly coloured style of all these great men, the clearness with which they describe their most grotesque eccentricities, such as the Lilliputian academies, or the horrors of Tartarus, denote that they saw and touched, as it were, with a certainty of hallucination, all that they describe, that in short, in them inspiration and insanity became fused, and resulted in a single product. It may be said, indeed, of some, as of Luther, Mohammed, Savonarola, Millions, and at modern times the chief of the taping rebels, that the false explanation of the Afflites was a great service to them, giving to their speeches and prophecies that air of truth, only resulting in a profound conviction, which alone can shake the popular ignorance and carry it in the wake of a new doctrine. This characteristic is common to the insanity of genius and the most trivial aberrations of eccentricity. When inspiration and high spirits fail together, and depression of mind prevails, then these great unfortunate ones, interpreting their own conditions still more strangely, believe themselves to have been poisoned, like Cardam, or to be condemned to internal fire, like Haller and Pierre, who were persecuted by inveterate enemies, like Newton, Swift, Barthes, Cardin, and Rousseau. Moreover, in all these cases, religious doubt, raised by the intellect, in despite of the hurt, appears to the subject himself as a crime, and becomes both cause and instrument of new and real misfortunes. 18. Yet the temper of these men is so different from that of the average people that it gives a special character to the different psychosis, melancholia, monomania, etc., from which they suffer, 
so as to constitute a special psychosis which might be called the psychosis of genius end of section sixteen section seventeen of the man of genius by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter two analogy of sane to insane genius want of character pride precocity alcoholism degenerative signs obsession men of genius and revolutions but these characteristics are not confined to insane genius there are some men with though far less conspicuously among the great men freest from any suspicion of insanity those of whom the insane geniuses just mentioned are but the exaggeration and caricature it is thus set the complete and perfect character while conspicuously seen in socrates columbus gavour christ galileo spinoza is not to be found in napoleon bacon cicero seneca alcibiades alexander julius caesar machiavelli carlyle frederick the second dumas byron comte balwer lytton petrarch aretino gibbon self-esteem carried to an almost incredible point has been noticed in napoleon Hegel, dante victor hugo la Salle, balzac and comte and as we have already seen even in men of talent but not of genius as cagnoli lucius porter etc precocity moreover does not fail to appear in normal men of genius such as mozart raphael michelangelo charles twelfth stuart mill d'alembert lully cowley otway prior pope addison burns keats sheffield hugo among these we also find the abuse of alcohol sexual deficiencies or excesses followed by sterility the tendency to vagrancy and impulsive acts of violence alternating or associated with convulsive movements bismarck once said to Beust, do you ever feel the wish to break anything as an amusement like gladstone and the belgian malin he often takes exercise by cutting down trees like a woodman we have also found in some of them numerous anomalies in the shape of the skull and conformation of the brain degenerative symptoms such as stammering left-handedness precocity sterility abound above as well as divergences from ancestral character there is also seen in them that invasion or rather possession by their subject which transforms the creature of the imagination into the true hallucination or an order suggestion flaubert says that his character seized upon him and pursued him or that more correctly speaking he lived through them when he described the poisoning of madame bovary he felt the taste of arsenic on his tongue and showed symptoms of actual poisoning so far as to vomit dickens too was affected by sorrow and compassion for his characters as if they had been his own children to my mind writes edmond de concourt my brother died of overwork and more especially the elaboration of literary form the chiselling of phrases the labour of style i can still see him taking up again pieces which we had written together and which at first had satisfied us working in them for hours for half a day at a time with an almost angry persistency you must remember in short that all our work and in this perhaps consists its originality and originality dearly bought as its roots in nervous illness that we drew our pictures of disease from our own experience and that by dint of analyzing studying dissecting ourselves we at last attained a kind of super acute sensitiveness which was wounded on all sides by the infinite littleness of life i say we for when we wrote charles de Maly, i was more diseased than he alas he took the first place later on charles de Maly, it is a strange thing to write one's own history fifteen years in advance the obsession of genius sometimes attains such a point as actually to create a double personality and transform a philanthropist into an overbearing tyrant a melancholy man to a jovial reveller finally we have found even in the sanest most complete genius the incomplete and rudimentary forms of mania as melancholy megalomania hallucinations etc a fact which helps to explain the convictions of certain prophets and founders of dynasties convictions so deeply rooted as to serve the purpose of inspiration so far as the mass of the people were concerned Mosley says that one of the conditions essential to the originality of genius is a disposition to be dissatisfied with the existing state of things we have also met with the use of peculiar words which is so frequent a characteristic of modern mania and also those uncertainties which reach our extreme point to the madness of doubt the whole difference resolves itself at bottom into this 
that insane genius the symptoms are less exaggerated the double personality is less conspicuous the choice of subjects connected with madness less frequent shakespeare concord and dubdad being exceptions and the note of absurdity less emphasized this however is scarcely ever wanting inasmuch as nothing is closer to the ridiculous than the sublime it is also not without importance to note that whenever genius appears in a race the number of the insane also increases of this fact we have found remarkable proofs among the italian german and english jews so much is this the case that it is the custom in germanic lunatic asylums to reckon genius in the parents among the atheological elements of insanity both genius and insanity are influenced by violent passions at the time of conception by advanced age or alcoholism in the parents and as in all degenerate natures genius is only exceptionally transmitted it almost always assumes the form of more and more aggravated neurosis and rapidly disappears thanks to that beneficent sterility through which nature provides for the elimination of monsters though all the proofs we have given should have been forgotten the fact will be quite sufficiently demonstrated by the pedigrees of peter the great the caesars and charles v in which epileptics men of genius and criminals alternate with other greater frequency to the line ends in idiocy and sterility in all these three types insanity insane genius insane genius we see at work with nearly equal intensity the influence of race of what climates of diminutions unless greatly exaggerated in the degree of atmospheric pressure and in frequent cases of maladies accompanied by a high temperature but the most convincing proof of all is offered by the insane who though not possessed of genius apparently acquire it for a time while under treatment these cases prove that geniality originality artistic and aesthetic creation may show themselves in the least predisposed natures as a consequence of mental alienation finally note the least important proof is contained in the singular phenomenon of the matoid who is distinguished from the really insane has all the appearances without the reality of genius taking all this into consideration we may confidently affirm that genius is a true degenerative psychosis belonging to a the group of moral insanity and may temporarily spring out of other psychoses assuming their forms though keeping its own special peculiarities which distinguish it from all others the identity of genius with moral insanity is seen in that general alteration of the affective instincts which shows itself more or less disguised in all even in those rare altruistic persons with a genius for goodness to whom the name of saints has been given this also explains their longevity there is beyond all doubt some connection between all these observations and the fact established by tamburini and myself that the best artists of the asylum were all morally insane it should be remembered here that the clips were brigands and that the moral character of many great conquerors has been so far subject to alteration as to make of them true brigands on a large scale arved Barain, in noticing the beauty of countenance of certain brigands figured in my work in le humo delinquete has very justly observed that such a profession requires high intellectual endowments and precisely the same as those needed by conquerors who certainly have had no superabundance of moral sense history proves that the moral sense is in no degree a function of the intellect great men have been so often devoid of it that the world has been forced to invent for them a special morality which may be summed up in five words frequently uttered by such from napoleon down to bienvieto cellini everything is permitted to genius Many of genius are among the principal factors in true revolutions. History records a saying of Tarquin that for the preservation of despotism it was necessary to cut down the tallest heads. Carlyle believed that the whole of history is that of great men. Emerson wrote that every new institution might be regarded as a prolonged shadow of some man of genius. Islamism of Mahomet, Protestantism of Calvin, Quakerism of Fox, Methodism of Wesley, Abolitionism of Clarkson, etc. Men of genius, wrote Fulbert summarized in a single type may separate personalities and bring new persons to consciousness in the human race this is one of the causes of their immense influence and not only are they not mere synistic they are haters of old things and ardent lovers of the new and the unknown garibaldi when he pushed on into almost unknown regions of america said i love the unknown and christ carried his idea of the new world that was about to appear as far as complete communism many men of genius rule beyond the tomb caesar was never so powerful good michelet as when he was a corpse and so william the silent max nordau even claims that all human progress is owing to despots of genius 
every revolution is the work of a minority whose individuality cannot conform to conditions which were neither calculated nor created for them the only real innovators known to history are tyrants endowed with ability and knowledge no revolution succeeds without a leader wrote machiavelli and elsewhere a minute without a head is useless this is natural because the man of genius being essentially original and a lover of originality is a natural enemy of traditions and conservatism he is the born revolutionary the precursor and the most active pioneer of revolutions end of section seventeen section eighteen of the man of genius by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 3. The Epileptoid Nature of Genius. Aetology. Symptoms. Confessions of Men of Genius. The Life of a Great Epileptic. Napoleon, St. Paul, the Saints, Philanthropic Hysteria. We may, however, enter more deeply into the study of the phenomena of genius by the light of modern theories on epilepsy. According to the entirely harmonious researches of clinical and experimental observers, this malady resolves itself into localized irritation on the cerebral cortex, manifesting itself in attacks which are sometimes instantaneous, sometimes of a longer duration, but always intermittent and always resting on a degenerative basis, either hereditary or predisposed to irritation by alcoholic influence, by lesions in the skull, etc. In this way we catch a glimpse of another conclusion, viz., the creative power of genius may be a form of degenerative psychosis belonging to the family of epileptic affections the fact that genius is frequently derived from parents either addicted to drink of advanced age or insane certainly points to this conclusion as also does the appearance of genius subsequently to lesions of the head it is also indicated by frequent anomalies especially of cranial asymmetry the capacity of the skull being sometimes excessive sometimes abnormally small by the frequency of moral insanity and of hallucinations by sexual and intellectual precocity and not rarely by somnambulism to these we may add the prevalence of suicide which is on the other hand very common among epileptic patients the intermittence of bodily and mental functions more particularly the occurrence of amnesia and analgesia the frequent tendency to vagabondage religious feeling manifesting itself even in the case of atheists as with comte the strange terrors by which they are often seized w scott byron heller the double personality the multiplicity of spontaneous delusions so common epileptic cases the frequent recurrence of delusions produced by the most trifling causes the same misonism the same relation to criminality which finds its point of union in moral insanity and to this the origin and ancestry of criminals and imbeciles which constantly show traces both of genius and epilepsy as may be seen in the genealogical charts given of the families of the caesars and charles v and the strange passion for wandering and for animals which i have often found in degenerated and especially in epileptic subjects the distractions of mind for which great men are so famous are often writes tonini nothing else but epileptic absences the greatest proof of all however is that effective insensibility and loss of moral sense common to all men of genius whether sane or insane which makes of great conquerors even in the most recent times nothing else than brigands on a large scale such conclusions may seem strange to persons unacquainted with the way in which the region of epilepsy has been extended in modern times so that many cases of headache hemicrenia or simple loss of memory are now recognized as forms of epilepsy though in disguise the manifestation as savage has observed causing disappearance of every trace of the pre-existing epilepsy it is sufficient however to recall to the reader the numerous men of genius of the first order who have been seized by motory epilepsy or by that kind of morbid irritability which is well known to supply its place among these we find such names as Napoleon, moliere julius caesar petrarch peter the great mahomet handel swift reculeau charles v flabert dostoevsky and st paul to those acquainted with the so-called binominal or serial law according to which no phenomenon occurs singly each one being on the contrary the expression of a series of less well-defined but analogous facts such frequent occurrence of epilepsy among the most distinguished or distinguished men can but indicate a greater prevalence of this disease among men of genius than was previously thought possible 
and suggests a hypothesis of the epileptoid nature of genius itself. In this connection, it is important to note how, in these men, the convulsive made its appearance, but rarely in the course of their lives. Now it is well known that, in such cases, the psychic equivalent, here the exercise of creative power, is more frequent and intense. But above all, the identity is proved to us by the analogy of the epileptic seizure with the moment of inspiration. This active and violent unconsciousness in the one case manifests itself by creation and the other by motory agitation. The demonstration is completed when we come to analyse this creative inspiration or oestrus, which has often suggested epilepsy, even to those ignorant of the recent discoveries with regard to its nature, and this, not only on account of its frequent association with insensibility to pain, with the regularity of the pulse, and with an unconsciousness which is often that of a somnambulist, of its instantaneous occurrence in a dramatic character, but also because it is not seldom accompanied by convulsive movements of the limbs, followed by amnesia, and provoked by substances or conditions which cause or increase the excessive flow of blood to the brain, or by powerful sensations, and also because it may succeed or pass into hallucinations. This resemblance between inspiration and the epileptic seizure, moreover, is demonstrated by an even directer and more cotton proof. The confessions of eminent men of genius, which show how completely the one may be confounded with the other, such confessions are those of Concord and Buffon, and especially Mohammed and Dostoevsky. There are moments, writes the latter in Bessie, that it is only a matter of five or six seconds when you suddenly feel the presence of the internal harmony. This phenomenon is neither terrestrial nor celestial, but it is an indescribable something which man, in his mortal body, can scarcely endure. He must either undergo a physical transformation or die. It is a clear, indisputable feeling all at once. You feel as though you are placed in contact with the whole of nature, and you say, Yes, this is true. When God created the world, he said, at the end of every day of creation, Yes, this is true, this is good, and it is not tenderness, nor yet joy. You not forgive anything, because there is nothing to forgive. Neither do you love. Oh, this feeling is higher than love. The terrible feeling is the frightful clearness with which it manifests itself, and the rapture with which it fills you. If this state were to last more than five seconds, the soul could not endure it, and would have to disappear. During those five seconds, I live a whole human existence, and for that I would give my whole life, and not think I was paying it too dearly. Are you an epileptic? No. You will become so. I have heard that it begins just in that way. A man subject to this malady has minutely described to me the sensation which precedes the attack, and in listening to you, I thought I heard him speaking. He too spoke of a period of five seconds, and said it was impossible to endure this condition longer. I remember Mahomet's water jar for the space of time until to empty it. The prophet was wrapped into paradise. Your five seconds are the jar. Paradise is your harmony. And Muhammad was epileptic. Take care, you do not become so also. Kirillov. And in The Idiot, Volume 1, page 296. I remember, among other things, a phenomenon which used to precede his epileptic attacks when they came on in a waking state in the midst of the dejection, the mental marasmus, the anxiety which the madman experienced. There were moments in which, all of a sudden, his brain became inflamed, and all his vital forces suddenly rose to a prodigious degree of intensity. The sensation of life, the conscious existence, was multiplied almost tenfold in these swiftly passing moments. A strange light illuminated his heart and mind. All agitation was calmed, all doubt and perplexity resolved itself into a superior harmony, a serene and tranquil gaiety, which yet was completely rational. But these radiant moments were only a prelude to the last incident, then immediately succeeded by the attack. That incident was, in truth, ineffable. When at a later time, after his recovery, the prince reflected on this subject, he said to himself, those fleeting moments in which our highest consciousness of ourselves, and therefore our highest life, is manifested, are due only to disease, to the suspension of normal conditions, and if so, it is not a higher life, but on the contrary, of a lower order. This, however, did not prevent his reaching a most paradoxical conclusion. What matter, after all, there would be a disease, at abnormal tension, if the result, as I, with recovered health, remember and analyse it, includes the very highest degree of harmony and beauty? If at this moment I have an unspeakable, hitherto 
unsuspected feeling of harmony of peace of my whole nature being fused in the impetus of prayer with the highest synthesis of life this farrago of nonsense seemed to the prince perfectly comprehensible and the only fault it had in his eyes was that of being too feeble a rendering of his thoughts he could not doubt or even admit the possibility of doubt of the real existence of this condition of beauty and prayer or of its constituting the highest synthesis of life but did he not in these moments experience visions analogous to the fantastic and debasing dreams produced by the intoxication of opium hashish or wine he was able to form a sane judgment on this point when the morbid condition had ceased these moments were only distinguished to define them in a word by the extraordinary heightening of the inward sense even in that instant that is to say in the last moment of consciousness which precedes the attack the patient was able to say clearly and with full consciousness of the import of his words yes for this moment one would give a whole lifetime there is no doubt that as far as he alone was concerned that moment was worth a lifetime no doubt too it is to this same instant that the epileptic mohammed allude when he said that he used to visit all the abodes of allah in less time than it would take to empty his water jar i will add here some lines from the correspondence of lobert if sensitive nerves are enough to make a poet i should be worth more than shakespeare and homer i have heard through closed doors people talking in low tones thirty paces away across whose abdomen one may see all the viscera throbbing and who have sometimes felt in the space of a minute a million thoughts images and combinations of all kinds throwing themselves into my brain at once as it were the lighted squibs of fireworks let us now compare these descriptions of an attack which might be called one of psychic epilepsy and which corresponds exactly to the physiological idea of epilepsy i.e cortical irritation with all the descriptions given us by authors themselves of the inspiration of genius we should then see how perfect is the correspondence between the two sets of phenomena in order the better to illustrate these strange displacements of functions in epileptic subjects i should call attention to an example cited by dr frigerio of an epileptic patient who at the moment of seizure felt the venereal desire awaken not in the generative organs but in the epigastrium accompanied by ejaculation let me add that in certain cases it is not only isolated paroxysms which recall the psychic phenomenology of the epileptic but the whole life bolger remarks that for the concords life reduces itself to a series of epileptic attacks preceded and followed by a blank and what the goncourts wrote has always been autobiography zola in his romancius naturalistis gives us the confessions of Balzac. he works under the influence of circumstances of which the union is a mystery he does not belong to himself he is the plaything of a force which is eminently capricious on some days he would not touch his brush he would not write a line for an empire in the evening when dreaming in the morning when rising in the midst of some joyous feast it happens that a burning coal suddenly touches his brain these hands this tongue a word awakens ideas that are born grow ferment such is the artist the humble instrument of a despotic will he obeys a master let us glance at the pictures which taine has given us of the greatest of modern conquerors and renan of the greatest of the apostles the principal characteristics of napoleon's genius says taine are its originality and comprehensiveness no detail escapes him the quality of facts which his mind stores up and retains the number of ideas which he elaborates and utters seem to surpass human capacity in the art of ruling men his genius was supreme his method of procedure which is that of the experimental sciences consisted in controlling every theory by a precise application observed under definite conditions all his sayings are fire flashes adultery said he to the conseil de that when the question of divorce was under discussion is not exceptional it is very common siesta on the de canape liberty he exclaimed on another occasion and he remained faithful all his life to the spirit of this exclamation it is a necessity of a small and privileged class endowed by nature with faculties higher than those of the mass of mankind it may therefore be abridged with impunity equality on the contrary pleases the multitude he possesses a faculty which carries us back to the middle ages an astounding constructive imagination what he accomplished is surprising but he undertook far more and dreamed much more even than that however vigorous his practical faculties may have been his poetic faculty was still stronger 
it was even greater than it ought to have been in a statesman we see greatness in him exaggerated to into immensity and immensity degenerated into madness what aspiring monstrous conceptions revolved accumulated supersede each other in their marvellous brain here be said is a molehill there have never been great empires or great revolutions save at the east where there are six hundred millions of men in egypt he was thinking of conquering syria re-establishing the eastern empire at constantinople and returned to paris by way of andrianople and vienna the east allured him with the mirage omnipotence in the east he caught a glimpse of the possibility that a new mahomet he might found a new religion confined to europe his dream was to recreate the empire of charlemagne to make paris the physical intellectual and religious capital of europe and assemble within its precincts the princes kings and popes who should have become his vassals by way of russia he would then advance towards the ganges and the supremacy of india the artist enclosed within the politician as issued from his sheath he creates in the religion of the ideal and the impossible we know him for what he is a posthumous brother of dante and michelangelo only these two worked on paper and in marble it was a living man sensitive and suffering flesh that formed his material napoleon differs from the modern men in character as much to the contemporaries of dante and michelangelo the sentiments habits and morality professed by him are the sentiments habits and morality of the fifteenth century i am not a man like other men he exclaimed the laws of morality and decorum are not made for me me distal and said how compared napoleon psychologically to the lesser tyrants of the fourteenth century savorza and castruccio castracani such in fact he was on the evening of the twelfth vendemeyer being present at the preparations made by the sections he said to junot ah if the sections would only place me at their head i would answer for it that they should be in the chalets within two hours then all these wretched conventionalists out of it five hours later being called to the assistance of barras and the convention he opened fire on the parisians like a good condottier who does not give but lends himself to the first who offers to the highest bidder reserving for himself full liberty of action and the power of seizing everything should the occasion present itself never even among the bordiers and malatestas was there a more sensitive and impulsive brain capable of such electric accumulations and discharges in him no idea remained purely speculative each one as it occurred had a tendency to embody itself in action and would have done so if not prevented by force sometimes the outburst was so sudden that restraint did not come in time one day in egypt he upset a decanter of water over a lady's dress and taking her into his own room under the pretext of remedying the accident remained there with her for some time too long while the other guests seated around the table waited gazing at each other on another occasion he threw prince lewis violently out of the room on yet another he kicked senator volney in the stomach at cambo vormino he threw down and broke a china ornament to put an end to the resistance of the austrian plenipotentiary at dresden in eighteen thirteen when prince Metternich was most necessary to him he asked him brutally how much he received from england for defending her interests never was there a more impatient sensibility he throws garments that do not fit him into the fire his writing when he tries to write is a collection of disconnected and indecipherable characters he dictates so quickly that his secretaries can scarcely follow him if the pen is beat high in hand so much the worse for it if a volley of oaths and exclamations give it time to catch up so much the better his heart and intellect are full to overflowing under pressure like this the extempore orator and the excited controversialists take the place of the statesman my nerves are irritable he said of himself and in fact the tension of accumulated impressions sometimes produced a physical convulsion he was not seldom seen to shed tears under strong emotion napoleon wept not on account of true and deep feeling but because a word an idea by itself is a stimulus which reaches the inmost depth of his nature and certain distractions consequent upon vomitings or fainting fits which caused it is said the loss of general Vedemain's corpse after the battle of dresden though the regular is so powerful the balance of the works is from time to time in danger of being deranged an enormous degree of strength was necessary to coordinate to guide and to dominate passions of such vitality in napoleon this strength is an instinct of extraordinary force and harshness an egoism not inert but active and aggressive and so far developed as to set up in the midst of human society 
a colossal eye which can tolerate no life that is not an appendix or instrument of its own even as a child he showed the germs of this personality he was impatient of all restraint and had no trace of conscience he could brook no rivals beat those who refused to render homes to him and accuse his victims of having beaten him he looks upon the world as a great banquet open to every comer but where to be well served it is necessary for a man to have long arms help himself first and let others take what he leaves one has a hold over man through his selfish patterns fear greed sensuality self-esteem emulation if there are some hard particles in the heap all one has to do is to crush them such was a final conception arrived at by napoleon and nothing could induce him to change it because this conception is conditioned by his character he saw man as he needed to see him his egoism is reflected in his ambition so much a part of his inmost nature that he cannot distinguish it from himself it makes his head swim france is a mistress who is his to enjoy in the exercise of his power he acknowledges neither intermediaries nor rivals nor limits nor hindrances to fill his office with zeal and success it is not enough for him above and beyond the functionary he vindicates the rights of the man all who serve him must extinguish the critical sense in themselves that scarcely audible whispers are a conspiracy or an attack on his majesty he requires of them anything and everything from the manufacture of false austrian and russian banknotes in eighteen o nine to eighteen twelve to the preparation of an infernal machine to blow up the bourbons in eighteen fourteen he knows nothing of gratitude when a man is of no further use to him as a tool he throws him away during a dance he would walk about among the ladies in order to shock them with unpleasant witticisms he was always prying into their private life and related to the empress herself the favours which more or less spontaneously they granted him while still stranger he carried the same methods of proceeding into his relations with sovereigns and ambassadors of foreign states in his correspondence his proclamations his audiences he provoked threatened challenged offended he divulged their real or supposed amorous intrigues the bulletins nine seventeen eighteen nineteen after the battle of jena evidently accused the queen of prussia of having had an intrigue with the emperor alexander and reproaches them with a personal insult to himself in the employment of such or such a man he requires them in short to modify their functional laws he is but a poor opinion of a government who had the power of prohibiting things which may displease foreign governments this is the completest view of napoleon ever given by any historian to any one acquainted with the psychological constitution of the epileptic it becomes clear that taine has here given us the subtlest and precisest pathological diagnosis of a case of psychic epilepsy with its gigantic megalomaniacal illusions its impulses and complete absence of moral sense it is not therefore only in moments of inspiration that genius approaches epilepsy and the same thing may be said of st paul st paul was of low stature but stoutly made his health was always poor on account of a strange infirmity which he caused a thorn in the flesh and which was probably a serious neurosis his moral character was anomalous naturally kind and courteous he became ferocious when excited by passion in the school of gamaliel a moderate pharisee he did not learn moderation as the enthusiastic leader of the young pharisees he was among the fiercest persecutors of the christians hearing that there was a certain number of disciples at damascus he demanded the high priest a warrant for arresting them and left jerusalem in a disturbed state of mind on approaching the pain of damascus at noon he had a seizure evidently of an epileptic nature in which he fell to the ground unconscious soon after this he experienced a hallucination and saw jesus himself who said to him in hebrew paul paul why persecutest thou me for three days seized with fever he neither ate nor drank and saw the phantom of ananias whom as head of the christian community he had come to arrest making signs to him the latter was summoned to his bed and calm immediately returned to the spirit of paul who from that day forward became one of the most fervid christians without desiring any more special instruction as having received a direct revelation from christ himself he regarded himself as one of the apostles added as such to the enormous advantage of the christians the immense dangers occasioned by this haughty and arrogant spirit were compensated a thousand times over by his boldness and originality which would not allow the christian idea to remain within the bounds of a small association of people poor in spirit who would have let it die out like hellenism but so to speak steered boldly out to sea with it in antioch he had an hallucination similar to that of mohammed at a later period 
he felt himself wrapped into the third heaven where he heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter anomalies are also observed in his writings he lets himself be guided by words rather than ideas some one word which he has in his mind overpowers him and draws him off into a series of ideas very far removed from his main subject his digresses are abrupt the development of his ideas is suddenly cut short his sentences are often unfinished no writer was ever so unequal no literature in the world presents a sublime passage like one corinthians thirteen side by side with futile arguments and wearisome detail epilepsy in men of genius therefore is not an accidental phenomenon but true morbus totius substantiae to express it in medical language hence we gather a fresh indication of the epileptoid nature of genius if it seems certain dostoevsky described himself in the idiot we have another example of an epileptic genius whose whole course of life is determined by the psychology peculiar to the epileptic impulsivity double personality childishness which goes back even to the earliest periods of human life and alternates with the prophetic penetration and with morbid altruism and the exaggerated effectivity of the saint this last fact is more important as bearing on the objection that the usual immorality of the epileptic would forbid us to connect this type with that of the saintly character this objection however can be partially eliminated by the researchers bianchi tonini filippi according to whom there are cases though rare sixteen per cent of epileptic patients of good character who is even manifest an exaggerated altruism though accompanied by excessive emotionism hysteria which is closely related to epilepsy and similarly connected with the loss of affectivity often shows us side by side with an exaggerated egoism certain bursts of excessive altruism which at the same time have their source in and depend on a degree of moral insanity and shows us the morbid phenomenon in excessive charity there are some ladies justly observed le grand du soil who though remaining in the world take an ostentatious part in all the good works going on in their parish they collect for the poor work for the orphans visit the sick give alms watch the dead idly solicit the benevolence of others and do a great deal of really helpful work while at the same time neglecting their husbands children and household affairs these women ostentatiously and noisily proclaim their benevolence they set on foot a work of charity with as much ardour as burgers company promoters launch a financial surprise which is a result of hyperbolical dividends they go and come in in constant increasing numbers they instinctively act with a charming tact and delicacy think of everything necessary to be done whether in the midst of private mourning or public catastrophe and affect a blush on receiving tribunes of admiration from grateful sufferers or deeply moved spectators their ready tact and sympathy are surprising and the greater the trouble the more admirably do they seem to rise to the occasion for the paroxysm lasts when their feelings are calmed the benevolent impulse passes away being essentially mobile and spasmodic they cannot do good deliberately and on reflection the charitable hysteric is capable of achieving feats of courage which have been quoted and repeated and even become legendary they have been known to show extraordinary presence of mind resource and courage in saving the inmates of a burning house or in facing an armed mob during a riot if questioned on the following day these heroines will be found in a state of complete prostration and some of them candidly avow they do not know what they have done and were at the time unconscious of danger at a time of cholera epidemic when fear causes such ill-advised and reprehensible derelictions of duty hysterical women have been known to show an extraordinary devotion nothing is repugnant to them nothing revolts their modesty or wearies out their endurance for such persons devotion to others has become a need a necessary expenditure of energy and without knowing it they pathologically play the part of virtue people in general are taken in by it and for the sake of example it is just as well it was this consideration which induced me to ask and obtain a public acknowledgment of the services of a hysterical patient at one time an inmate of a lunatic asylum whose deeds of charity in the district where she lives are truly touching while constantly active in attendance on the sick and spending liberally on their behalf she confines the personal expenditure to what is strictly necessary her dress being the same at all seasons of the year now this lady shows a great variety of hysterical symptoms becomes intensely excited on the slightest occasion sleeps very badly and is a serious invalid lastly in private sorrows the hysterical patient often departs from the normal manifestations of grief at the loss of her children she remains calm serene resigned does not shed a tear thinks everything that ought to be done gives numerous orders 
forgets none of the most painful details imposes on all around her the most dignified attitude and attends the funeral without breaking down people think that this mother is exceptionally gifted and has a courage superior to others this is a mistake she is weaker than they she is suffering from disease in order fully to grasp the seeming paradoxes contained in these conclusions we must remember that many philanthropists love their neighbours but only at a distance and nearly always at the expense of the more physiological more general affections love for the family their country etc we must remember dostoevsky's remark in the brothers karamanzov one page three hundred twenty five that what one can love in one's fellow is a hidden and invisible man as soon as he shows his face love disappears one can love one's fellow men in spirit but only at a distance never close at hand one also recalls stern who was overcome with emotion at the sight of a dead ass and deserted his wife and his mother the great philanthropists such men as beccaria and howard have been harsh fathers and masters even the divine philanthropist was as we have seen hard towards his own family st paul before his conversion distinguished himself by his vehement and cruel persecutions of the christians it is well known how only too often the man of real and fervent religion has to forget his family and make a duty of celibacy and hatred to the other sex thus st liberada was angry with her husband for weeping at parting from their children and according to the legend the mother of baruch replied to her son when during his martyrdom he implored her for water in his anguish thou shouldst desire no water now save that of heaven these cases moreover show that very often exaggerated altruism is itself only a pathological phenomenon a hypertrophy of sentiment accompanied as always happens in cases of hypertrophy by loss and atrophy in other directions we have seen in juan de dios in lazaretti leula and st francis of assisi saint linus showing itself in true psychic polarization as a perfect contrast to the former life in which the tendency to evil was strongly pronounced if we add to these phenomena so frequent in epileptic and hysterical patients all those others of clairvoyance thought transference transposition of the senses facadism mental vision temporary manifestations of genius and monoidism so frequently observed in these maladies phenomena so strange that many scientists unable to explain endeavour to deny them we can demonstrate the hysterical character of saintliness even its least explicable manifestations those miracles End of section eighteen. Section nineteen of the Man of Genius by Caesar Lombroso. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on the volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter four. Same Men of Genius. Their unperceived defects. Reculeau. Sesosteris. Foscolo. Michelangelo. Darwin but a graver objection is that afforded by those few men of genius who have completed their intellectual orbit without aberration neither depressed by misfortune nor thrown out of their course by madness such have been galileo leonardo da vinci voltaire machiavelli michelangelo darwin each one of these showed by the ample volume and at the same time the symmetrical proportion of the skull force of intellect restrained by the calm of the desires not one of them allowed his great passion for truth and beauty to stifle the love of family and country they never changed their faith or character never swerved from their aim never left their work half completed what assurance what faith what ability they showed in their undertakings and above all what moderation and unity of character they preserved in their lives though they too had to experience after undergoing the sublime paroxysm of inspiration the torture inflicted by ignorant hatred and the discomfort of uncertainty and exhaustion they never on that account deviated from the straight road they carried out to the end the one cherished idea which formed the aim and purpose of their lives calm and serene never complaining of obstacles and falling into a few mistakes mistakes which in lesser men might even have passed for discoveries but i have already answered in the opening pages of this book the objection furnished by these rare exceptions pointing out that epilepsy and moral insanity which is its first variety often pass unobserved not only in distinguished men the prestige of whose name and work dazzles our judgment and prevents our discerning them but in those criminals to whom such researches might at least restore self-respect by depriving them of all responsibility who but for 
the revelations of some of his intimate friends would have suspected that cavour was repeatedly subject to attacks of suicidal mania or thought that Raikalu was epileptic no one would have paid any attention to the morbid impulsiveness of foscolo or recorded as a symptom if davies not examined his skull after death who could make any assertion with regard to the moral sense of cesorstis yet as arved barain justly remarks his skull clearly corresponds with the criminal type the low and narrow forehead prominent superciliary arc thick eyebrows eyes set close together long narrow aquiline nose hollow temples projecting cheekbones strong jaws the expression not intelligent but animal fierce proud and majestic the head small and proportioned to the body are all so many indications of the most complete absence of moral sense in all the biographies of michelangelo we do not discover one spot on that gentle yet robust soul who trembled for the sorrows of his country as at the expression of beauty but the publication of his letters and the keen researches of parle greco have revealed physical anomalies never before suspected one of the most important is his complete indifference to women this may be observed in his works and his masterpieces were all masculine moses lorenzo giuliano de medici etc he never used it appears the living female model though he made use of corpses his bacchanet is a virago with masculine muscles unformed breasts and no feminine touch in his many love sonnets written rather to follow the prevailing fashion than from any true inspiration of passion none bear the mark of being addressed to real women only fourteen times it is said does the word donna occur on the other hand in the barbera collection sonnets eighteen and twelve show a very marked admiration for the male and varcai considers that these are addressed to cavallere who was of great physical beauty there are in existence two of his letters addressed to cavallere july twenty eighth fifteen twenty three july twenty eighth fifteen thirty two which seem to be written to a mistress and in which humiliating himself he swears that if banished from the other's heart he will die there is a similar letter written to angelini this moral anomaly which he would share with many artists cellini sodoma etc is not the only one to meet with in his letters writes paradella greco may be seen constant contradictions between ideas that are great and generous and others which are puerile between will and speech between thought and action extreme irritability inconstant affection great activity in doing good sudden sympathies great outbursts of enthusiasm great fears sometimes unconsciousness of his own actions marvellous modesty in the field of art unreasonable vanity in the appearance of life these are the various psychical manifestations in life of buonarotti which lead me to believe that the great artist was affected by a neuropathic condition bordering on hysteria every day in his old age he discovered some sin in his past life and he sent money to france for masses to be said and for arms to the poor and to enable poor girls to be married and which is stranger to be made nuns all of this was to gain paradise letter one hundred eighty seven two hundred fourteen two hundred forty three hundred thirty to save his soul he who had said it is not strange that the monks should spoil a chapel at the vatican since they have known how to spoil the whole world at some moments he feels that his conscience is clean and then he desires to die so that he may not fall back into evil but then his discouragement returns and he believes strange blasphemy that it was a sin to have been born an artist conosco di quain terra terra carca le fetusa fantasia che l'art mi fec idoro e monaca li parole del mondo mi hanno trotto il tempo dato e contemplare dio and he believes himself destined by god to a long life simply that he may complete the fabric of st peter's in old age he who had shown so little vanity where his work was concerned and so much modesty in speaking of it went about studying how he could best exhibit the nobility of his descent claiming to trace in a direct line from the counts of canossa a claim which even valid would not be worth a finger of his moses michelangelo tenderly loved his father and brother and nephews and enabled them to live in easy circumstances yet in his letters to them he frequently shows himself suspicious and treats them unjustly in fifteen forty four he fell seriously ill at rome his nephew naturally hastened to his bedside michelangelo became very angry and wrote you have come to kill me and to see when i leave behind know that i have made my will and that there is nothing here for you to think about therefore go in peace and do not write to me more 
three months after he changed his tone i will not fail in what i have often thought about that is in helping you he has himself left a confession of his almost morbid melancholy in a letter ninety seven to sebastino del piombo yesterday evening i was happy because i escaped from my mad and melancholy humour without the recent biographical and autobiographical notes published by his son no one could have imagined that darwin a model father and citizen to self-controlled and even so free from vanity was a neuropath his son tells us that for forty years he never enjoyed twenty-four hours of health like other men of the eight years devoted to the study of the Cirripedes, two as he himself writes were lost through illness like all neuropaths he could bear neither heat nor cold half an hour of conversation beyond his habitual time was sufficient to cause insomnia and hinder his work on the following day he suffered also from dyspepsia a spinal anemia and giddiness which last is known to be frequently the equivalent of epilepsy and he could not work more than three hours a day he had curious crotchets finding that eating sweets made him ill he resolved not to touch them again but was unable to keep his resolution unless he had repeated it aloud he had a strange passion for paper writing the rough drafts of his correspondence on the back of proof sheets and of the most important mss which thus rendered difficult to decipher he often instituted what he himself called fool's experiments e g having a bassoon played close to the cotyledons of a plant when about to make an experiment he seemed to be urged on by some inward force from a morbid dislike to novelty he used the millimetric tables of an old book which he knew to be inaccurate but to which he was accustomed he would not change his old chemical balance though aware that it was untrustworthy he refused to believe in hypnotism and also at first in the discovery of prehistoric stone weapons he frequently says his daughter inverted his sentences both in speaking and writing and had a difficulty in pronouncing some letters especially w like skoda rikitansky and socrates he had a short snub nose and his ears were large and long nor were degenerative characteristics wanting among his ancestors it is true that he reckoned among them several men of intellect and almost genius which as robert sixteen eighty two a botanist and intelligent observer and edward author of a gameskeeper's manual full of acute observations on animals his father had great powers of observation but his paternal grandfather erasmus poet and naturalist at the same time had a passionate temper and an impediment to his speech one of his sons charles a poet and collector resembled him in this respect finally another uncle erasmus a man of some intellect a numismatist and statistician ended by madness and suicide it might be objected that the fact of such different forms of psychosis melancholy moral insanity monomania being found either complete or undeveloped in men of genius excludes the special psychosis of genius and still more that of epilepsy but it may be answered that recent research which has enlarged the domain of epilepsy has also demonstrated that apart from impulsive and hallucinatory delusions epilepsy may be superadded to any form of mental alienation especially megalomania and moral insanity and as is the case in nearly all degenerative psychoses undeveloped forms of mental disease and recurring multiform delusions brought on by the most trivial causes especially predominate in epilepsy end of section nineteen section twenty of the man of genius by caesar lombroso this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recorded by leon harvey chapter five conclusions between the physiology of the man of genius therefore and the pathology of the insane there are many points of coincidence there is even actual continuity this fact explains frequent occurrence of bad men of genius and men of genius who have become insane having it is true characteristics special to themselves but capable of being resolved into exaggerations of those of genius pure and simple the frequency of delusions in their multiform characters of degenerative characteristics of the loss of activity of hereditary more particularly in the children of inebriate imbecile idiotic or epileptic parents and above all the peculiar character of inspiration show that genius is a degenerative psychosis of the epileptoid group this supposition is confirmed by the frequency of a temporary manifestation of genius in the insane and by the new group of matoids to whom disease gives all the semblance of genius without its substance 
what i have hitherto written may i hope or remaining within the limits of psychological observation afford an experimental starting point for a criticism of artistic and literary sounds also of scientific creations thus in the fine arts exaggerated mere use of detail the abuse of symbols inscriptions or accessories a preference for some one particular colour an unrestrained passion for mere novelty may approach the morbid symptoms of mentalism just so in literature and science a tendency to puns and plays upon words an excessive fondness for symptoms a tendency to speak for oneself and substitute epigram for logic an extreme predilection for the rhythm as assonances of verse and prose writing even an exaggerated degree of originality may be considered as morbid phenomena so also is a mania of writing in biblical form in detached verses and with special favourite words which are underlined or repeated many times and a certain graphic symbolism here i must acknowledge that when i see how many of the organs which claim to do direct public opinion are infected with this tendency and how often young writers undertake to discuss grave social problems in their capricious phraseology of the lunatic asylum and the disjointed periods of biblical times as though our robust lungs were unable to cope with the vigorous and manly inspirations of the latin instruction i feel grave apprehensions for the future of the rising generation on the other hand the analogy of matoids of genius whose morbid phenomena only are inherited by them and with sane persons with whom they have shrewdness and practical sense in common or to put students on their guard against certain systems spring up by the hundreds or particularly in the abstract or in inexact sciences and due to the efforts of men incompetent or my lack either of capacity or knowledge of the subject to deal with them in these systems declamation assonances paradoxes and conceptions often original but always incomplete and contradictory take the place of calm reasoning based on a minute and unprejudiced study of facts such books are nearly always the work of those true though involuntary charlatans the matoys who are more widely diffused in the literary world than is commonly supposed nor is it only students who should be on their guard against them but especially politicians not that in an age of free criticism like our own there is any danger that these pretended reformers who are stimulated and guided solely by mental disease should be taken seriously but the obstacles justly opposed to them may by irritating sharpen and complete their insanity transforming a harmless delusion whether ideological as in the case of most metoids or sensorial as in monomaniacs into active madness in which their greater intellectual power the depth and tendency of their convictions and their very excess of altruism which compels them to occupy themselves with public affairs render them more dangerous and more inclined to rebellion and regicide than other insane persons when we reflect that on the other hand a genuine lunatic may give proof of temporary genius a phenomenon calculated to inspire the populace with an astonishment which soon produces veneration we find a solid argument against those jurists and judges who from the soundness and activity of the intellect infer complete moral responsibility to the total exclusion or the possibility of insanity we also see our way to an interpretation of the mystery of genius its contradictions and those of its mistakes which an ordinary man would have avoided and we can explain to ourselves how it is that madmen or matoys even with little or no genius passanante lazaretti trebisius fourier fox have been able to excite the populace and sometimes even bring about serious political revolutions better still shall we understand how those who were at once men of genius and insane mohammed luther savannah schopenhauer could despising and overcoming obstacles which would have dismayed any cool and deliberate mind hastened by whole centuries of unfolding of truth how such men have originated nearly all the religions and certainly all the sects which have agitated the world the frequency of genius among lunatics and of madmen among men of genius explains the fact that the density of nations has often been in the hands of the insane and shows how the latter have been able to contribute so much to the progress of mankind in short by these analogies and coincidences between the phenomena of genius and mental aberration it seems as though nature had intended to teach us respect for the supreme misfortunes of insanity and also to preserve us from being dazzled by the brilliancy of those men of genius who might well be compared not to the planets which keep their appointed orbits but to falling stars lost and dispersed over the crust of the earth end of conclusions end of section twenty and end of the man of genius by caesar lombroso 
Recorded by Leon Harvey.